Section 1 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 4. The West and Jacksonian Democracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 4. The West and Jacksonian Democracy. Chapter 10. The Farmers Beyond the Appalachians. The nationalism of Hamilton was undemocratic. The democracy of Jefferson was, in the beginning, provincial. The historic mission of uniting nationalism and democracy was in the course of time given to new leaders from a region beyond the mountains, peopled by men and women from all sections and free from those state traditions which ran back to the early days of colonization. The voice of the democratic nationalism nourished in the West was heard when Clay of Kentucky advocated his American system of protection for industries, when Jackson of Tennessee condemned nullification in a ringing proclamation that has taken its place among the great American state papers, and when Lincoln of Illinois, in a fateful hour, called upon a bewildered people to meet the supreme test whether this was a nation destined to survive or to perish. And it will be remembered that Lincoln's party chose for its banner that earlier device, Republican, which Jefferson had made a sign of power. The rail splitter from Illinois united the nationalism of Hamilton with the democracy of Jefferson, and his appeal was clothed in the simple language of the people not in the sonorous rhetoric which Webster learned in the schools. Preparation for Western Settlement The West and the American Revolution The excessive attention devoted by historians to the military operations along the coast has obscured the role played by the frontier in the American Revolution. The action of Great Britain in closing Western land to easy settlement in 1763 was more than an incident in precipitating the war for independence. Americans on the frontier did not forget it. When Indians were employed by England to defend that land, zeal for the patriot cause set the interior aflame. It was the members of the Western vanguard, like Daniel Boone, John Sevier, and George Rogers Clark, who first understood the value of the faraway country under the guns of the English forts, where the red men still wielded the tomahawk and the scalping knife. It was they who gave the East no rest until their vision was seen by the leaders on the seaboard who directed the course of national policy. It was one of their number, a seasoned Indian fighter, George Rogers Clark, who, with aid from Virginia, seized Kaskaskia and Vincennes, and secured the whole Northwest to the Union while the fate of Washington's army was still hanging in the balance. Western Problems at the End of the Revolution The Treaty of Peace, signed with Great Britain in 1783, brought the definite cession of the coveted territory west to the Mississippi River, but it left unsolved many problems. In the first place, tribes of resentful Indians in the Ohio region, even though British support was withdrawn at last, had to be reckoned with, and it was not until after the establishment of the Federal Constitution that a well-equipped army could be provided to guarantee peace on the border. In the second place, British garrisons still occupied forts on Lake Erie pending the execution of the terms of the Treaty of 1783, terms which were not fulfilled until after the ratification of the Jay Treaty twelve years later. In the third place, Virginia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts had conflicting claims to the land in the Northwest based on old English charters and Indian treaties. It was only after a bitter contest that the states reached an agreement to transfer their rights to the government of the United States, Virginia executing her deed of cession on March 1, 1784. In the fourth place, titles to lands bought by individuals remained uncertain in the absence of official maps and records. To meet this last situation, Congress instituted a systematic survey of the Ohio country, laying it out into townships, sections of 640 acres each, and quarter sections. In every township, 
one section of land was set aside for the support of public schools. THE NORTHWEST ORDINANCE The final problem which had to be solved before settlement on a large scale could be begun was that of governing the territory. Pioneers who looked with hungry eyes on the fertile valley of the Ohio could hardly restrain their impatience. Soldiers of the Revolution, who had been paid for their services in land warrants, entitling them to make entries in the West, called for action. Congress answered by passing in 1787 the famous Northwest Ordinance, providing for temporary territorial government to be followed by the creation of a popular assembly as soon as there were 5,000 free males in any district. Eventual admission to the Union on an equal footing with the original states was promised to the new territories. Religious freedom was guaranteed. The safeguards of trial by jury, regular judicial procedure, and habeas corpus were established in order that the methods of civilized life might take the place of the rough and ready justice of lynch law. During the course of the debate on the ordinance, Congress added the sixth article forbidding slavery and involuntary servitude. The charter of the Northwest, so well planned by the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, was continued in force by the first Congress under the Constitution in 1789. The following year, its essential provisions, except the ban on slavery, were applied to the territory south of the Ohio, ceded by North Carolina to the national government, and, in 1798, to the Mississippi Territory, once held by Georgia. Thus it was settled for all time that, the new colonies were not to be exploited for the benefit of the parent states any more than for the benefit of England, but were to be autonomous and coordinate commonwealths. This outcome, bitterly opposed by some eastern leaders who feared the triumph of western states over the seaboard, completed the legal steps necessary by way of preparation for the flood of settlers. The Land Companies, Speculators, and Western Land Tenure as in the original settlement of America, so in the opening of the West, great companies and single proprietors of large grants early figured. In 1787, the Ohio Land Company, a New England concern, acquired a million and a half acres on the Ohio and began operations by planting the town of Marietta. A professional land speculator, J.C. Sims, secured a million acres lower down where the city of Cincinnati was founded. Other individuals bought up soldiers' claims and so acquired enormous holdings for speculative purposes. Indeed, there was such a rush to make fortunes quickly through the rise in land values that Washington was moved to cry out against the rage for speculating in and forestalling of land on the northwest of the Ohio, protesting that, Scarce a valuable spot within any tolerable distance of it is left without a claimant. He therefore urged Congress to fix a reasonable price for the land, not too exorbitant and burdensome for real occupiers, but high enough to discourage monopolizers. Congress, however, was not prepared to use the public domain for the sole purpose of developing a body of small freeholders in the West. It still looked upon the sale of public lands as an important source of revenue with which to pay off the public debt. Consequently, it thought more of instant income than of ultimate results. It placed no limit on the amount which could be bought when it fixed the price at two dollars an acre in 1796, and it encouraged the professional land operator by making the first installment only twenty cents an acre in addition to the small registration and survey fee. On such terms, a speculator with a few thousand dollars could get possession of an enormous plot of land. If he was fortunate in disposing of it, he could meet the installments, which were spread over a period of four years, and make a handsome profit for himself. Even when the credit or installment feature was abolished in 1821, and the price of the land lowered to a cash price of $1.75 an acre, the opportunity for large speculative purchases continued to attract capital to land ventures. The Development of the Small Freehold The cheapness of land and the scarcity of labor, nevertheless, made impossible the triumph of the huge estate with its semi-servile tenantry. 
For about $45, a man could get a farm of 160 acres on the installment plan. Another payment of $80 was due in 40 days, but a four-year term was allowed for the discharge of the balance. With a capital of from two to three hundred dollars, a family could embark on a land venture. If it had good crops, it could meet the deferred payments. It was, however, a hard battle at best. Many a man forfeited his land through failure to pay the final installment. Yet, in the end, in spite of all the handicaps, the small freehold of a few hundred acres at most became the typical unit of western agriculture, except in the planting states of the Gulf. Even the lands of the great companies were generally broken up and sold in small lots. The tendency toward moderate holdings, so favored by western conditions, was also promoted by a clause in the Northwest Ordinance declaring that the land of any person dying intestate, that is, without any will disposing of it, should be divided equally among his descendants. Hildreth says of this provision, It established the important Republican principle, not then introduced into all the states, of the equal distribution of landed as well as personal property. All these forces combined made the wide dispersion of wealth in the early days of the nineteenth century an American characteristic, in marked contrast with the European system of family prestige and vast estates based on the law of primogeniture. The Western Migration and New States The People With government established, federal arms victorious over the Indians, and the land surveyed for sale, the way was prepared for immigrants. They came with a rush. Young New Englanders, wary of tilling the stony soil of their native states, poured through New York and Pennsylvania, some settling on the northern bank of the Ohio, but most of them in the lake region. Sons and daughters of German farmers in Pennsylvania, and many a redemptioner who had discharged his bond of servitude, pressed out into Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, or beyond. From the exhausted fields and the clay hills of the southern states came pioneers of English and Scotch-Irish descent, the latter in great numbers. Indeed, one historian of high authority has ventured to say that the rapid expansion of the United States from a coast strip to a continental area is largely a Scotch-Irish achievement. While Native Americans of mixed stocks led the way into the West, it was not long before immigrants direct from Europe under the stimulus of company enterprise, began to filter into the new settlements in increasing numbers. The types of people were as various as the nations they represented. Timothy Flint, who published his entertaining Recollections in 1826, found the West a strange mixture of all sorts of conditions of people. Some of them, he relates, had been hunters in the upper world of the Mississippi, above the falls of St. Anthony. Some had been still farther north, in Canada. Still others had wandered from the south, the Gulf of Mexico, the Red River, and the Spanish country. French boatmen and trappers, Spanish traders from the southwest, Virginia planters with their droves of slaves mingled with English, German, and Scotch-Irish farmers. Hunters, forest rangers, restless bordermen, and squatters, like the foaming combers of an advancing tide, went first. Then followed the farmers, masters of the axe and plow, with their wives who shared every burden and hardship, and introduced some of the features of civilized life. The hunters and rangers passed on to new scenes, the homemakers built for all time. The Number of Immigrants There were no official stations on the frontier to record the number of immigrants who entered the West during the decades following the American Revolution but travelers of the time record that every road was crowded with pioneers and their families, their wagons and cattle, and that they were seldom out of the sound of the snapping whip of the teamster urging forward his horses or the crack of the hunter's rifle as he brought down his evening meal. During the latter half of 1787, says Coleman, more than 900 boats floated down the Ohio carrying 18,000 men, women, and children, and 12,000 horses, sheep, and cattle, and six hundred and fifty wagons. Other lines of travel were also crowded, and with the passing years, the flooding tide of homeseekers rose higher and higher. The Western Routes 
Four main routes led into the country beyond the Appalachians. The Genesee Road, beginning at Albany, ran almost due west to the present site of Buffalo on Lake Erie through a level country. In the dry season, wagons laden with goods could easily pass along it into northern Ohio. A second route through Pittsburgh was fed by three eastern branches, one starting at Philadelphia, one at Baltimore, and another at Alexandria. A third main route wound through the mountains from Alexandria to Boonesboro in Kentucky, and then westward across the Ohio to St. Louis. A fourth, the most famous of them all, passed through the Cumberland Gap, and by branches extended into the Cumberland Valley and the Kentucky country. Of these four lines of travel, the Pittsburgh route offered the most advantages. Pioneers, no matter from what section they came, when once they were on the headwaters of the Ohio and in possession of a flatboat, could find a quick and easy passage into all parts of the west and southwest. Whether they wanted to settle in Ohio, Kentucky, or western Tennessee, they could find their way down the drifting flood to their destination, or at least to some spot near it. Many people from the south as well as the northern and middle states chose this route. So it came about that the sons and daughters of Virginia and the Carolinas mingled with those of New York, Pennsylvania, and New England in the settlement of the Northwest Territory. THE METHODS OF TRAVEL INTO THE WEST Many stories giving exact descriptions of methods of travel into the West in the early days have been preserved. The country was hardly opened before visitors from the Old World and from the Eastern States, impelled by curiosity, made their way to the very frontier of civilization and wrote books to inform or amuse the public. One of them, Gilbert Imlay, an English traveler, has given us an account of the Pittsburgh route as he found it in 1791. If a man, he writes, has a family or goods of any sort to remove, his best way, then, would be to purchase a wagon and team of horses to carry his property to Redstone Old Fort or to Pittsburgh, according as he may come from the northern or southern states. A good wagon will cost at Philadelphia about ten pounds, and the horses about twelve pounds each. They would cost something more at Baltimore and at Alexandria. The wagon may be covered with canvas, and if it is the choice of the people, they may sleep in it of nights with the greatest safety. But if they dislike that, there are inns of accommodation the whole distance on the different roads. The provisions I would purchase in the same manner, that is, from the farmers along the road. And by having two or three camp kettles and stopping every evening when the weather is fine upon the brink of some rivulet, and by kindling a fire, they may soon dress their own food. This manner of journeying is so far from being disagreeable that in a fine season it is extremely pleasant. The immigrant, once at Pittsburgh or Wheeling, could then buy a flatboat of a size required for his goods and stock, and drift down the current to his journey's end. THE ADMISSION OF KENTUCKY AND TENNESSEE When the eighteenth century drew to a close, Kentucky had a population larger than Delaware, Rhode Island, or New Hampshire. Tennessee claimed sixty thousand inhabitants. In 1792, Kentucky took her place as a state beside her none-too-kindly parent, Virginia. The Eastern Federalists resented her intrusion, but they took some consolation in the admission of Vermont because the balance of Eastern power was still retained. As if to assert their independence of old homes and conservative ideas, the makers of Kentucky's first constitution swept aside the landed qualification on the suffrage and gave the vote to all free white males. Four years later, Kentucky's neighbor to the south, Tennessee, followed this step toward a wider democracy. After encountering fierce opposition from the Federalists, Tennessee was accepted as the 16th state. Ohio The door of the Union had hardly opened for Tennessee when another appeal was made to Congress, this time from the pioneers in Ohio. The little posts founded at Marietta and Cincinnati had grown into flourishing centers of trade. The stream of immigrants flowing down the river added daily to their numbers, and the growing settlements all around poured produce into their markets to be exchanged for store goods. After the Indians were disposed of in 1794, and the last British soldier left the frontier forts under the terms of the Jay Treaty of 1795, tiny settlements of families appeared on Lake Erie in the Western Reserve, 
a region that had been retained by Connecticut when she surrendered her other rights in the Northwest. At the close of the century, Ohio, claiming a population of more than 50,000, grew discontented with its territorial status. Indeed, two years before the enactment of the Northwest Ordinance, squatters in that region had been invited by one John Emerson to hold a convention after the fashion of the men of Hartford, Windsor, and Wethersfield in Old Connecticut, and draft a frame of government for themselves. This true son of New England declared that men have an undoubted right to pass into every vacant country, and there to form their constitution, and that from the confederation of the whole United States Congress is not empowered to forbid them. This grand convention was never held because the heavy hand of the government fell upon the leaders. But the spirit of John Emerson did not perish. In November 1802, a convention chosen by voters, assembled under the authority of Congress at Chillicothe, drew up a constitution. It went into force after a popular ratification. The role of the convention bore such names as Abbott, Baldwin, Cutler, Huntington, Putnam, and Sargent, and the list of counties from which they came included Adams, Fairfield, Hamilton, Jefferson, Trumbull, and Washington, showing that the new America in the West was peopled and led by the old stock. In 1803, Ohio was admitted to the Union. Indiana and Illinois As in the neighboring state, the frontier in Indiana advanced northward from the Ohio, mainly under the leadership, however, of settlers from the south, restless Kentuckians hoping for better luck in a newer country, and pioneers from the far frontiers of Virginia and North Carolina. As soon as a tier of counties swinging upward like the horns of the moon against Ohio on the east and in the Wabash Valley on the west was fairly settled, a clamor went up for statehood. Under the authority of an act of Congress in 1816, the Indianians drafted a constitution and inaugurated their government at Corydon. The majority of the members of the convention, we are told by a local historian, were frontier farmers who had a general idea of what they wanted and had sense enough to let their more erudite colleagues put it into shape. Two years later, the pioneers of Illinois, also settled upward from the Ohio, like Indiana, elected their delegates to draft a constitution. Leadership in the convention, quite properly, was taken by a man born in New York and reared in Tennessee, and the constitution as finally drafted was in its principal provisions a copy of the then existing constitutions of Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. Many of the articles are exact copies in wording, although differently arranged and numbered. Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama Across the Mississippi to the far south, clearing and planting had gone on with much bustle and enterprise. The cotton and sugar lands of Louisiana, opened by French and Spanish settlers, were widened in every direction by planters with their armies of slaves from the older states. New Orleans, a good market and a center of culture not despised even by the pioneer, grew apace. In 1810, the population of Lower Louisiana was over 75,000. The time had come, said the leaders of the people, to fulfill the promise made to France in the Treaty of Cession, namely, to grant to the inhabitants of the territory statehood and the rights of American citizens. Federalists from New England, still having a voice in Congress, if somewhat weaker, still protested in tones of horror. I am compelled to declare it as my deliberate opinion, pronounced Josiah Quincy in the House of Representatives, that if this bill to admit Louisiana passes, the bonds of this union are virtually dissolved, that as it will be the right of all, so it will be the duty of some states to prepare definitely for a separation, amicably if they can, violently if they must. It is a death blow to the Constitution. It may afterwards linger, but lingering, its fate will, at no very distant period, be consummated. Federalists from New York, like those from New England, had their doubts about the wisdom of admitting Western states. But the party of Jefferson and Madison, having the necessary majority, granted the coveted statehood to Louisiana in 1812. When a few years later Mississippi and Alabama knocked at the doors of the Union, the Federalists had so little influence on account of their conduct during the Second War with England 
that spokesmen from the Southwest met a kindlier reception at Washington. Mississippi in 1817 and Alabama in 1819 took their places among the United States of America. Both of them, while granting white manhood suffrage, gave their constitutions the tone of the Old East by providing landed qualifications for the governor and members of the legislature. Missouri Far to the north in the Louisiana Purchase, a new commonwealth was rising to power. It was peopled by immigrants who came down the Ohio in fleets of boats or crossed the Mississippi from Kentucky and Tennessee. Thrifty Germans from Pennsylvania, hardy farmers from Virginia, ready to work with their own hands, freemen seeking freemen's homes, planters with their slaves moving on from worn-out fields on the seaboard, came together in the widening settlements of the Missouri country. Peoples from the north and south flowed together, small farmers and big planters mingling in one community. When their numbers had reached 60,000 or more, they precipitated a contest over their admission to the Union, ringing an alarm bell in the night, as Jefferson phrased it. The favorite expedient of compromise with slavery was brought forth in Congress once more. Maine consequently was brought into the Union without slavery, and Missouri with slavery. At the same time, there was drawn westward through the rest of the Louisiana Territory a line separating servitude from slavery. End of Section 1 Section 2 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 4 the West and Jacksonian Democracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibney. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 4. The West and Jacksonian Democracy. Chapter 10. The Farmers Beyond the Appalachians continued. The Spirit of the Frontier. Land Tenure and Liberty. Over an immense western area there developed an unbroken system of freehold farms. In the Gulf States and the lower Mississippi Valley, it is true, the planter with his many slaves even led in the pioneer movement, but through large sections of Tennessee and Kentucky, as well as upper Georgia and Alabama, and all throughout the Northwest Territory, the small farmer reigned supreme. In this immense dominion there sprang up a civilization without caste or class, a body of people all having about the same amount of this world's goods, and deriving their livelihood from one source, the labor of their own hands on the soil. The Northwest Territory alone almost equaled in area all the original thirteen states combined, except Georgia, and its system of agricultural economy was unbroken by plantations and feudal estates. In the subdivision of the soil, and the great equality of condition, as Webster said on more than one occasion, lay the true basis, most certainly, of popular government. There was the undoubted source of Jacksonian democracy. THE CHARACTERISTICS OF THE WESTERN PEOPLE Travelers into the Northwest during the early years of the 19th century were agreed that the people of that region were almost uniformly marked by the characteristics common to an independent yeomanry. A close observer thus recorded his impressions. A spirit of adventurous enterprise, a willingness to go through any hardship to accomplish an object, independence of thought and action. They have felt the influence of these principles from their childhood, men who can endure anything, that have lived almost without restraint, free as the mountain air or as the deer and the buffalo of their forests, and who know they are Americans all, an apparent roughness which some would deem rudeness of manner, where there is perfect equality in a neighborhood of people who know little about each other's previous history or ancestry, but where each is lord of the soil he cultivates, where a log cabin is all that the best of families can expect to have for years, and of course can possess few of the external decorations which have so much influence in creating a diversity of rank in society. 
These circumstances have laid the foundation for that equality of intercourse, simplicity of manners, want of deference, want of reserve, great readiness to make acquaintances, freedom of speech, indisposition to brook real or imaginary insults which one witnesses among people of the West. This equality, this independence, this rudeness so often described by the traveler as marking a new country, were all accentuated by the character of the settlers themselves. Traces of the fierce, unsociable, eagle-eyed, hard-drinking hunter remained. The settlers who followed the hunter were, with some exceptions, soldiers of the Revolutionary Army, farmers of the middling order, and mechanics from the towns, English, Scotch-Irish, Germans, poor in possessions, and thrown upon the labor of their own hands for support. Sons and daughters from well-to-do eastern homes sometimes brought softer manners, but the equality of life and the leveling force of labor in forest and field soon made them one in spirit with their struggling neighbors. Even the preachers and teachers, who came when the cabins were raised in the clearings and rude churches and schoolhouses were built, preached sermons and taught lessons that savored of the frontier, as any one may know who reads Peter Cartwright's A Muscular Christian or Eggleston's The Hoosier Schoolmaster. The West and the East Meet The East Alarmed A people so independent as the Westerners, and so attached to local self-government, gave the conservative East many a rude shock, setting gentlemen in powdered wigs and knee breeches agog with the idea that terrible things might happen in the Mississippi Valley. Not without good grounds did Washington fear that a touch of a feather would turn the western settlers away from the seaboard to the Spaniards, and seriously did he urge the East not to neglect them, lest they be drawn into the arms of or be dependent upon foreigners. Taking advantage of the restless spirit in the southwest, Aaron Burr, having disgraced himself by killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel, laid wild plans, if not to bring about a secession in that region, at least to build a state of some kind out of the Spanish dominions adjoining Louisiana. Frightened at such enterprises, and fearing the dominance of the West, the Federalists, with a few conspicuous exceptions, opposed equality between the sections. Had their narrow views prevailed, the West, with its new democracy, would have been held in perpetual tutelage to the seaboard, or perhaps been driven into independence as the thirteen colonies had been not long before. Eastern Friends of the West Fortunately for the nation, there were many Eastern leaders, particularly from the South, who understood the West, approved its spirit, and sought to bring the two sections together by common bonds. Washington kept alive and keen the zeal for Western advancement which he acquired in his youth as a surveyor. He never grew tired of urging upon his Eastern friends the importance of the lands beyond the mountains. He pressed upon the governor of Virginia a project for a wagon road connecting the seaboard with the Ohio country, and was active in a movement to improve the navigation of the Potomac. He advocated strengthening the ties of commerce. Smooth the roads, he said, and make easy the way for them, and then see what an influx of articles will be poured upon us how amazingly our exports will be increased by them, and how amply we shall be compensated for any trouble and expense we may encounter to effect it. Jefferson, too, was interested in every phase of Western development, the survey of lands, the exploration of the waterways, the opening of trade, and even the discovery of the bones of prehistoric animals. Robert Fulton, the inventor of the steamboat, was another man of vision who for many years pressed upon his countrymen the necessity of uniting East and West by a canal which would cement the Union, raise the value of the public lands, and extend the principles of Confederate and Republican government. The Difficulties of Early Transportation Means of communication played an important part in the strategy of all those who sought to bring together the seaboard and the frontier. The produce of the West, wheat, corn, bacon, hemp, cattle, and tobacco, was bulky, and the cost of overland transportation was prohibitive. 
In the eastern market, a cow and her calf were given for a bushel of salt, while a suit of store clothes cost as much as a farm. In such circumstances, the inhabitants of the Mississippi Valley were forced to ship their produce over a long route by way of New Orleans and to pay high freight rates for everything that was brought across the mountains. Scows of from five to fifty tons were built at the towns along the rivers and piloted down the stream to the Crescent City. In a few cases, small ocean-going vessels were built to transport goods to the West Indies or to the eastern coast towns. Salt, iron, guns, powder, and the absolute essentials, which the pioneers had to buy mainly in eastern markets, were carried over narrow wagon trails that were almost impassable in the rainy season. THE NATIONAL ROAD To far-sighted men, like Albert Gallatin, the father of internal improvements, the solution of this problem was the construction of roads and canals. Early in Jefferson's administration, Congress dedicated a part of the proceeds from the sale of lands to building highways from the headwaters of the navigable waters emptying into the Atlantic to the Ohio River and beyond into the Northwest Territory. In 1806, after many misgivings, it authorized a great national highway binding the East and the West. The Cumberland Road, as it was called, began in northwestern Maryland, wound through southern Pennsylvania, crossed the narrow neck of Virginia at Wheeling, and then shot almost straight across Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois into Missouri. By 1817, stagecoaches were running between Washington and Wheeling. By 1833, contractors had carried their work to Columbus, Ohio, and by 1852, to Vandalia, Illinois. Over this ballasted road, mail and passenger coaches could go at high speed, and heavy freight wagons proceed in safety at a steady pace. Canals and Steamboats A second epoch in the economic union of the East and West was reached with the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 offering an all-water route from New York City to the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Valley. Pennsylvania, alarmed by the advantages conferred on New York by this enterprise, began her system of canals and portages from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, completing the last link in 1834. In the South, the Chesapeake and Ohio Company, chartered in 1825, was busy with a project to connect Georgetown and Cumberland when railways broke in upon the undertaking before it was half finished. About the same time, Ohio built a canal across the state, affording water communication between Lake Erie and the Ohio River through a rich wheat belt. Passengers could now travel by canal boat into the west with comparative ease and comfort, if not at a rapid speed, and the bulkiest of freight could be easily handled. Moreover, the rate charged for carrying goods was cut by the Erie Canal from $32 a ton per hundred miles to $1. New Orleans was destined to lose her primacy in the Mississippi Valley. The diversion of traffic to eastern markets was also stimulated by steamboats, which appeared on the Ohio about 1810, three years after Fulton had made his famous trip on the Hudson. It took twenty men to sail and row a five-ton scow up the river at a speed of from ten to twenty miles a day. In 1825, Timothy Flint traveled a hundred miles a day on the new steamer Grecian against the whole weight of the Mississippi current. Three years later, the round trip from Louisville to New Orleans was cut to eight days. Heavy produce that once had to float down to New Orleans could be carried upstream and sent to the east by way of the canal systems. Thus the far country was brought near. The timid no longer hesitated at the thought of the perilous journey. All routes were crowded with western immigrants. The forests fell before the axe like grain before the sickle. Clearings scattered through the woods spread out into a great mosaic of farms stretching from the southern Appalachians to Lake Michigan. The National Census of 1830 gave 937,000 inhabitants to Ohio, 343,000 to Indiana, 157,000 to Illinois, 687,000 to Kentucky, and 681,000 to Tennessee. 
With the increase in population and the growth of agriculture came political influence. People who had once petitioned Congress now sent their own representatives. Men who had hitherto accepted without protests presidents from the seaboard expressed a new spirit of dissent in 1824 by giving only three electoral votes for John Quincy Adams. And four years later, they sent a son of the soil from Tennessee, Andrew Jackson, to take Washington's chair as chief executive of the nation, the first of a long line of presidents from the Mississippi Basin. References W. G. Brown, The Lower South in American History B. A. Hinsdale, The Old Northwest, Two Volumes A. B. Holbert, Great American Canals and The Cumberland Road T. Roosevelt, Thomas H. Benton P. J. Treat, The National Land System, 1785 to 1820 F. J. Turner, Rise of the New West, American Nation Series J. Windsor, The Westward Movement Questions 1. How did the West come to play a role in the Revolution? 2. What preparations were necessary to settlement? 3. Give the principal provisions of the Northwest Ordinance. 4. Explain how freehold land tenure happened to predominate in the West. 5. Who were the early settlers in the West? What routes did they take? How did they travel? 6. Explain the Eastern opposition to the admission of new Western states. Show how it was overcome. 7. Trace a connection between the economic system of the West and the spirit of the people. 8. Who were among the early friends of Western development? 9. Describe the difficulties of trade between the East and the West. 10. Show how trade was promoted. Research Topics Northwest Ordinance Analysis of Text in MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook. Roosevelt, Winning of the West, Volume 5, pages 5 through 57. The West Before the Revolution, Roosevelt, Volume 1. The West During the Revolution, Roosevelt, Volumes 2 and 3. Tennessee, Roosevelt, Volume 5, pages 95 through 119, and Volume 6, pages 9 through 87. The Cumberland Road, A. B. Holbert, The Cumberland Road. Early Life in the Middle West, Calendar, Economic History of the United States, pages 617 through 633, 636 through 641. Slavery in the Southwest, Calendar, pages 641 through 652. Early Land Policy, Calendar, pages 668 through 680. Westward Movement of Peoples, Roosevelt, Volume 4, pages 7 through 39. Lists of books dealing with the early history of Western states are given in Hart, Channing, and Turner, Guide to the Study and Reading of American History, Revised Edition, pages 62 through 89. Kentucky, Roosevelt, Volume 4, pages 176 through 263. End of section 2. Recording by Katie Gibney. Section 3 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 4 The West and Jacksonian Democracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 4, The West and Jacksonian Democracy, Chapter 11, Jacksonian democracy. The New England Federalists at the Hartford Convention prophesied that in time the West would dominate the East. Quote, at the adoption of the Constitution, they said, 
a certain balance of power among the original states was considered to exist, and there was at that time, and yet is among those parties, a strong affinity between their great and general interests. By the admission of these new states, that balance has been materially affected, and unless the practice be modified, must ultimately be destroyed. The southern states will first avail themselves of their new confederates to govern the east, and finally the western states, multiplied in number and augmented in population, will control the interests of the whole, end quote. Strangely enough, the fulfillment of this prophecy was being prepared even in Federalist strongholds by the rise of a new urban democracy that was to make common cause with the farmers beyond the mountains. The Democratic Movement in the East The Aristocratic Features of the Old Order the revolutionary fathers in setting up their first state constitutions, although they often spoke of government as founded on the consent of the governed, did not think that consistency required giving the vote to all male adults. On the contrary, they looked upon property owners as the only safe, quote, depository of political power. They went back to the colonial tradition that related taxation and representation. This, they argued, was not only just, but a safeguard against the, quote, excesses of democracy. In carrying their theory into execution, they placed tax-paying or property qualifications on the right to vote. Broadly speaking, these limitations fell into three classes. Three states, Pennsylvania, 1776, New Hampshire, 1784, and Georgia, 1798, gave the ballot to all who paid taxes without reference to the value of their property. Three, Virginia, Delaware, and Rhode Island, clung firmly to the ancient principles that only freeholders could be entrusted with electoral rights. Still, other states, while closely restricting the suffrage, accepted the ownership of other things as well as land in fulfillment of the requirements. In Massachusetts, for instance, the vote was granted to all men who held land yielding an annual income of three pounds or possessed other property worth sixty pounds. The electors thus enfranchised, numerous as they were, owing to the wide distribution of land, often suffered from a very onerous disability. In many states they were able to vote only for persons of wealth because heavy property qualifications were imposed on public officers. In New Hampshire, the governor had to be worth 500 pounds, one-half in land. In Massachusetts, 1,000 pounds, all freehold. In Maryland, 5,000 pounds, 1,000 of which was freehold. In North Carolina, 1,000 pounds freehold, and in South Carolina, 10,000 pounds freehold. A state senator in Massachusetts had to be the owner of a freehold worth 300 pounds or personal property worth 600 pounds. In New Jersey, 1,000 pounds worth of property. In North Carolina, 300 acres of land. In South Carolina, 2,000 pounds freehold. For members of the lower house of the legislature, lower qualifications were required. 
in most of the states the suffrage or office holding or both were further restricted by religious provisions no single sect was powerful enough to dominate after the revolution but for the most part catholics and jews were either disenfranchised or excluded from office north carolina and georgia denied the ballot to anyone who was not a protestant delaware withheld it from all who did not believe in the trinity and the inspiration of the scriptures massachusetts and maryland limited it to christians virginia and new york advanced for their day made no discrimination in government on account of religious opinion the defense of the old order it must not be supposed that property qualifications were thoughtlessly imposed at the outset or considered of little consequence in practice in the beginning they were viewed as fundamental as towns grew in size and the number of landless citizens increased the restrictions were defended with even more vigor in massachusetts the great webster upheld the rights of property in government saying quote, it is entirely just that property should have its due weight and consideration in political arrangements the disastrous revolutions which the world has witnessed those political thunderstorms and earthquakes which have shaken the pillars of society to their deepest foundations have been revolutions against property end quote in pennsylvania a leader in local affairs cried out against a plan to remove the tax-paying limitation on the suffrage quote, what does the delegate propose to place the vicious vagrant the wandering arabs the tartar hordes of our large cities on the level with the virtuous and good man End quote. in virginia jefferson himself had first believed in property qualifications and had feared with genuine alarm the quote, mobs of the great cities it was near the end of the eighteenth century before he accepted the idea of manhood suffrage even then he was unable to convince the constitution makers of his own state urged one of them quote, it is not an idle chimera of the brain that the possession of land furnishes the strongest evidence of permanent common interest with and attachment to the community it is upon this foundation i wish to place the right of suffrage this is the best general standard which can be resorted to for the purpose of determining whether the persons to be invested with the right of suffrage are such persons as could be consistently with the safety and well-being of the community entrusted with the exercise of that right End quote. attacks on restricted suffrage the changing circumstances of american life however soon challenged the rule of those with property prominent among the new forces were the rising mercantile and business interests where the freehold qualification was applied businessmen who did not own land were deprived of the vote and excluded from office in new york for example the most illiterate farmer who had one hundred pounds worth of land could vote for the state senator and governor while the landless banker or merchant could not it is not surprising therefore to find businessmen taking the lead in breaking down freehold limitations on the suffrage the professional classes also were interested in removing the barriers 
which excluded many of them from public affairs. It was a schoolmaster, Thomas Dorr, who led the popular uprising in Rhode Island, which brought the exclusive rule by freeholders to an end. In addition to the business and professional classes, the mechanics of the town showed a growing hostility to a system of government that generally barred them from voting or holding office. Though not numerous, they had early begun to exercise an influence on the course of public affairs. They had led the riots against the Stamp Act, overturned King George's statute, and, quote, crammed stamps down the throats of collectors, end quote. When the state constitutions were framed, they took a lively interest, particularly in New York City and Philadelphia. In June 1776, the Mechanics in Union in New York protested against putting the new state constitution into effect without their approval, declaring that the right to vote on the acceptance or rejection of a fundamental law, quote, is the birthright of every man to whatever state he may belong, end quote. Though their petition was rejected, their spirit remained. When a few years later the federal constitution was being framed, the mechanics watched the process with deep concern. They knew that one of its main objectives was to promote trade and commerce, affecting directly their daily bread. During the struggle over ratification, they passed resolutions approving its provisions, and they often joined in parades organized to stir up sentiment for the Constitution, even though they could not vote for members of the state conventions and so express their will directly. After the organization of trade unions, they collided with the courts of law and thus became interested in the election of judges and lawmakers. Those who attacked the old system of class rule found a strong moral support in the Declaration of Independence. Was it not said that all men are created equal? Whoever runs may read. Was it not declared that governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed? The doctrine was applied with effect to George III and seemed appropriate for use against the privileged classes of Massachusetts or Virginia. Quote, how do the principles thus proclaimed, asked the non-freeholders of Richmond in petitioning for the state ballot, accord with the existing regulation of the suffrage, a regulation which instead of the equality nature ordains, creates an odious distinction between members of the same community, and vests in a favored class not in consideration of their public services, but of their private possessions, the highest of all privileges. End quote. Abolition of Property Qualifications By many minor victories rather than by any spectacular triumphs did the advocates of manhood suffrage carry the day. Slight gains were made even during the Revolution or shortly afterward. In Pennsylvania, the mechanics, by taking an active part in the contest over the Constitution of 1776, were able to force the qualification down to the payment of a small tax. Vermont came into the Union in 1792 without any property restrictions. The same year, Delaware gave the vote to all men who paid taxes. Maryland, reckoned one of the most conservative of states, embarked on the experiment of manhood suffrage in 1809. And nine years later, Connecticut, equally conservative, decided that all taxpayers were worthy of the ballot. 
five states, Massachusetts, New York, Virginia, Rhode Island, and North Carolina, remained obdurate while these changes were going on around them. Finally, they had to yield themselves. The last struggle in Massachusetts took place in the Constitutional Convention of 1820. There, Webster, in the prime of his manhood, and John Adams, in the closing years of his old age, alike protested against such radical innovations as manhood suffrage. Their protests were futile. The property test was abolished, and a small tax-paying qualification was substituted. New York surrendered the next year, and after trying some minor restrictions for five years, went completely over to white manhood suffrage in 1826. Rhode Island clung to her freehold qualification through 30 years of agitation. Then Dorr's Rebellion, almost culminating in bloodshed, brought about a reform in 1843 which introduced a slight tax-paying qualification as an alternative to the freehold. Virginia and North Carolina were still unconvinced. The former refused to abandon ownership of land as the test for political rights until 1850, and the latter until 1856. Although religious discrimination and property qualifications for office holders were sometimes retained after the establishment of manhood suffrage, they were usually abolished along with the monopoly of government enjoyed by property owners and taxpayers. At the end of the first quarter of the 19th century, the white male industrial workers and the mechanics of the northern cities at least could lay aside the petition for the ballot and enjoy with the free farmer a voice in the government of their common country. Quote, Universal democracy, sighed Carlyle, who was widely read in the United States, whatever we may think of it, has declared itself the inevitable fact of the days in which we live. And he who has any chance to instruct or lead in these days must begin by admitting that. Where no government is wanted, save that of a parish constable, as in America with its boundless soil, every man being able to find work and recompense for himself, democracy may subsist, not elsewhere. End quote. Amid the grave misgivings of the first generation of statesmen, America was committed to the great adventure. In the populous towns of the East as well as in the forest and fields of the West. The New Democracy Enters the Arena The spirit of the new order soon had a pronounced effect on the machinery of government and the practice of politics. The enfranchised electors were now long in demanding for themselves a larger share in administration. The Spoils System and Rotation in Office First of all, they wanted office for themselves regardless of their fitness. They therefore extended the system of rewarding party workers with government positions. A system early established in several states, notably New York and Pennsylvania. Closely connected with it was the practice of fixing short-term officers and making frequent changes in personnel. Quote, long continuance in office, explained a champion of this ideal in Pennsylvania in 1837, unfits a man for the discharge of its duties by rendering him arbitrary and aristocratic, and tends to beget, 
first life office and then hereditary office, which leads to the destruction of free government, end quote. The solution offered was the historic doctrine of, quote, rotation in office. At the same time, the principle of popular election was extended to an increasing number of officials who had once been appointed either by the governor or the legislature. Even geologists, veterinarians, surveyors, and other technical officers were declared elective on the theory that their appointment, quote, smacked of monarchy, end quote. Popular Election of Presidential Electors In a short time, the spirit of democracy, while playing havoc with the old order in state government, made its way upward into the federal system. The framers of the Constitution, bewildered by many proposals and unable to agree on any single plan, had committed the choice of presidential electors to the discretion of the state legislatures. The legislatures, in turn, greedy of power, early adopted the practice of choosing the electors themselves. But they did not enjoy it long undisturbed. Democracy, thundering at their doors, demanded that they surrender the privilege to the people. Reluctantly, they yielded, sometimes granting popular election and then withdrawing it. The drift was inevitable, and the climax came with the advent of Jacksonian democracy. In 1824, Vermont, New York, Delaware, South Carolina, Georgia, and Louisiana, though some had experimented with popular election, still left the choice of electors with the legislature. Eight years later, South Carolina alone held to the old practice. Popular election had become the final word. The fanciful idea of an electoral college of, quote, good and wise men, end quote, selected without passion or partnership by state legislatures acting as deliberative bodies was exploded for all time. The election of the nation's chief magistrate was committed to the tempestuous methods of democracy. The Nominating Convention as the suffrage was widened and the popular choice of presidential electors extended, there arose a violent protest against the methods used by the political parties in nominating candidates. After the retirement of Washington, both the Republican and the Federalists found it necessary to agree upon their favorites before the election and they adopted a colonial device, the pre-election caucus. The Federalist members of Congress held a conference and selected their candidate, and the Republicans followed the example. In a short time, the practice of nominating by a congressional caucus became a recognized institution. The election still remained with the people but the power of picking candidates for their approval passed into the hands of a small body of senators and representatives. A reaction against this was unavoidable. Two friends of, quote, the plain people, like Andrew Jackson, it was intolerable, all the more so because the caucus never favored him with the nomination. More conservative men also found grave objections to it. They pointed out that whereas the Constitution intended the president to be an independent officer, he had now fallen under the control of a caucus of congressmen. The supremacy of the legislative branch had been obtained by an extra-legal political device. 
to such objections were added practical considerations. In 1824, when personal rivalry had taken the place of party conflicts, the Congressional Caucus selected as candidate William H. Crawford of Georgia, a man of distinction but no great popularity, passing by such an obvious hero as General Jackson. The followers of the general were enraged and demanded nothing short of the death of, quote, King Caucus. Their clamor was effective. Under their attacks, the caucus came to an ignominious end. In place of it, there arose in 1831 a new device, the National Nominating Convention, composed of delegates elected by party voters for the sole purpose of nominating candidates. Senators and representatives were still prominent in the party councils, but they were swamped by hundreds of delegates, quote, fresh from the people, as Jackson was wont to say. In fact, each convention was made up mainly of office holders and office seekers, and the new institution was soon denounced as vigorously as King Caucus had been, particularly by statesmen who failed to obtain a nomination. Still, it grew in strength and by 1840 was firmly established. The End of the Old Generation In the election of 1824, the representatives of the, quote, aristocracy made their last successful stand. Until then, the leadership by men of, quote, wealth and talents had been undisputed. There had been five presidents, Washington, John Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, all Eastern men brought up in prosperous families with the advantages of culture which come from leisure and the possession of life's refinements. None of them had ever been compelled to work with his hands for a livelihood. Four of them had been slaveholders. Jefferson was a philosopher, learned in natural science, a master of foreign languages, a gentleman of dignity and grace of manner, notwithstanding his studied simplicity. Madison, it was said, was armed, quote, with all the culture of his century. Monroe was a graduate of William and Mary, a gentleman of the old school. Jefferson and his three successors called themselves Republicans and professed a genuine faith in the people, but they were not, quote, of the people themselves. They were not sons of the soil or the workshop. They were all men of, quote, the grand old order of society, who gave finish and style even to popular government. Monroe was the last of the presidents belonging to the heroic epoch of the Revolution. He had served in the War for Independence, in the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, and in an official capacity after the adoption of the Constitution. In short, he was of the age that had wrought American independence and set the government afloat. With his passing, leadership went to a new generation, but his successor, John Quincy Adams, formed a bridge between the old and the new in that he combined a high degree of culture with democratic sympathies. Washington had died in 1799, preceded but a few months by Patrick Henry, and followed in four years by Samuel Adams. Hamilton had been killed in a duel with Burr in 1804. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams 
were yet alive in 1824, but they were soon to pass from the scene, reconciled at last, full of years and honors. Madison was in dignified retirement, destined to live long enough to protest against the doctrine of nullification proclaimed by South Carolina before death carried him away at the ripe old age of 85. The Election of John Quincy Adams, 1824 The campaign of 1824 marked the end of the, quote, era of good feeling. Inaugurated by the collapse of the Federalist Party, after the election of 1816. There were four leading candidates, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, and W. H. Crawford. The result of the election was a division of the electoral votes into four parts, and no one received a majority. Under the Constitution, therefore, the selection of President passed to the House of Representatives. Clay, who stood at the bottom of the poll, threw his weight to Adams and assured his triumph, much to the chagrin of Jackson's friends. They thought, with a certain justification, that inasmuch as the hero of New Orleans had received the largest electoral vote, the House was morally bound to accept the popular judgment and make him president. Jackson shook hands cordially with Adams on the day of the inauguration, but never forgave him for being elected. While Adams called himself a Republican in politics and often spoke of, quote, the rule of the people, he was regarded by Jackson's followers as, quote, an aristocrat. He was not a son of the soil, neither was he acquainted at first hand with the labor of farmers and mechanics. He had been educated at Harvard and in Europe. Like his illustrious father, John Adams, he was a stern and reserved man, little given to seeking popularity. Moreover, he was from the East, and the frontiersmen of the West regarded him as a man, quote, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Jackson's supporters especially disliked him because they thought their hero entitled to the presidency. Their anger was deepened when Adams appointed Clay to the office of Secretary of State, and they set up a cry that there had been a, quote, deal by which Clay had helped to elect Adams to get office for himself. Though Adams conducted his administration with great dignity and in a fine spirit of public service, he was unable to overcome the opposition which he encountered on his election to office or to win popularity in the West and South. On the contrary, by advocating government assistance in building roads and canals and public grants in aid of education, arts, and sciences, he ran counter to the current which had set in against appropriations of federal funds for internal improvements. By signing the Tariff Bill of 1828, soon known as the, quote, tariff of abominations, he made new enemies without adding to his friends in New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, where he sorely needed them. Handicapped by the false charge that he had been a party to a, quote, corrupt bargain with Clay to secure his first election, attacked for his advocacy of a high protective tariff, charged with favoring a, quote, aristocracy of office holders in Washington on account of his refusal to discharge government clerks by the wholesale 
Adams was retired from the White House after he had served four years. The Triumph of Jackson in 1828 Probably no candidate for the presidency ever had such passionate popular support as Andrew Jackson had in 1828. He was truly a man of the people. Born of poor parents in the upland region of South Carolina, schooled in poverty and adversity, without the advantages of education or the refinements of cultivated leisure, he seemed the embodiment of the spirit of the new American democracy. Early in his youth, he had gone into the frontier of Tennessee, where he soon won a name as a fearless and intrepid Indian fighter. On the march and in camp, he endeared himself to his men by sharing their hardships, sleeping on the ground with them, and eating parched corn when nothing better could be found for the privates. From local prominence, he sprang into national fame by his exploit at the Battle of New Orleans. His reputation as a military hero was enhanced by the feeling that he had been a martyr to political treachery in 1824. The farmers of the West and South claimed him as their own. The mechanics of the Eastern cities, newly enfranchised, also looked upon him as their friend. Though his views on the tariff, internal improvements, and other issues before the country were either vague or unknown, he was readily elected president. The returns of the electoral vote in 1828 revealed the sources of Jackson's power. In New England, he received but one ballot from Maine. He had a majority of the electors in New York and all of them in Pennsylvania and he carried every state south of Maryland and beyond the Appalachians. Adams did not get a single electoral vote in the South and West. The prophecy of the Hartford Convention had been fulfilled. When Jackson took the oath of office on March 4, 1829, the government of the United States entered into a new era. Until this time, the inauguration of a president, even that of Jefferson, the apostle of simplicity, had brought no rude shock to the course of affairs at the Capitol. Hitherto, the installation of a president meant that an old-fashioned gentleman, accompanied by a few servants, had driven to the White House in his coach, taken the oath with quiet dignity, appointed a few new men to the higher posts, continued in office the long list of regular civil employees, and begun his administration with respectable decorum. Jackson changed all this. When he was inaugurated, men and women journeyed hundreds of miles to witness the ceremony. Great throngs pressed into the White House, Quote, upset the bowls of punch, broke the glasses, and stood with their muddy boots on the satin-covered chairs to see the people's president. End quote. If Jefferson's inauguration was, as he called it, the quote, great revolution, Jackson's inauguration was a cataclysm. End of section three. Recording by Robert Scott, Mojo Move 411.com, December 2007. Section 4 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 4. The West and Jacksonian Democracy. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibbony, Arkansas, December 2007. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 4, The West and Jacksonian Democracy, Chapter 11, Jacksonian Democracy, Continued. The New Democracy at Washington. The Spoils System. The staid and respectable society of Washington was disturbed by this influx of farmers and frontiersmen. To speak of politics became bad form among fashionable women. The clerks and civil servants of the government, who had enjoyed long and secure tenure of office, became alarmed at the clamor of new men for their positions. Doubtless the major portion of them had opposed the election of Jackson, and looked with feelings akin to contempt upon him and his followers. With a hunter's instinct, Jackson scented his prey. Determined to have none but his friends in office, he made a clean sweep, expelling old employees to make room for men fresh from the people. This was a new custom. Other presidents had discharged a few officers for engaging in opposition politics. They had been careful in making appointments not to choose inveterate enemies, but they discharged relatively few men on account of their political views and partisan activities. By wholesale removals and the frank selection of officers on party grounds, a practice already well entrenched in New York, Jackson established the spoils system at Washington. The famous slogan, To the victor belong the spoils of victory, became the avowed principle of the national government. Statesmen like Calhoun denounced it, poets like James Russell Lowell ridiculed it, faithful servants of the government suffered under it, but it held undisturbed sway for half a century thereafter, each succeeding generation outdoing, if possible, its predecessor in the use of public office for political purposes. If anyone remarked that training and experience were necessary qualifications for important public positions, he met Jackson's own profession of faith. The duties of any public office are so simple, or admit of being made so simple, that any man can in a short time become master of them. THE TARIFF AND NULLIFICATION Jackson had not been installed in power very long before he was compelled to choose between states' rights and nationalism. The immediate occasion of the trouble was the tariff, a matter on which Jackson did not have any very decided views. His mind did not run naturally to abstruse economic questions, and owing to the divided opinion of the country, it was good politics to be vague and ambiguous in the controversy. Especially was this true, because the tariff issue was threatening to split the country into parties again. THE DEVELOPMENT OF THE POLICY OF PROTECTION The War of 1812 and the commercial policies of England which followed it had accentuated the need for American economic independence. During that conflict, the United States, cut off from English manufacturers as during the Revolution, built up home industries to meet the unusual call for iron, steel, cloth, and other military and naval supplies, as well as the demands from ordinary markets. Iron foundries and textile mills sprang up as in the night. Hundreds of businessmen invested fortunes in industrial enterprises so essential to the military needs of the government, and the people at large fell into the habit of buying American-made goods again. As the London Times tersely observed of the Americans, their first war with England made them independent, their second war made them formidable. In recognition of this state of affairs, the tariff of 1816 was designed, first, to prevent England from ruining these infant industries by dumping the accumulated stores of years suddenly upon American markets, and, secondly, to enlarge in the manufacturing centers the demand for American agricultural produce. It accomplished the purposes of its framers, it kept in operation the mills and furnaces so recently built. It multiplied the number of industrial workers and enhanced the demand for the produce of the soil. It brought about another very important result. 
It turned the capital and enterprise of New England from shipping to manufacturing, and converted her statesmen, once friends of low tariffs, into ardent advocates of protection. In the early years of the nineteenth century, the Yankees had bent their energies toward building and operating ships to carry produce from America to Europe and manufactures from Europe to America. For this reason, they had opposed the tariff of 1816, calculated to increase domestic production and cut down the carrying trade. Defeated in their efforts, they accepted the inevitable and turned to manufacturing. Soon they were powerful friends of protection for American enterprise. As the money invested and the labor employed in the favored industries increased, the demand for continued and heavier protection grew apace. Even the farmers, who furnished raw materials like wool, flax, and hemp, began to see eye to eye with the manufacturers. So the textile interests of New England, the iron masters of Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, the wool, hemp, and flax growers of Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, and the sugar planters of Louisiana developed into a formidable combination in support of a high protective tariff. The planting states oppose the tariff. In the meantime, the cotton states on the seaboard had forgotten about the havoc wrought during the Napoleonic Wars when their produce rotted because there were no ships to carry it to Europe. The seas were now open. The area devoted to cotton had swiftly expanded as Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana were opened up. Cotton had in fact become king, and the planters depended for their prosperity, as they thought, upon the sale of their staple to English manufacturers, whose spinning and weaving mills were the wonder of the world. Manufacturing nothing, and having to buy nearly everything except farm produce, and even much of that for slaves, the planters naturally wanted to purchase manufacturers in the cheapest market, England, where they sold most of their cotton. The tariff, they contended, raised the price of the goods they had to buy and was thus, in fact, a tribute laid on them for the benefit of the northern mill owners. The Tariff of Abominations They were overborne, however, in 1824 and again in 1828, when northern manufacturers and western farmers forced Congress to make an upward revision of the tariff. The Act of 1828 known as the Tariff of Abominations, though slightly modified in 1832, was the straw which broke the camel's back. Southern leaders turned in rage against the whole system. The legislatures of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama denounced it. A general convention of delegates held at Augusta issued a protest of defiance against it, and South Carolina, weary of verbal battles, decided to prevent its enforcement. South Carolina nullifies the tariff. The legislature of that state, on October 26, 1832, passed a bill calling for a state convention which duly assembled in the following month. In no mood for compromise, it adopted the famous Ordinance of Nullification after a few days' debate. Every line of this document was clear and firm. The tariff, it opened, gives bounties to classes and individuals at the expense and to the injury and oppression of other classes and individuals. It is a violation of the Constitution of the United States and therefore null and void. Its enforcement in South Carolina is unlawful. If the federal government attempts to coerce the state into obeying the law, the people of this state will thenceforth hold themselves absolved from all further obligations to maintain or preserve their political connection with the people of the other states, and will forthwith proceed to organize a separate government and do all other acts and things which sovereign and independent states may of right do. Southern States Condemn Nullification The answer of the country to this note of defiance, couched in the language used in the Kentucky Resolutions and by the New England Federalists during the War of 1812, was quick and positive. The legislatures of the southern states, while condemning the tariff, repudiated the step which South Carolina had taken. Georgia responded, We abhor the doctrine of nullification as neither a peaceful nor a constitutional remedy. Alabama found it unsound in theory and dangerous in practice. 
North Carolina replied that it was revolutionary in character, subversive of the Constitution of the United States. Mississippi answered, It is disunion by force, it is civil war. Virginia spoke more softly, condemning the tariff and sustaining the principle of the Virginia resolutions, but denying that South Carolina could find in them any sanction for her proceedings. Jackson firmly upholds the Union. The eyes of the country were turned upon Andrew Jackson. It was known that he looked with no friendly feelings upon nullification, for, at a Jefferson dinner in the spring of 1830, while the subject was in the air, he had with laconic firmness announced a toast. Our Federal Union, it must be preserved. When two years later the opening challenge came from South Carolina, he replied that he would enforce the law, saying with his frontier directness, If a single drop of blood shall be shed there in opposition to the laws of the United States, I will hang the first man I can lay my hands on, engaged in such conduct, upon the first tree that I can reach. He made ready to keep his word by preparing for the use of military and naval forces in sustaining the authority of the federal government. Then, in a long and impassioned proclamation to the people of South Carolina, he pointed out the national character of the Union, and announced his solemn resolve to preserve it by all constitutional means. Nullification he branded as incompatible with the existence of the Union, contradicted expressly by the letter of the Constitution, unauthorized by its spirit, inconsistent with every principle on which it was founded, and destructive of the great objects for which it was formed. A Compromise In his messages to Congress, however, Jackson spoke the language of conciliation. A few days before issuing his proclamation, he suggested that protection should be limited to the articles of domestic manufacture indispensable to safety in wartime, and shortly afterward he asked for new legislation to aid him in enforcing the laws. With two propositions before it, one to remove the chief grounds for South Carolina's resistance, and the other to apply force if it was continued, Congress bent its efforts to avoid a crisis. On February 12, 1833, Henry Clay laid before the Senate a compromise tariff bill, providing for the gradual reduction of the duties, until by 1842 they would reach the level of the law which Calhoun had supported in 1816. About the same time, the force bill, designed to give the President ample authority in executing the law in South Carolina, was taken up. After a short but acrimonious debate, both measures were passed and signed by President Jackson on the same day, March 2nd. Looking upon the reduction of the tariff as a complete vindication of her policy and an undoubted victory, South Carolina rescinded her ordinance and enacted another nullifying the force bill. The webster hayne Debate Where the actual victory lay in this quarrel, long the subject of high dispute, need not concern us today. Perhaps the chief result of the whole affair was a clarification of the issue between the North and the South, a definite statement of the principles for which men on both sides were years afterwards to lay down their lives. On behalf of nationalism and a perpetual union, the staunch old Democrat from Tennessee had, in his proclamation on nullification, spoken a language that admitted of only one meaning. On behalf of nullification, Senator Hayne of South Carolina, a skilled lawyer and courtly orator, had in a great speech delivered in the Senate in January 1830, set forth clearly and cogently the doctrine that the Union is a compact among sovereign states from which the parties may lawfully withdraw. It was this address that called into the arena Daniel Webster, Senator from Massachusetts, who, spreading the mantle of oblivion over the Hartford Convention, delivered a reply to Haynes that has been reckoned among the powerful orations of all time, a plea for the supremacy of the Constitution and the national character of the Union. The War on the United States Bank If events forced the issue of nationalism and nullification upon Jackson, the same could not be said of his attack on the bank. That institution, once denounced by every true Jeffersonian, had been re-established in 1816 
under the administration of Jefferson's disciple, James Madison. It had not been in operation very long, however, before it aroused bitter opposition, especially in the South and the West. Its notes drove out of circulation the paper currency of unsound banks, chartered by the states, to the great anger of local financiers. It was accused of favoritism in making loans, of conferring special privileges upon politicians in return for their support at Washington. To all Jackson's followers, it was an insidious money power. One of them openly denounced it as an institution designed to strengthen the arm of wealth and counterpoise the influence of extended suffrage in the disposition of public affairs. This sentiment President Jackson fully shared. In his first message to Congress, he assailed the bank in vigorous language. He declared that its constitutionality was in doubt and alleged that it had failed to establish a sound and uniform currency. If such an institution was necessary, he continued, it should be a public bank, owned and managed by the government, not a private concern endowed with special privileges by it. In his second and third messages, Jackson came back to the subject, leaving the decision, however, to an enlightened people and their representatives. Moved by this frank hostility and anxious for the future, the bank applied to Congress for a renewal of its charter in 1832, four years before the expiration of its life. Clay, with his eye upon the presidency and an issue for the campaign, warmly supported the application. Congress, deeply impressed by his leadership, passed the bill granting the new charter and sent the open defiance to Jackson. His response was an instant veto. The battle was on and it raged with fury until the close of his second administration, ending in the destruction of the bank, a disordered currency, and a national panic. In his veto message, Jackson attacked the bank as unconstitutional and even hinted at corruption. He refused to assent to the proposition that the Supreme Court had settled the question of constitutionality by the decision in the McCulloch case. Each public officer, he argued, who takes an oath to support the Constitution, swears that he will support it as he understands it, not as it is understood by others. Not satisfied with his veto and his declaration against the bank, Jackson ordered the Secretary of the Treasury to withdraw the government deposits which formed a large part of the institution's funds. This action he followed up by an open charge that the bank had used money shamefully to secure the return of its supporters to Congress. The Senate, stung by this charge, solemnly resolved that Jackson had assumed upon himself authority and power not conferred by the Constitution and laws, but in derogation of both. The effects of the destruction of the bank were widespread. When its charter expired in 1836, banking was once more committed to the control of the states. The state legislatures, under a decision rendered by the Supreme Court after the death of Marshall, began to charter banks under state ownership and control, with full power to issue paper money. This in spite of the provision in the Constitution that states shall not issue bills of credit or make anything but gold and silver coin legal tender in the payment of debts. Once more the country was flooded by paper currency of uncertain value. To make matters worse, Jackson adopted the practice of depositing huge amounts of government funds in these banks, not forgetting to render favors to those institutions which supported him in politics, pet banks as they were styled at the time. In 1837, partially, though by no means entirely, as a result of the abolition of the bank, the country was plunged into one of the most disastrous panics which it ever experienced. Internal Improvements Checked the bank had presented to Jackson a very clear problem, one of destruction. Other questions were not so simple, particularly the subject of federal appropriations in aid of roads and other internal improvements. Jefferson had strongly favored government assistance in such matters, but his administration was followed by a reaction. Both Madison and Monroe vetoed acts of Congress appropriating public funds for public roads advancing as their reason the argument that the Constitution authorized no such laws. Jackson, puzzled by the clamor on both sides, 
followed their example without making the constitutional bar absolute. Congress, he thought, might lawfully build highways of a national and military value, but he strongly deprecated attacks by local interests on the federal treasury. THE TRIUMPH OF THE EXECUTIVE BRANCH Jackson's re-election in 1832 served to confirm his opinion that he was the chosen leader of the people, freed and instructed to ride roughshod over Congress and even the courts. No president before or since ever entertained in times of peace such lofty notions of executive prerogative. The entire body of federal employees he transformed into obedient servants of his wishes, a sign or a nod from him making and undoing the fortunes of the humble and the mighty. His lawful cabinet of advisers, filling all of the high posts in the government, he treated with scant courtesy, preferring rather to secure his counsel and advice from an unofficial body of friends and dependents who, owing to their secret methods and backstairs arrangements, became known as the kitchen cabinet. Under the leadership of a silent, astute, and resourceful politician, Amos Kendall, this informal gathering of the faithful both gave and carried out decrees and orders, communicating the President's lightest wish or strictest command to the uppermost part of the country. Resolutely and in the face of bitter opposition, Jackson had removed the deposits from the United States Bank. When the Senate protested against this arbitrary conduct, he did not rest until it was forced to expunge the resolution of condemnation. In time, one of his lieutenants, with his own hands, was able to tear the censure from the records. When Chief Justice Marshall issued a decree against Georgia which did not suit him, Jackson, according to tradition, blurted out that Marshall could go ahead and enforce his own orders. To the end he pursued his willful way, finally even choosing his own successor. End of section 4 Section 5 of the History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard Part 4 The West and Jacksonian Democracy this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 4. The West and Jacksonian Democracy. Chapter 11. Jacksonian Democracy Concluded The Rise of the Whigs Jackson's Measures Arouse Opposition Measures so decided, policies so radical, and conduct so high-handed could not fail to arouse against Jackson a deep and exasperated opposition. The truth is, the conduct of his entire administration profoundly disturbed the business and finances of the country. It was accompanied by conditions similar to those which existed under the Articles of Confederation. A paper currency almost as unstable and irritating as the worthless notes of revolutionary days flooded the country hindering the easy transaction of business. The use of federal funds for internal improvements, so vital to the exchange of commodities, which is the very life of industry, was blocked by executive vetoes. The Supreme Court, which under Marshall had held refractory states to their obligations under the Constitution, was flouted. States' rights judges, deliberately selected by Jackson for the bench, began to sap and undermine the rulings of Marshall. The protective tariff under which the textile industry of New England, the iron mills of Pennsylvania, and the wool, flax, and hemp farms of the West had flourished, had received a severe blow 
in the Compromise of 1833, which promised a steady reduction of duties. To cap the climax, Jackson's party, casting aside the old reputable name of Republican, boldly chose for its title the term Democrat. Throwing down the gauntlet to every conservative who doubted the omniscience of the people. All these things worked together to invoke an opposition that was sharp and determined. Clay and the National Republicans In this opposition movement, leadership fell to Henry Clay, a son of Kentucky, rather than to Daniel Webster of Massachusetts. Like Jackson, Clay was born in a home haunted by poverty. Left fatherless early and thrown upon his own resources, he went from Virginia into Kentucky, where, by sheer force of intellect, he rose to eminence in the profession of law. Without the martial gifts or the martial spirit of Jackson, he slipped more easily into the social habits of the East at the same time that he retained his hold on the affections of the boisterous West. Farmers of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky loved him. Financers of New York and Philadelphia trusted him. He was thus a leader well fitted to gather the forces of opposition into union against Jackson. Around Clay's standard assembled a motley collection representing every species of political opinion united by one tie only, hatred for, quote, old hickory. Nullifiers and less strenuous advocates of states' rights were yoked with nationalists of Webster's school. Ardent protectionists were bound together with equally ardent free traders, all fraternizing in one grand confusion of ideas under the title of National Republicans. Thus, the ancient and honorable term selected by Jefferson and his party, now abandoned by Jacksonian democracy, was adroitly adopted to cover the supporters of Clay. The platform of the party, however, embraced all the old Federalist principles, protection for American industry, internal improvements, respect for the Supreme Court, resistance to executive tyranny, and denunciation of the spoils system. Though Jackson was easily victorious in 1832, the popular vote cast for Clay should have given him some doubts about the faith of, quote, the whole people, in the wisdom of his, quote, reign. Van Buren and the Panic of 1837 Nothing could shake the general's superb confidence. At the end of his second term, he insisted on selecting his own successor. At a national convention chosen by party voters, but packed with his office holders and friends, he nominated Martin Van Buren of New York. Once more, he proved his strength by carrying the country for the Democrats. With a fine flourish, he attended the inauguration of Van Buren and then retired. Amid the applause and tears of his devotees, to the hermitage, his home in Tennessee. Fortunately for him, Jackson escaped the odium of a disastrous panic which struck the country with terrible force in the following summer. Among the contributory causes of this crisis, no doubt, were the destruction of the bank and the issuance of the quote, specie circular of 1836, which required the purchasers of public lands to pay for them in coin instead of the paper notes of state banks. 
whatever the dominating cause, the ruin was widespread. Bank after bank went under. Boomtowns in the West collapsed. Eastern mills shut down and working people in the industrial centers, starving from unemployment, begged for relief. Van Buren braved the storm, offering no measure of reform or assistance to the distracted people. He did seek security for government funds by suggesting the removal of deposits from private banks and the establishment of an independent treasury system with government depositories for public funds in several leading cities. The plan was finally accepted by Congress in 1840. Had Van Buren been a captivating figure, he might have lived down the discredit of the panic unjustly laid at his door. But he was far from being a favorite with the populace. Though a man of many talents, he owed his position to the quiet and adept management of Jackson rather than to his own personal qualities. The men of the frontier did not care for him. They suspected that he ate from, quote, gold plate, and they could not forgive him for being an astute politician from New York. Still, the Democratic Party, remembering Jackson's wishes, renominated him unanimously in 1840 and saw him go down to utter defeat. The Whigs and General Harrison By this time, the National Republicans, now known as Whigs, a title taken from the party of opposition to the crown in England, had learned many lessons. Taking a leaf out of the Democratic book, they nominated not Clay of Kentucky, well known for his views on the bank, the tariff, and internal improvements, but a military hero, General William Henry Harrison a man of uncertain political opinions. Harrison, a son of a Virginia signer of the Declaration of Independence, sprang into public view by winning a battle more famous than important. Quote, Tippecanoe, a brush with the Indians in Indiana. He added to his laurels by rendering praiseworthy services during the War of 1812. When Days of Peace returned, he was rewarded by a grateful people with a seat in Congress. Then he retired to quiet life in a little village near Cincinnati. Like Jackson, he was held to be a son of the South and the West. Like Jackson, he was a military hero, a lesser light, but still a light. Like old Hickory, he rode into office on a tide of popular feeling against an Eastern man accused of being something of an aristocrat. His personal popularity was sufficient. The Whigs who nominated him shrewdly refused to adopt a platform or declare their belief in anything. When some Democrat asserted that Harrison was a backwoodsman whose sole wants were a jug of hard cider and a log cabin. The Whigs treated the remark not as an insult, but as proof positive that Harrison deserved the votes of Jackson men. The jug and the cabin they proudly transformed into symbols of the campaign and won for their chieftain 234 electoral votes while Van Buren got only 60. Harrison and Tyler The hero of Tippecanoe was not long to enjoy the fruits of his victory. The hungry horde of Whig office seekers descended upon him like wolves upon the fold. If he went out, they waylaid him. If he stayed indoors, he was besieged. Not even his bedchamber was spared. 
he was none too strong at best, and he took a deep cold on the day of his inauguration. Between driving out Democrats and appeasing Whigs, he fell mortally ill. Before the end of a month, he lay dead at the Capitol. Harrison's successor, John Tyler, the vice president whom the Whigs had nominated to catch votes in Virginia, was more of a Democrat than anything else, though he was not partisan enough to please anybody. The Whigs railed at him because he would not approve the founding of another United States bank. The Democrats stormed at him for refusing until near the end of his term to sanction the annexation of Texas, which had declared its independence of Mexico in 1836. His entire administration, marked by unseemly wrangling, produced only two measures of importance. The Whigs, flushed by victory with the aid of a few protectionist Democrats, enacted in 1842 a new tariff law destroying the compromise which had brought about the truce between the North and the South in the days of nullification. The distinguished leader of the Whigs, Daniel Webster, as Secretary of State in negotiation with Lord Ashburton representing Great Britain, settled the long-standing dispute between the two countries over the main boundary. A year after closing this chapter in American diplomacy, Webster withdrew to private life, leaving the president to endure alone the buffets of political fortune. To the end, the Whigs regarded Tyler as a traitor to their cause, but the judgment of history is that it was a case of the biter bitten. They had nominated him for the vice presidency as a man of views acceptable to Southern Democrats in order to catch their votes, little reckoning with the chances of his becoming president. Tyler had not deceived them, and thoroughly soured, he left the White House in 1845 not to appear in public life again until the days of secession, when he espoused the Southern Confederacy. Jacksonian democracy with new leadership, serving a new cause, slavery was returned to power under James K. Polk, a friend of the general from Tennessee. A few grains of sand were to run through the hourglass before the Whig party was to be broken and scattered, as the Federalists had been more than a generation before. The Interaction of American and European Opinion Democracy in England and France During the period of Jacksonian democracy, as in all epochs of ferment, there was a close relation between the thought of the new world and the old. In England, the successes of the American experiment were used as arguments in favor of overthrowing the aristocracy which George III had manipulated with such effect against America half a century before. In the United States, on the other hand, Conservatives like Chancellor Kent, the stout opponent of manhood suffrage in New York, cited the riots of the British working class as a warning against admitting the same classes to a share in the government of the United States. Along with the agitation of opinion went epoch-making events. In 1832, the year of Jackson's second triumph, the British Parliament passed its first reform bill, which conferred the ballot, not on working men as yet, but on mill owners and shopkeepers whom the landlords regarded with genuine horror. 
The initial step was thus taken in breaking down the privileges of the landed aristocracy and the rich merchants of England. About the same time, a popular revolution occurred in France. The Bourbon family, restored to the throne of France by the Allied powers after their victory over Napoleon in 1815, had embarked upon a policy of arbitrary government. To use the familiar phrase, they had learned nothing and forgotten nothing. Charles X, who came to the throne in 1824, set to work with zeal to undo the results of the French Revolution, to stifle the press, restrict the suffrage, and restore the clergy and the nobility to their ancient rights. His policy encountered equally zealous opposition, and in 1830 he was overthrown. The popular party, under the leadership of Lafayette, established not a republic as some of the radicals had hoped, but a, quote, liberal, middle-class monarchy under Louis-Philippe. This second French Revolution made a profound impression on Americans, convincing them that the whole world was moving toward democracy. The mayor, aldermen, and citizens of New York City joined in a great parade to celebrate the fall of the Bourbons. Mingled with cheers from the new order in France were hurrahs for, quote, the people's own Andrew Jackson, the hero of New Orleans and the President of the United States, end quote. European Interest in America To the older and more settled Europeans, the democratic experiment in America was either a menace or an inspiration. Conservatives viewed it with anxiety, liberals with optimism. Far-sighted leaders could see that the tide of democracy was rising all over the world and could not be stayed. Naturally, the country that had advanced furthest among the new course was the place in which to find arguments for and against proposals that Europe should make experiments of the same character. De Tocqueville's Democracy in America In addition to the casual traveler, there began to visit the United States the thoughtful observer bent on finding out what manner of nation this was springing up in the wilderness. Those who looked with sympathy upon the growing popular forces of England and France found in the United States, in spite of many blemishes and defects, a guarantee for the future of the people's rule in the old world. One of these, Alexis de Tocqueville, a French liberal, of mildly democratic sympathies, made a journey to this country in 1831. He described in a very remarkable volume, Democracy in America, the grand experiment as he saw it. On the whole, he was convinced, after examining with a critical eye the life and labor of the American people, as well as the constitutions of the states and the nation, he came to the conclusion that democracy, with all its faults, was both inevitable and successful. Slavery, he thought, was a painful contrast to the other features of American life, and he foresaw what proved to be the irrepressible conflict over it. He believed that through blundering, the people were destined to learn the highest of all arts, self-government on a grand scale. The absence of a leisure class devoted to no calling or profession, merely enjoying the refinements of life and adding to its graces. The flaw in American culture that gave deep distress to many a European leader, de Tocqueville thought 
a necessary virtue in the republic. Quote, Amongst a democratic people, where there is no hereditary wealth, every man works to earn a living, or has worked, or is born of parents who have worked. A notion of labor is therefore presented to the mind on every side as the necessary, natural, and honest condition of human existence. End quote. It was this notion of a government in the hands of people who labored that struck the French publicist as the most significant fact in the modern world. Harriet Martineau's Visit to America This phase of life also profoundly impressed the brilliant English writer Harriet Martineau. She saw all parts of the country the homes of the rich and the log cabins of the frontier. She traveled in stagecoaches, canal boats, and on horseback, and visited sessions of Congress and auctions at the slave markets. She tried to view the country impartially, and the thing that left the deepest mark on her mind was the solidarity of the people in one great political body. Quote, however various must be the tribes of inhabitants in those states, whatever part of the world may have been their birthplace, or that of their fathers, however broken may be their language, however servile or noble their employments, however exalted or despised their state, all are declared to be bound together by equal political obligations. In that self-governing country, all are held to have an equal interest in the principles of its institutions and to be bound in equal duty to watch their workings, End quote. Miss Martineau was also impressed with the passion of Americans for land ownership and contrasted the United States favorably with England, where the tillers of the soil were either tenants or laborers for wages. Adverse Criticism By no means all observers and writers were convinced that America was a success. The fastidious traveler, Mrs. Trollope, who thought the English system of church and state was ideal, saw in the United States only roughness and ignorance. She lamented the, quote, total and universal want of manners both in males and females, adding that while they appear to have clear heads and active intellects, there was no charm, no grace in their conversation, end quote. She found everywhere a lack of reverence for kings, learning, and rank. Other critics were even more savage. The editor of the Foreign Quarterly petulantly exclaimed that the United States was, quote, a brigand confederation, end quote. Charles Dickens declared the country to be, quote, so maimed and lame, so full of sores and ulcers that her best friends turn from the loathsome creature in disgust. End quote. Sidney Smith, editor of the Edinburgh Review, was never tired of trying his caustic wit at the expense of America. Quote, Their Franklins and Washingtons and all the other sages and heroes of their revolution were born and bred subjects of the King of England. End quote. He observed in 1820. Quote, During the thirty or forty years of their independence, they have done absolutely nothing for the sciences, for the arts, for literature, or even for the statesmanlike studies of politics or political economy. In the four quarters of the globe, who reads an American book, or goes to an American play, or looks at an American picture or statue? End quote. 
to put a sharp sting into his taunt he added forgetting by whose authority slavery was introduced and fostered quote, under which of the old tyrannical governments of europe is every sixth man a slave whom his fellow creatures may buy and sell End quote. Some Americans, while resenting the hasty and often superficial judgments of European writers, winced under their satire and took thought about certain particulars in the indictments brought against them. The mass of people, however, bent on the great experiment, gave little heed to carping critics who saw the flaws and not the achievements of our country critics who were in fact less interested in america than in preventing the rise and growth of democracy in europe references j s bassett life of andrew jackson j w burgess the middle period h lodge daniel webster W. MacDonald, Jacksonian Democracy, Note, American Nation Series. Ostrogorsky, Democracy and the Organization of Political Parties, Volume 2. C. H. Peck, The Jacksonian Epic. C. Schurz, Henry Clay. Questions. Question 1. By what devices was democracy limited in the first days of our republic? Question 2. On what grounds were the limitations defended? On what grounds were the limitations attacked? Question 3. Outline the rise of political democracy in the United States. Question 4. Describe three important changes in our political system. Question 5. Contrast the presidents of the old and new generations. Question 6. Account for the unpopularity of John Adams's administration. Question 7. What had been the career of Andrew Jackson before 1829? Question 8. Sketch the history of the protective tariff and explain the theory underlying it. Question 9. Explain the growth of Southern opposition to the tariff. Question 10. Relate the leading events connected with nullification in South Carolina. Question 11. State Jackson's views and tell the outcome of the controversy. Question 12. Why was Jackson opposed to the bank? How did he finally destroy it? Question 13. The Whigs complained of Jackson's, quote, executive tyranny. What did they mean? Question 14. Give some of the leading events in Clay's career. Question 15. How do you account for the triumph of Harrison in 1840? Question 16. Why was Europe especially interested in America at this period? Who were some of the European writers on American affairs? Research Topics Jackson's Criticism of the Bank MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook, pages 320-329 Financial Aspects of the Bank Controversy, Dewey, Financial History of the United States, Sections 86 through 87, Elson, History of the United States, 
pages 492 through 496. Jackson's view of the Union. See his proclamation on nullification in MacDonald, pages 333 through 340. Nullification. McMaster, History of the United States, Volume 4, pages 153 through 182. Elson, pages 487 through 492. The Webster Hain debate. Analyze the arguments. Extensive extracts are given in MacDonald's larger three volume work Select Documents of United States History, 1776 through 1761, pages 239 through 260. The Character of Jackson's Administration. Woodrow Wilson, History of the American People, Volume 4, pages 1 through 87. Elson, pages 498 through 501. The People in 1830. From Contemporary Writings in Heart. American History Told by Contemporaries, Volume 3, page 509 through 530. Biographical Studies, Andrew Jackson, J.Q. Adams, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, J.C. Calhoun, and W.H. Harrison. End of Section 5. Recording by Robert Scott. Mojo Move 411.com. M O J O M O V E 411.com. December 2007. History of the United States, Section 5 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 4, The West and Jacksonian Democracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 4, The West and Jacksonian Democracy, Chapter 12. The Middle Border and the Great West. "'We shall not send an emigrant beyond the Mississippi in a hundred years,' exclaimed Livingston, the principal author of the Louisiana Purchase. When he made this astounding declaration, he doubtless had before his mind's eye the great stretches of unoccupied lands between the Appalachians and the Mississippi. He also had before him the history of the English colonies, which told him of the two centuries required to settle the seaboard region. To practical men his prophecy did not seem far wrong, but before the lapse of half that time there appeared beyond the Mississippi a tier of new states, reaching from the Gulf of Mexico to the southern boundary of Minnesota, and a new commonwealth on the Pacific Ocean, where American emigrants had raised the bare flag of California. THE ADVANCE OF THE MIDDLE BORDER MISSOURI When the middle of the nineteenth century had been reached, the Mississippi River, which Daniel Boone, the intrepid hunter, had crossed during Washington's administration to escape from civilization in Kentucky, had become the waterway for a vast empire. The center of population of the United States had passed to the Ohio Valley. Missouri, with its wide reaches of rich lands, low-lying, level, and fertile, well adapted to hemp-raising, had drawn to its borders thousands of planters from the old southern states, from Virginia and the Carolinas, as well as from Kentucky and Tennessee. When the Great Compromise of 1820-21 admitted her to the Union wearing every jewel of sovereignty, as a florid orator announced, Migratory slave owners were assured that their property would be safe in Missouri. Along the western shore of the Mississippi and on both banks of the Missouri, to the uttermost limits of the state,
plantations tilled by bondsmen spread out in broad expanses. In the neighborhood of Jefferson City, the slaves numbered more than a fourth of the population. Into this stream of migration from the planting south flowed another current of land-tilling farmers, some from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi, driven out by the onrush of the planters buying and consolidating small farms into vast estates, and still more from the east and the old world. To the northwest over against Iowa, and to the southwest against Arkansas, these yeomen laid out farms to be tilled by their own labor. In those regions the number of slaves seldom rose above five or six percent of the population. The old French post, St. Louis, enriched by the fur trade of the far west and the steamboat traffic of the river, grew into a thriving commercial city, including among its 75,000 inhabitants in 1850 nearly 40,000 foreigners, German immigrants from Pennsylvania and Europe being the largest single element. Arkansas Below Missouri lay the territory of Arkansas, which had long been the paradise of the swarthy hunter and the restless frontiersman, fleeing from the advancing borders of farm and town. In search of the life, wild and free, where the rifle supplied the game and a few acres of ground, the corn and potatoes, they had filtered into the territory in an unending drift, squatting on the land. Without so much as asking the leave of any government, territorial or national, they claimed as their own the soil on which they first planted their feet. Like the Cherokee Indians, whom they had as neighbors, whose very customs and dress they sometimes adopted, the squatters spent their days in the midst of rough plenty, beset by chills, fevers, and the ills of the flesh, but for many years unvexed by political troubles or the restrictions of civilized life. Unfortunately for them, however, the fertile valleys of the Mississippi and Arkansas were well adapted to the cultivation of cotton and tobacco, and their sylvan peace was soon broken by an invasion of planters. The newcomers, with their servile workers, spread upward into the valley toward Missouri and along the southern border westward to the Red River. In time, the slaves in the tier of counties against Louisiana ranged from 30 to 70 percent of the population. This marked the doom of the small farmer, swept Arkansas into the main current of planting politics, and led to a powerful lobby at Washington in favor of admission to the Union, a boon granted in 1836. Michigan In accordance with a well-established custom, a free state was admitted to the Union to balance a slave state. In 1833, the people of Michigan, a territory ten times the size of Connecticut, announced that the time had come for them to enjoy the privileges of a commonwealth. All along the southern border, the land had been occupied largely by pioneers from New England, who built prim farmhouses and adopted the town meeting plan of self-government after the fashion of the old home. The famous post of Detroit was growing into a flourishing city as the boats plying on the Great Lakes carried travelers, settlers, and freight through the Narrows. In all, according to the census, there were more than 90,000 inhabitants in the territory. So it was not without warrant that they clamored for statehood. Congress, busy as ever with politics, delayed, and the inhabitants of Michigan, unable to restrain their impatience, called a convention, drew up a constitution, and started a lively quarrel with Ohio over the southern boundary. The hand of Congress was now forced. Objections were made to the new constitution on the ground that it gave the ballot to all free white males, including aliens not yet naturalized. But the protests were overborne in a long debate. The boundary was fixed, and Michigan, though shorn of some of the lands she claimed, came into the Union in 1837. Wisconsin Across Lake Michigan to the west lay the territory of Wisconsin, which shared with Michigan the interesting history of the Northwest, running back into the heroic days when French hunters and missionaries were planning a French empire for the great monarch Louis XIV. It will not be forgotten that the French rangers of the woods, 
the black-robed priests prepared for sacrifice even to death, the trappers of the French agencies, and the French explorers, Marquette, Joliet, and Menard, were the first white men to paddle their frail barks through the northern waters. They first blazed their trails into the black forests and left traces of their work in the names of portages and little villages. It was from these forests that red men, in full war paint, journeyed far to fight under the fleur de lis of France when the soldiers of King Louis made their last stand at Quebec and Montreal against the imperial arms of Britain. It was here that the British flag was planted in 1761, and that the great Pontiac conspiracy was formed two years later to overthrow British dominion. When, a generation afterward, the Stars and Stripes supplanted the Union Jack, the French were still almost the only white men in the region. They were soon joined by hustling Yankee fur traders who did battle royal against British interlopers. The traders cut their way through forest trails and laid out the routes through lake and stream and over portages for the settlers and their families from the states back east. It was the forest ranger who discovered the water power later used to turn the busy mills grinding the grain from the spreading farmlands. In the wake of the fur hunters, forest men and farmers came miners from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri crowding in to exploit the lead ores of the Northwest, some of them bringing slaves to work their claims. Had it not been for the gold fever of 1849 that drew the wielders of pick and shovel to the far west, Wisconsin would early have taken high rank among the mining regions of the country. From a favorable point of vantage on Lake Michigan, the village of Milwaukee, a center for lumber and grain transport and a place of entry for eastern goods, grew into a thriving city. It claimed 20,000 inhabitants when, in 1848, Congress admitted Wisconsin to the Union. Already the Germans, Irish, and Scandinavians had found their way into the territory. They joined Americans from the older states in clearing forests, building roads, transforming trails into highways, erecting mills, and connecting streams with canals to make a network of routes for the traffic that poured to and from the Great Lakes. Iowa and Minnesota to the southwest of Wisconsin, beyond the Mississippi, where the tall grass of the prairies waved like the sea, farmers from New England, New York, and Ohio had prepared Iowa for statehood. A tide of immigration that might have flowed into Missouri went northward, for freemen, unaccustomed to slavery and slave markets, preferred the open country above the compromise line. With incredible swiftness, they spread farms westward from the Mississippi. With Yankee ingenuity, they turned to trading on the river, building before 1836 three prosperous centers of traffic, Dubuque, Davenport, and Burlington. True to their old traditions, they founded colleges and academies that religion and learning might be cherished on the frontier as in the states from which they came. Prepared for self-government, the Iowans laid siege to the door of Congress and were admitted to the Union in 1846. Above Iowa, on the Mississippi, lay the territory of Minnesota, the home of the Dakotas, the Ojibways, and the Sioux. Like Michigan and Wisconsin, it had been explored early by the French scouts, and the first white settlement was the little French village of Mendota. To the people of the United States, the resources of the country were first revealed by the historic journey of Zebulon Pike in 1805, and by American fur traders who were quick to take advantage of the opportunity to ply their arts of hunting and bartering in fresh fields. In 1839, an American settlement was planted at Marina on the St. Croix, the outpost of advancing civilization. Within twenty years, the territory boasting a population of 150,000 asked for admission to the Union. In 1858, the plea was granted and Minnesota showed her gratitude three years later by being first among the states to offer troops to Lincoln in the hour of peril. On to the Pacific, Texas and the Mexican War. The Uniformity of the Middle West There was a certain monotony about pioneering in the Northwest and on the Middle Border. 
As the long stretches of land were cleared or prepared for the plow, they were laid out like checkerboards into squares of forty, eighty, one hundred sixty or more acres, each the seat of a homestead. There was a striking uniformity also about the endless succession of fertile fields spreading far and wide under the hot summer sun. No majestic mountains relieved the sweep of the prairie. Few monuments of other races and antiquity were there to awaken curiosity about the region. No sonorous bells in old missions rang out the time of day. The chaffering red man bartering blankets and furs for powder and whiskey had passed farther on. The population was made up of plain farmers and their families engaged in severe and unbroken labor, chopping down trees, draining fever-breeding swamps, breaking new ground, and planting from year to year the same rotation of crops. Nearly all the settlers were of Native American stock, into whose frugal and industrious lives the later Irish and German immigrants fitted, on the whole, with little friction. Even the Dutch oven fell before the cast-iron cooking stove. Happiness and sorrow, despair and hope were there, but all encompassed by the heavy tedium of prosaic sameness. A CONTRAST IN THE FAR WEST AND SOUTHWEST As George Rogers Clark and Daniel Boone had stirred the snug Americans of the seaboard to seek their fortunes beyond the Appalachians, so now Kit Carson, James Bowie, Sam Houston, Davy Crockett, and John C. Fremont were to lead the way into a new land, only a part of which was under the American flag. The setting for this new scene in the westward movement was thrown out in a wide sweep from the headwaters of the Mississippi to the banks of the Rio Grande, from the valleys of the Sabine and Red Rivers to Montana and the Pacific Slope. In comparison with the middle border, this region presented such startling diversities that only the eye of faith could foresee the unifying power of nationalism binding its communities with the older sections of the country. What contrasts indeed! The blue-grass region of Kentucky or the rich black soil of Illinois, the painted desert, the home of the sagebrush and the coyote, the level prairies of Iowa, the mighty Rockies shouldering themselves high against the horizon, the long bleak winters of Wisconsin, California of endless summer, the log churches of Indiana or Illinois, the quaint missions of San Antonio, Tucson, and Santa Barbara, the little state of Delaware, the empire of Texas, one hundred and twenty times its area, and scattered about through the northwest were signs of an ancient civilization, fragments of four- and five-story dwellings, ruined dams, aqueducts, and broken canals which told of once prosperous peoples who, by art and science, had conquered the aridity of the desert and lifted themselves in the scale of culture above the savages of the plain. The settlers of this vast empire were to be as diverse in their origins and habits as those of the colonies on the coast had been. Americans of English, Irish, and Scotch-Irish descent came as usual from the eastern states. To them were added the migratory Germans as well. Now for the first time came throngs of Scandinavians. Some were to make their homes on quiet farms as the border advanced against the setting sun. Others were to be Indian scouts, trappers, fur hunters, miners, cowboys, Texas planters, keepers of lonely posts on the plain and the desert, stage drivers, pilots of wagon trains, pony riders, fruit growers, lumberjacks, and smelter workers. One common bond united them, a passion for the self-government accorded to states. As soon as a few thousand settlers came together in a single territory, there arose a mighty shout for a position beside the staid commonwealths of the East and the South. Statehood meant to the pioneers self-government, dignity, and the right to dispose of land, minerals, and timber in their own way. In the quest for this local autonomy, there arose many a wordy contest in Congress, each of the political parties lending a helping hand in the admission of a state when it gave promise of adding new congressmen of the right political persuasion to use the current phrase. Southern Planters and Texas 
while the farmers of the north found the broad acres of the western prairies stretching on before them apparently in endless expanse it was far different with the southern planters ever active in their search for new fields as they exhausted the virgin soil of the older states the restless subjects of king cotton quickly reached the frontier of louisiana there they paused but only for a moment the fertile land of texas just across the boundary lured them on and the mexican republic to which it belonged extended to them a more than generous welcome little realizing the perils lurking in a peaceful penetration the authorities at mexico city opened wide the doors and made large grants of land to american contractors who agreed to bring a number of families into texas the omnipresent yankee in the person of moses austin of connecticut hearing of this good news in the southwest obtained a grant in eighteen twenty to settle three hundred americans near bexar a commission finally carried out to the letter by his son and celebrated in the name given to the present capital of the state of texas within a decade some twenty thousand americans had crossed the border mexico closes the door the government of mexico unaccustomed to such enterprise and thoroughly frightened by its extent drew back in dismay its fears were increased as quarrels broke out between the americans and the natives in texas fear grew into consternation when efforts were made by president jackson to buy the territory for the united states mexico then sought to close the floodgates it stopped all american colonization schemes canceled many of the land grants put a tariff on farming implements and abolished slavery these barriers were raised too late a call for help ran through the western border of the united states the sentinels of the frontier answered davy crockett the noted frontiersman bear hunter and backwoods politician james bowie the dexterous wielder of the knife that to this day bears his name and sam houston warrior and pioneer rushed to the aid of their countrymen in texas unacquainted with the niceties of diplomacy impatient at the formalities of international law they soon made it known that in spite of mexican sovereignty they would be their own masters the independence of texas declared numbering only about one-fourth of the population in texas they raised the standard of revolt in eighteen thirty six and summoned a convention following in the footsteps of their ancestors they issued a declaration of independence signed mainly by americans from the slave states anticipating that the government of mexico would not quietly accept their word of defiance as final they dispatched a force to repel the invading army as general houston called the troops advancing under the command of santa anna the mexican president a portion of the texas soldiers took their stand in the alamo an old spanish mission in the cottonwood trees in the town of san antonio instead of obeying the order to blow up the mission and retire they held their ground until they were completely surrounded and cut off from all help refusing to surrender they fought to the bitter end the last man falling a victim to the sword vengeance was swift within three months general houston overwhelmed santa anna at the san jacinto taking him prisoner of war and putting an end to all hopes for the restoration of mexican sovereignty over texas the lone star republic with houston at the head then sought admission to the united states this seemed at first an easy matter all that was required to bring it about appeared to be a treaty annexing texas to the union moreover president jackson at the height of his popularity had a warm regard for general houston and with his usual sympathy for rough and ready ways of doing things approved the transaction through an american representative in mexico jackson had long and anxiously labored by means none too nice to wring from the mexican republic the cession of the coveted territory when the texans took matters into their own hands he was more than pleased but he could not marshal the approval of two-thirds of the senators required for a treaty of annexation cautious as well as impetuous jackson did not press the issue he went out of office in eighteen thirty seven with texas uncertain as to her future 
Northern Opposition to Annexation All through the North, the opposition to annexation was clear and strong. Anti-slavery agitators could hardly find words savage enough to express their feelings. Texas, exclaimed Channing in a letter to Clay, is but the first step of aggression. I trust indeed that Providence will beat back and humble our cupidity and ambition. I now ask whether, as a people, we are prepared to seize on a neighboring territory for the end of extending slavery. I ask whether, as a people, we can stand forth in the sight of God, in the sight of nations, and adopt this atrocious policy. Sooner perish, sooner be our name blotted out from the record of nations. William Lloyd Garrison called for the secession of the northern states if Texas was brought into the Union with slavery. John Quincy Adams warned his countrymen that they were treading in the path of the imperialism that had brought the nations of antiquity to judgment and destruction. Henry Clay, the Whig candidate for president, taking into account changing public sentiment, blew hot and cold, losing the state of New York and the election of 1844 by giving a qualified approval of annexation. In the same campaign, the Democrats boldly demanded the re-annexation of Texas, based on claims which the United States once had to Spanish territory beyond the Sabine River. Annexation The politicians were disposed to walk very warily. Van Buren, at heart opposed to slavery extension, refused to press the issue of annexation. Tyler, a pro-slavery Democrat from Virginia, by a strange fling of fortune carried into office as a nominal Whig, kept his mind firmly fixed on the idea of re-election and let the troublesome matter rest until the end of his administration was in sight. He then listened with favor to the voice of the South. Calhoun stated what seemed to be a convincing argument. All good Americans have their hearts set on the Constitution. The admission of Texas is absolutely essential to the preservation of the Union. It will give a balance of power to the South as against the North growing with incredible swiftness in wealth and population. Tyler, impressed by the plea, appointed Calhoun to the office of Secretary of State in 1844 authorizing him to negotiate the Treaty of Annexation, a commission at once executed. This scheme was blocked in the Senate where the necessary two-thirds vote could not be secured. Balked but not defeated, the advocates of annexation drew up a joint resolution which required only a majority vote in both houses, and in February of the next year, just before Tyler gave way to Polk, they pushed it through Congress. So Texas, amid the groans of Boston and the hurrahs of Charleston, folded up her flag and came into the Union. The Mexican War The inevitable war with Mexico, foretold by the abolitionists and feared by Henry Clay, ensued, the ostensible cause being a dispute over the boundaries of the new state. The Texans claimed all the lands down to the Rio Grande. The Mexicans placed the border of Texas at the Nueces River and a line drawn thence in a northerly direction. President Polk, accepting the Texan view of the controversy, ordered General Zachary Taylor to move beyond the Nueces in defense of American sovereignty. This act of power, deemed by the Mexicans an invasion of their territory, was followed by an attack on our troops. President Polk, not displeased with the turn of events, announced that American blood had been spilled on American soil and that war existed by the act of Mexico. Congress, in a burst of patriotic fervor, brushed aside the protests of those who deplored the conduct of the government as wanton aggression on a weaker nation and granted money and supplies to prosecute the war. The few Whigs in the House of Representatives, who refused to vote in favor of taking up arms, accepted the inevitable with such good grace as they could command. All through the South and the West the war was popular. New England grumbled, but gave loyal, if not enthusiastic, support to a conflict precipitated by policies not of its own choosing. Only a handful of firm objectors held out. James Russell Lowell, 
in his Biglow papers, flung scorn and sarcasm to the bitter end. THE OUTCOME OF THE WAR The foregone conclusion was soon reached. General Taylor might have delivered the fatal thrust from northern Mexico if politics had not intervened. Polk, anxious to avoid raising up another military hero for the Whigs to nominate for president, decided to divide the honors by sending General Scott to strike a blow at the capital, Mexico City. The deed was done with speed and pomp, and two heroes were lifted into presidential possibilities. In the far west, a third candidate was made, John C. Fremont, who, in cooperation with Commodores Sloat and Stockton, and General Kearney, planted the stars and stripes on the Pacific Slope. In February 1848, the Mexicans came to terms, ceding to the victor California, Arizona, New Mexico, and more, a domain greater in extent than the combined areas of France and Germany. As a solve to the wound, the vanquished received $15 million in cash and the cancellation of many claims held by American citizens. Five years later, through the negotiations of James Gadsden, a further cession of lands along the southern border of Arizona and New Mexico was secured on payment of $10 million. General Taylor elected president. The ink was hardly dry upon the treaty that closed the war before rough and ready General Taylor, a slave owner from Louisiana, a Whig, as he said, but not an ultra-Whig, was put forward as the Whig candidate for president. He himself had not voted for years, and he was fairly innocent in matters political. The tariff, the currency, and internal improvements, with a magnificent gesture he referred to the people's representatives in Congress, offering to enforce the laws as made, if elected. Clay's followers mourned. Polk stormed, but could not win even a renomination at the hands of the Democrats. So it came about that the hero of Buena Vista, celebrated for his laconic order, give him a little more grape, Captain Bragg, became President of the United States. End of Section 6「Section 7 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard Part 4 The West and Jacksonian Democracy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard Part 4 the West and Jacksonian Democracy, Chapter Twelve, The Middle Border and the Great West, Continued. The Pacific Coast and Utah, Oregon. Closely associated in the popular mind with the contest about the affairs of Texas was a dispute with Great Britain over the possession of territory in Oregon. In their presidential campaign of 1844, the Democrats had coupled with the slogan the reannexation of Texas, to other cries, the reoccupation of Oregon, and fifty-four, forty, or fight. The last two slogans were founded on American discoveries and explorations in the far northwest. Their appearance in politics showed that the distant Oregon country, larger in area than New England, New York, and Pennsylvania combined, was at last receiving from the nation the attention which its importance warranted. JOINT OCCUPATION AND SETTLEMENT Both England and the United States had long laid claim to Oregon, and in 1818 they had agreed to occupy the territory jointly, a contract which was renewed ten years later for an indefinite period. Under this plan, citizens of both countries were free to hunt and settle anywhere in the region. The vanguard of British fur traders and Canadian priests was enlarged by many new recruits with Americans not far behind them. John Jacob Astor, the resourceful New York merchant, sent out trappers and hunters who established a trading post at Astoria in 1811. Some twenty years later, American missionaries, 
among them two very remarkable men, Jason Lee and Marcus Whitman, were preaching the gospel to the Indians. Through news from the fur traders and missionaries, eastern farmers heard of the fertile land awaiting their plows on the Pacific slope. Those with the pioneering spirit made ready to take possession of the new country. In 1839 a band went around by Cape Horn. Four years later a great expedition went overland. The way once broken, others followed rapidly. As soon as a few settlements were well established, the pioneers held a mass meeting and agreed upon a plan of government. "'We, the people of Oregon Territory,' runs the preamble to their compact, "'for the purposes of mutual protection and to secure peace and prosperity among ourselves, agree to adopt the following laws and regulations until such time as the United States of America extend their jurisdiction over us.' Thus self-government made its way across the Rocky Mountains. The Boundary Dispute with England Adjusted By this time it was evident that the boundaries of Oregon must be fixed. Having made the question an issue in his campaign, Polk, after his election in 1844, pressed it upon the attention of the country. In his inaugural address and his first message to Congress, he reiterated the claim of the Democratic platform that— our title to the whole territory of Oregon is clear and unquestionable. This pretension Great Britain firmly rejected, leaving the President a choice between war and compromise. Polk, already having the contest with Mexico on his hands, sought and obtained a compromise. The British government, moved by a hint from the American minister, offered a settlement which would fix the boundary at the forty-ninth parallel, instead of fifty-four forty, and give it to Vancouver Island. Polk speedily chose this way out of the dilemma. Instead of making the decision himself, however, and drawing up a treaty, he turned to the Senate for counsel. As prearranged with party leaders, the advice was favorable to the plan. The treaty, duly drawn in 1846, was ratified by the Senate after an acrimonious debate. Oh! "'Mountain that was delivered of a mouse!' exclaimed Senator Benton. "'Thy name shall be fifty-four forty. Thirteen years later, the southern part of the territory was admitted to the Union as the state of Oregon, leaving the northern and eastern sections in the status of a territory. California While the growth of the Northwestern Empire, dedicated by nature to freedom, the planting interest might have been content, had fortune not wrested from them the fair country of California. Upon this huge territory they had set their hearts. The mild climate and fertile soil seemed well suited to slavery, and the planters expected to extend their sway to the entire domain. California was a state of more than 155,000 square miles, about seventy times the size of the state of Delaware. It could readily be divided into five or six large states, if that became necessary to preserve the southern balance of power. Early American Relations with California Time and tide, it seems, were not on the side of the planters. Already Americans of a far different type were invading the Pacific Slope. Long before Polk ever dreamed of California, the Yankee with his cargo of notions had been around the Horn. Daring skippers had sailed out of New England harbors with a variety of goods, bent their course around South America to California, on to China, and around the world, trading as they went, and leaving pots, pans, woolen cloth, guns, boots, shoes, salt fish, naval stores, and rum in their wake. Home from California! rang the cry in many a New England port as a good captain let go his anchor on his return from the long trading voyage in the Pacific. THE OVERLAND TRAILS Not to be outdone by the mariners of the deep, western scouts searched for overland routes to the Pacific. Zebulon Pike, explorer and pathfinder, by his expedition into the southwest during Jefferson's administration, had discovered the resources of New Spain, and had shown his countrymen how easy it was to reach Santa Fe from the upper waters of the Arkansas River. Not long afterward, traders laid open the route, making Franklin, Missouri, 
and later Fort Leavenworth the starting point. Along the trail, once surveyed, poured caravans heavily guarded by armed men against marauding Indians. Sandstorms often wiped out all signs of the route. Hunger and thirst did many a band of wagoners to death. But the lure of the game and the profits at the end kept the business thriving. Huge stocks of cottons, glass, hardware, and ammunition were drawn almost across the continent to be exchanged at Santa Fe for furs, Indian blankets, silver, and mules, and many a fortune was made out of the traffic. AMERICANS IN CALIFORNIA Why stop at Santa Fe? The question did not long remain unanswered. In 1829, Ewing Young brought the path to Los Angeles. Thirteen years later, Fremont made the first of his celebrated expeditions across plain, desert, and mountain, arousing the interest of the entire country in the far west. In the wake of the pathfinders went adventurers, settlers, and artisans. By 1847, more than one-fifth of the inhabitants in the little post of two thousand on San Francisco Bay were from the United States. The Mexican War, therefore, was not the beginning, but the end of the American conquest of California, a conquest initiated by Americans who went to till the soil, to trade, or to follow some mechanical pursuit. THE DISCOVERY OF GOLD as if to clinch the hold on California already secured by the friends of free soil, there came in 1848 the sudden discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in the Sacramento Valley. When this exciting news reached the east, a mighty rush began to California, over the trails, across the Isthmus of Panama, and around Cape Horn. Before two years had passed, it is estimated that a hundred thousand people, in search of fortunes, had arrived in California. Mechanics, teachers, doctors, lawyers, farmers, miners, and laborers from the four corners of the earth. California, a free state. With this increase in population, there naturally resulted the usual demand for admission to the Union. Instead of waiting for authority from Washington, the Californians held a convention in 1849 and framed their constitution. With impatience, the delegates brushed aside the plea that the balance of power between the North and South required the admission of their state as a slave commonwealth. Without a dissenting voice, they voted in favor of freedom and boldly made their request for inclusion among the United States. President Taylor, though a Southern man, advised Congress to admit the applicant. Robert Toombs of Georgia vowed to God that he preferred secession. Henry Clay, the great compromiser, came to the rescue, and in 1850 California was admitted as a free state. Utah On the long road to California, in the midst of forbidding and barren waste, a religious sect, the Mormons, had planted a colony destined to a stormy career. Founded in 1830 under the leadership of Joseph Smith of New York, the sect had suffered from many cruel buffets of fortune. From Ohio they had migrated into Missouri, where they were set upon and beaten. Some of them were murdered by indignant neighbors. Harried out of Missouri, they went into Illinois, only to see their director and prophet, Smith, first imprisoned by the authorities, and then shot by a mob. Having raised up a cloud of enemies, on account of both their religious faith and their practice of allowing a man to have more than one wife, they fell in heartily with the suggestion of a new leader, Brigham Young, that they go into the far west beyond the plains of Kansas, into the forlorn desert where the wicked would cease from troubling and the weary could be at rest, as they read in the Bible. In 1847, Young, with a company of picked men, searched far and wide until he found a suitable spot overlooking the Salt Lake Valley. Returning to Illinois, he gathered up his followers, now numbering several thousand, and in one mighty wagon caravan they all went to their distant haven. Brigham Young and His Economic System In Brigham Young the Mormons had a leader of remarkable power who gave direction to the redemption of the arid soil the management of property, and the upbuilding of industry. 
He promised them to make the desert bloom as the rose, and verily he did it. He firmly shaped the enterprise of the colony along cooperative lines, holding down the speculator and profiteer with one hand, and giving encouragement to the industrious poor with the other. With the shrewdness befitting a good business man, he knew how to draw the line between public and private interest. Land was given outright to each family, but great care was exercised in the distribution so that none should have great advantage over another. The purchase of supplies and the sale of produce was carried on through a cooperative store, the profits of which went to the common good. Encountering for the first time in the history of the Anglo-Saxon race the problem of aridity, the Mormons surmounted the most perplexing obstacles with astounding skill. They built irrigation works by cooperative labor, and granted water rights to all families on equitable terms. THE GROWTH OF INDUSTRIES Though farming long remained the major interest of the colony, the Mormons, eager to be self-supporting in every possible way, bent their efforts also to manufacturing, and later to mining. Their missionaries, who hunted in the highways and byways of Europe for converts, never failed to stress the economic advantages of the sect. "'We want,' proclaimed President Young to all the earth, "'a company of woolen manufacturers to come with machinery and take the wool from the sheep and convert it into the best clothes. We want a company of potters. We need them. The clay is ready, and the dish is wanted. We want some men to start a furnace forthwith. The iron, coal, and molders are waiting.' We have a printing press, and any one who can take good printing and writing paper to the valley will be a blessing to themselves and to the church. Roads and bridges were built. Millions were spent in experiments in agriculture and manufacturing. Missionaries, at a huge cost, were maintained in the East and in Europe. An army was kept for defense against the Indians, and colonies were planted in the outlying regions. A historian of Deseret, as the colony was called by the Mormons, estimated in 1895 that by the labor of their hands the people had produced nearly half a billion dollars in wealth since the coming of the vanguard. Polygamy Forbidden The hope of the Mormons, that they might forever remain undisturbed by outsiders, was soon dashed to earth for hundreds of farmers and artisans belonging to other religious sects came to settle among them. In 1850, the colony was so populous and prosperous that it was organized into a territory of the United States, and brought under the supervision of the federal government. Protests against polygamy were raised in the colony, and at the seat of authority three thousand miles away at Washington. The new Republican Party in 1856 proclaimed it, the right and duty of Congress to prohibit in the territories those twin relics of barbarism, polygamy, and slavery. In due time, the Mormons had to give up their marriage practices, which were condemned by the common opinion of all Western civilization. But they kept their religious faith. Monuments to their early enterprise are seen in the temple and the tabernacle, the irrigation works, and the great wealth of the church. SUMMARY OF WESTERN DEVELOPMENT AND NATIONAL POLITICS While the statesmen of the old generation were solving the problems of their age, hunters, pioneers, and home-seekers were preparing new problems beyond the Alleghanies. The West was rising in population and wealth. Between 1783 and 1829, eleven states were added to the original thirteen. All but two were in the West. Two of them were in the Louisiana Territory, beyond the Mississippi. Here the process of colonization was repeated. Hardy frontier people cut down the forest, built log cabins, laid out farms, and cut roads through the wilderness. They began a new civilization just as the immigrants to Virginia or Massachusetts had done two centuries earlier. Like the seaboard colonists before them, they too cherished the spirit of independence and power. They had not gone far upon their course before they resented the monopoly of the presidency by the East. In 1829 they actually sent one of their own cherished leaders, Andrew Jackson, to the White House. Again, in 1840, in 1844, 
in 1848, and in 1860, the Mississippi Valley could boast that one of its sons had been chosen for the seat of power at Washington. Its democratic temper evoked a cordial response in the towns of the East, where the old aristocracy had been put aside, and artisans had been given the ballot. For three decades the West occupied the interest of the nation. Under Jackson's leadership it destroyed the Second United States Bank. When he smote nullification in South Carolina, it gave him cordial support. It approved his policy of parceling out government offices among party workers, the spoils system, in all its fullness. On only one point did it really dissent. The West heartily favored internal improvements, the appropriation of federal funds for highways, canals, and railways. Jackson had misgivings on this question, and awakened sharp criticism by vetoing a road improvement bill. From their point of advantage on the frontier, the pioneers pressed on westward. They pushed into Texas, created a state, declared their independence, demanded a place in the Union, and precipitated a war with Mexico. They crossed the trackless plain and desert, laying out trails to Santa Fe, to Oregon, and to California. They were upon the scene when the Mexican War brought California under the Stars and Stripes. They had laid out their farms in the Willamette Valley when the slogan, Fifty-four, Forty, or Fight, forced a settlement of the Oregon boundary. California and Oregon were already in the Union when there arose the great civil war, testing whether this nation, or any nation, so conceived and so dedicated, could long endure. References G. P. Brown Westward Expansion American Nation Series. K. Komen. Economic Beginnings of the Far West. Two Volumes. F. Parkman. California and the Oregon Trail. R. S. Ripley. The War with Mexico. W. C. Rives. The United States and Mexico. 1821-48. to Two Volumes. Questions. 1. Give some of the special features in the history of Missouri, Arkansas, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota. 2. Contrast the climate and soil of the Middle West and the Far West. 3. How did Mexico at first encourage American immigration? 4. What produced the revolution in Texas? Who led in it? 5. Narrate some of the leading events in the struggle over annexation to the United States. 6. What action by President Polk precipitated war? 7. Give the details of the peace settlement with Mexico. 8. What is meant by the joint occupation of Oregon? 9. How was the Oregon boundary dispute finally settled? 10. Compare the American invasion of California with the migration into Texas. 11. Explain how California became a free state. 12. Describe the early economic policy of the Mormons. Research Topics The Independence of Texas McMaster, History of the People of the United States, Volume 6, pages 251 to 270 Woodrow Wilson History of the American People, Volume 4, pages 102 to 126. The Annexation of Texas, McMaster, Volume 7. The passages on annexation are scattered throughout this volume, and it is an exercise in ingenuity to make a connected story of them. Source Materials in Heart, American History Told by Contemporaries, Volume 3, pages 637 to 655. Elson. History of the United States, pages 516 to 521, and 526 to 527. The War with Mexico, Elson, pages 526 to 538. The Oregon Boundary Dispute, Schaefer, History of the Pacific Northwest, Revised Edition, pages 88 through 104, and 173 to 185. The Migration to Oregon, Schaefer, pages 105 to 172, 
Komen, Economic Beginnings of the Far West, Volume 2, pages 113 to 166. The Santa Fe Trail, Komen, Economic Beginnings, Volume 2, pages 75 to 93. The Conquest of California, Komen, Volume 2, pages 297 to 319. Gold in California, McMaster, Volume 7, pages 585 to 614. The Mormon Migration, Komen, Volume 2, pages 167 to 206. Biographical Studies, Fremont, Generals Scott and Taylor, Sam Houston and David Crockett. The Romance of Western Exploration, J. G. Nyhart, The Splendid Wayfaring, J. G. Nyhart, The Song of Hugh Glass. End of Section 7 End of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard Part 4 The West and Jacksonian Democracy Section 1 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard Part 5 Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibney. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 5 Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. Chapter 13 The Rise of the Industrial System. If Jefferson could have lived to see the stars and stripes planted on the Pacific Ocean, the broad empire of Texas added to the planting states, and the valley of the Willamette waving with wheat sown by farmers from New England, he would have been more than fortified in his faith that the future of America lay in agriculture. Even a staunch old Federalist like Governor Morris or Josiah Quincy would have mournfully conceded both the prophecy and the claim manifest destiny never seemed more clearly written in the stars. As the farmers from the northwest and planters from the southwest poured in upon the floor of Congress, the party of Jefferson, christened anew by Jackson, grew stronger year by year. Opponents there were, no doubt, disgruntled critics and Whigs by conviction. But in 1852, Franklin Pierce, the Democratic candidate for president, carried every state in the Union except Massachusetts, Vermont, Kentucky, and Tennessee. This victory, a triumph under ordinary circumstances, was all the more significant in that Pierce was pitted against a hero of the Mexican War, General Scott, whom the Whigs, hoping to win by rousing the martial ardor of the voters, had nominated. On looking at the election returns, the new president calmly assured the planters that, the general principle of reduction of duties with a view to revenue may now be regarded as the settled policy of the country. With equal confidence, he waved aside those agitators who devoted themselves to the supposed interests of the relatively few Africans in the United States. Like a watchman in the night, he called to the country, all's well. The party of Hamilton and Clay lay in the dust. The Industrial Revolution as pride often goeth before a fall, so sanguine expectation is sometimes the symbol of defeat. Jackson destroyed the bank. Polk signed the tariff bill of 1846, striking an effective blow at the principle of protection for manufacturers. Pierce promised to silence the abolitionists. His successor was to approve a drastic step in the direction of free trade. Nevertheless, all these things left untouched, the springs of power that were in due time to make America the greatest industrial nation on the earth, namely, vast national resources, business enterprise, inventive genius, and the free labor supply of Europe. Unseen by the thoughtless, unrecorded in the diaries of wiseacres, rarely mentioned in the speeches of statesmen, there was swiftly rising such a tide in the affairs of America as Jefferson and Hamilton never dreamed of in their little philosophies. The Inventors 
Watt and Boulton experimenting with steam in England, Whitney combining wood and steel into a cotton gin, Fulton and Fitch applying the steam engine to navigation, Stevens and Peter Cooper trying out the iron horse on iron highways, Slater building spinning mills in Pawtucket, Howe attaching the needle to the flying wheel, Morse spanning a continent with the telegraph, Cyrus Field linking the markets of the New World with the Old along the bed of the Atlantic, McCormick breaking the sickle under the reaper. These men and a thousand more were destroying in a mighty revolution of industry the world of the stagecoach and the tallow candle which Washington and Franklin had inherited little changed from the age of Caesar. Whitney was to make Cotton King, Watt and Fulton were to make steel and steam masters of the world. Agriculture was to fall behind in the race for supremacy. Industry outstrips planting. The story of invention, that tribute to the triumph of mind over matter, fascinating as a romance, need not be treated in detail here. The effects of invention on social and political life, multitudinous and never-ending, formed the very warp and woof of American progress from the days of Andrew Jackson to the latest hour. Neither the great civil conflict, the clash of two systems, nor the problems of the modern age can be approached without an understanding of the striking phases of industrialism. First and foremost among them was the uprush of mills, managed by captains of industry and manned by labor drawn from farms, cities, and foreign lands. For every planter who cleared a domain in the southwest and gathered his army of bondmen about him, there rose in the north a magician of steam and steel who collected under his roof an army of free workers. In seven-league boots this new giant strode ahead of the southern giant. Between 1850 and 1859, to use dollars and cents as the measure of progress, the value of domestic manufactures, including mines and fisheries, rose from one billion nineteen million one hundred six thousand six hundred sixteen dollars to one billion nine hundred million, an increase of eighty six per cent in ten years. In this same period, the total production of naval stores, rice, sugar, tobacco, and cotton, the staples of the South, went only from $165 million, in round figures, to $204 million. At the halfway point of the century, the capital invested in industry, commerce, and cities far exceeded the value of all the farmland between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Thus the course of economy had been reversed in fifty years. Tested by figures of production, King Cotton had shriveled by 1860 to a petty prince in comparison, for each year the captains of industry turned out goods worth nearly twenty times all the bales of cotton picked on southern plantations, iron, boots and shoes, and leather goods pouring from northern mills surpassed in value the entire cotton output. The agrarian west turns to industry. Nor was this vast enterprise confined to the old northeast where, as Madison had sagely remarked, commerce was early dominant. Cincinnati, runs an official report in 1854, appears to be a great central depot for ready-made clothing and its manufacture for the western markets may be said to be one of the great trades of that city. There, wrote another traveler, I heard the crack of the cattle driver's whip and the hum of the factory, the West and the East meeting. Louisville and St. Louis were already famous for their clothing trades and the manufacture of cotton bagging. Five hundred of the two thousand woolen mills in the country in 1860 were in the western states. Of the output of flour and grist mills, which almost reached in value the cotton crop of 1850, the Ohio Valley furnished a rapidly growing share. The old home of Jacksonian democracy, where Federalists had been almost as scarce as monarchists, turned slowly backward, as the needle to the pole, toward the principle of protection for domestic industry espoused by Hamilton and defended by Clay. The Extension of Canals and Railways 
As necessary to mechanical industry as steel and steam power was the great market, spread over a wide and diversified area and knit together by efficient means of transportation. This service was supplied to industry by the steamship, which began its career on the Hudson in 1807, by the canals, of which the Erie opened in 1825 was the most noteworthy, and by the railways, which came into practical operation about 1830. With sure instinct, the eastern manufacturer reached out for the markets of the Northwest Territory, where free farmers were producing annually staggering crops of corn, wheat, bacon, and wool. The two great canal systems, the Erie connecting New York City with the waterways of the Great Lakes and the Pennsylvania chain linking Philadelphia with the headwaters of the Ohio, gradually turned the tide of trade from New Orleans to the eastern seaboard. The railways followed the same paths. By 1860, New York had rail connections with Chicago and St. Louis, one of the routes running through the Hudson and Mohawk Valleys and along the Great Lakes, and the other through Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, and across the rich wheat fields of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Baltimore, not to be outdone by her two rivals, reached out over the mountains for the western trade, and in 1857 had trains running into St. Louis. In railway enterprise, the South took more interest than in canals, and the friends of that section came to its aid. To offset the magnet drawing trade away from the Mississippi Valley, lines were built from the Gulf to Chicago, the Illinois central part of the project being a monument to the zeal and industry of a Democrat, better known in politics than in business, Stephen A. Douglas. The swift movement of cotton and tobacco to the north or to seaports was of common concern to planters and manufacturers. Accordingly, lines were flung down along the southern coast, linking Richmond, Charleston, and Savannah with the northern markets. Other lines struck inland from the coast, giving a rail outlet to the sea for Raleigh, Columbia, Atlanta, Chattanooga, Nashville, and Montgomery. Nevertheless, in spite of this enterprise, the mileage of all the southern states in 1860 did not equal that of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois combined. Banking and Finance Out of commerce and manufacturers and the construction and operation of railways came such an accumulation of capital in the northern states as merchants of old never imagined. The banks of the four industrial states of Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and Pennsylvania in 1860 had funds greater than the banks in all the other states combined. New York City had become the money market of America, the center to which industrial companies, railway promoters, farmers, and planters turned for capital to initiate and carry on their operation. The banks of Louisiana, South Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia, it is true, had capital far in excess of the banks of the Northwest, but still they were relatively small compared with the financial institutions of the East. The Growth of the Industrial Population A revolution of such magnitude in industry, transport, and finance, overturning as it did the agrarian civilization of the old Northwest and reaching out to the very borders of the country, could not fail to bring in its train consequences of a striking character. Some were immediate and obvious. Others require a fullness of time not yet reached to reveal their complete significance. Outstanding among them was the growth of an industrial population, detached from the land, concentrated in cities, and, to use Jefferson's phrase, dependent upon the caprices and casualties of trade for a livelihood. This was a result, as the great Virginian had foreseen, which flowed inevitably from public and private efforts to stimulate industry as against agriculture. It was estimated in 1860, on the basis of the census figures, that mechanical production gave employment to 1,100,000 men and 285,000 women, making, if the average number of dependents upon them be reckoned, nearly six million people, or about one-sixth of the population of the country, sustained from manufactures. This, 
runs the official record, was exclusive of the number engaged in the production of many of the raw materials and of the food for manufacturers, in the distribution of their products, such as merchants, clerks, draymen, mariners, the employees of railroads, expresses, and steamboats, of capitalists, various artistic and professional classes, as well as carpenters, bricklayers, painters, and the members of other mechanical trades not classed as manufacturers. It is safe to assume, then, that one-third of the whole population is supported, directly or indirectly, by manufacturing industry. Taking, however, the number of persons directly supported by manufacturers, namely about six millions, reveals the astounding fact that the white laboring population, divorced from the soil, already exceeded the number of slaves on southern farms and plantations. Immigration The more carefully the rapid growth of the industrial population is examined, the more surprising is the fact that such an immense body of free laborers could be found, particularly when it is recalled to what desperate straits the colonial leaders were put in securing immigrants. Slavery, indentured servitude, and kidnapping being the fruits of their necessities. The answer to the enigma is to be found partly in European conditions and partly in the cheapness of transportation after the opening of the era of steam navigation. Shrewd observers of the course of events had long foreseen that a flood of cheap labor was bound to come when the way was made easy. Some, among them Chief Justice Ellsworth, went so far as to prophesy that white labor would in time be so abundant that slavery would disappear as the more costly of the two labor systems. The processes of nature were aided by the policies of government in England and Germany. THE COMING OF THE IRISH The opposition of the Irish people to the English government, ever furious and irrepressible, was increased in the mid-forties by an almost total failure of the potato crop, the main support of the peasants. Catholic in religion, they had been compelled to support a Protestant church. Tillers of the soil by necessity, they were forced to pay enormous tributes to absentee landlords in England, whose claim to their estates rested upon the title of conquest and confiscation. Intensely loyal to their race, the Irish were subjected in all things to the Parliament at London, in which their small minority of representatives had little influence save in holding a balance of power between the two contending English parties. To the constant political irritation, the potato famine added physical distress beyond description. In cottages and fields, and along the highways, the victims of starvation lay dead by the hundreds, the relief which charity afforded only bringing misery more sharply to the foreground. Those who were fortunate enough to secure passage money sought escape to America. In 1844, the total immigration into the United States was less than 80,000. In 1850, it had risen by leaps and bounds to more than 300,000. Between 1820 and 1860, the immigrants from the United Kingdom numbered 2,750,000, of whom more than one-half were Irish. It has been said with a touch of exaggeration that the American canals and railways of those days were built by the labor of Irishmen. THE GERMAN MIGRATION To political discontent and economic distress, such as was responsible for the coming of the Irish, may likewise be traced the source of the Germanic migration. The potato blight that fell upon Ireland visited the Rhine Valley and southern Germany at the same time with results as pitiful, if less extensive. The calamity inflicted by nature was followed, shortly, by another inflicted by the despotic conduct of German kings and princes. In 1848, there had occurred throughout Europe a popular uprising in behalf of republics and democratic government. For a time it rode on a full tide of success. Kings were overthrown or compelled to promise constitutional government, and tyrannical ministers fled from their palaces. Then came reaction. Those who had championed the popular cause were imprisoned, shot, or driven out of the land. Men of attainments and distinction 
whose sole offense was opposition to the government of kings and princes, sought an asylum in America, carrying with them to the land of their adoption the spirit of liberty and democracy. In 1847, over 50,000 Germans came to America, the forerunners of a migration that increased, almost steadily, for many years. The record of 1860 showed that in the previous twenty years nearly a million and a half had found homes in the United States. Far and wide they scattered, from the mills and shops of the seacoast towns to the uttermost frontiers of Wisconsin and Minnesota. THE LABOR OF WOMEN AND CHILDREN If the industries, canals, and railways of the country were largely manned by foreign labor, still important native sources must not be overlooked, above all, the women and children of the New England textile districts. Spinning and weaving, by a tradition that runs far beyond the written records of mankind, belonged to women. Indeed, it was the dexterous housewives, spinsters, and boys and girls that laid the foundations of the textile industry in America, foundations upon which the mechanical revolution was built. As the wheel and loom were taken out of the homes to the factories operated by water power or the steam engine, the women, and, to use Hamilton's phrase, the children of tender years, followed as a matter of course. The cotton manufacture alone employs 6,000 persons in Lowell, wrote a French observer in 1836. Of this number, nearly 5,000 are young women from 17 to 24 years of age the daughters of farmers from the different New England states. It was not until after the middle of the century that foreign lands proved to be the chief source from which workers were recruited for the factories of New England. It was then that the daughters of the Puritans, outdone by the competition of foreign labor, both of men and women, left the spinning jenny and the loom to other hands. The Rise of Organized Labor the changing conditions of American life, marked by the spreading mill towns of New England, New York, and Pennsylvania, and the growth of cities like Buffalo, Cincinnati, Louisville, St. Louis, Detroit, and Chicago in the West, naturally brought changes, as Jefferson had prophesied, in manners and morals. A few mechanics, smiths, carpenters, and masons widely scattered through farming regions and rural villages, raise no such problems as tens of thousands of workers collected in one center in daily intercourse, learning the power of cooperation and union. Even before the coming of steam and machinery, in the good old days of handicrafts, laborers in many trades, printers, shoemakers, carpenters, for example, had begun to draw together in the towns for the advancement of their interests in the form of higher wages, shorter days, and milder laws. The shoemakers of Philadelphia, organized in 1794, conducted a strike in 1799 and held together until indicted seven years later for conspiracy. During the twenties and thirties, local labor unions sprang up in all industrial centers and they led almost immediately to city federations of the several crafts. As the thousands who were dependent upon their daily labor for their livelihood mounted into the millions and industries spread across the continent, the local unions of craftsmen grew into national craft organizations bound together by the newspapers, the telegraph, and the railways. Before 1860, there were several such national trade unions, including the plumbers, printers, mule spinners, iron molders, and stone cutters. All over the North, labor leaders arose, men unknown to general history, but forceful and resourceful characters who forged links binding scattered and individual workers into a common brotherhood. An attempt was even made, in 1834, to federate all the crafts into a permanent national organization. But it perished within three years through lack of support. Half a century had to elapse before the American Federation of Labor was to accomplish this task. All the manifestations of the modern labor movement had appeared, in germ at least, by the time the mid-century was reached. Unions, labor leaders, strikes, a labor press, 
a labor political program, and a labor political party. In every great city, industrial disputes were a common occurrence. The papers recorded about 400 in two years, 1853 to 1854, local affairs but forecasting economic struggles in a larger field. The labor press seems to have begun with the founding of the Mechanics Free Press in Philadelphia in 1828 and the establishment of the New York Working Man's Advocate shortly afterward. These semi-political papers were in later years followed by regular trade papers designed to weld together and advance the interests of particular crafts. Edited by able leaders, these little sheets with limited circulation wielded an enormous influence in the ranks of the workers. Labor and Politics As for the political program of labor, the main planks were clear and specific. The abolition of imprisonment for debt, manhood suffrage in states where property qualifications still prevailed, free and universal education, laws protecting the safety and health of workers in mills and factories, abolition of lotteries, repeal of laws requiring militia service, and free land in the West. Into the labor papers and platforms there sometimes crept a note of hostility to the masters of industry, a sign of bitterness that excited little alarm while cheap land in the West was open to the discontented. The Philadelphia workmen, in issuing a call for a local convention, invited all those of our fellow citizens who live by their own labor and none other. In Newcastle County, Delaware, the Association of Working People complained in 1830, The poor have no laws. The laws are made by the rich and, of course, for the rich. Here and there an extremist went to the length of advocating an equal division of wealth among all the people, the crudest kind of communism. Agitation of this character produced in labor circles profound distrust of both Whigs and Democrats who talked principally about tariffs and banks. It resulted in attempts to found independent labor parties. In Philadelphia, Albany, New York City, and New England, labor candidates were put up for elections in the early thirties and in a few cases were victorious at the polls. The balance of power has at length got into the hands of the working people, where it properly belongs, triumphantly exclaimed the Mechanics Free Press of Philadelphia in 1829. But the triumph was illusory. Dissensions appeared in the labor ranks. The old party leaders, particularly of Tammany Hall, the Democratic Party organization in New York City, offered concessions to labor in return for votes. Newspapers unsparingly denounced trade union politicians as demagogues, levelers, and rag-tag and bobtail, and some of them, deeming labor unrest the sour fruit of manhood suffrage, suggested disfranchisement as a remedy. Under the influence of concession and attacks, the political fever quickly died away, and the end of the decade left no remnant of the labor political parties. Labor leaders turned to a task which seemed more substantial and practical, that of organizing working men into craft unions for the definite purpose of raising wages and reducing hours. End of section 1 Section 2 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard. Part 5. Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibney, Arkansas, January 2008. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 5, Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction, Chapter 8, The Rise of the Industrial System, Continued, The Industrial Revolution and National Politics, Southern Plans for Union with the West. It was long the design of Southern statesmen, like Calhoun, 
to hold the West and the South together in one political party. The theory on which they based their hope was simple. Both sections were agricultural, the producers of raw materials and the buyers of manufactured goods. The planters were heavy purchasers of western bacon, pork, mules, and grain. The Mississippi River and its tributaries formed the natural channel for the transportation of heavy produce southward to the plantations and outward to Europe. Therefore, ran their political reasoning, the interests of the two sections were one. By standing together in favor of low tariffs, they could buy their manufactures cheaply in Europe and pay for them in cotton, tobacco, and grain. The union of the two sections under Jackson's management seemed perfect. The East Forms Ties with the West Eastern leaders were not blind to the ambitions of Southern statesmen. On the contrary, they also recognized the importance of forming strong ties with the agrarian West and drawing the produce of the Ohio Valley to Philadelphia and New York. The canals and railways were the physical signs of this economic union, and the results, commercial and political, were soon evident. By the middle of the century, Southern economists noted the change, one of them, de Bow, lamenting that the great cities of the North have severally penetrated the interior with artificial lines until they have taken from the open and untaxed current of the Mississippi the commerce produced on its borders. To this writer it was an astounding thing to behold the number of steamers that now descend the upper Mississippi River, loaded to the guards with produce, as far as the mouth of the Illinois River, and then turn up that stream with their cargoes to be shipped to New York via Chicago. The Illinois Canal has not only swept the whole produce along the line of the Illinois River to the east, but it is drawing the products of the upper Mississippi through the same channel, thus depriving New Orleans and St. Louis of a rich portion of their former trade. If to any shippers the broad current of the great river sweeping down to New Orleans offered easier means of physical communication to the sea than the canals and railways, the difference could be overcome by the credit which eastern bankers were able to extend to the grain and produce buyers, in the first instance, and through them to the farmers on the soil. The acute southern observer, just quoted, de Beau, admitted with evident regret, in 1852, that, last autumn, the rich regions of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois were flooded with the local banknotes of the eastern states, advanced by the New York houses on produce to be shipped by way of the canals in the spring. These moneyed facilities enable the packer, miller, and speculator to hold on to their produce until the opening of navigation in the spring, and they are no longer obliged, as formerly, to hurry off their shipments during the winter by the way of New Orleans in order to realize funds by drafts on their shipments. The banking facilities at the East are doing as much to draw trade from us as the canals and railways which eastern capital is constructing. Thus canals, railways, and financial credit were swiftly forging bonds of union between the old home of Jacksonian democracy in the West and the older home of federalism in the East. The nationalism to which Webster paid eloquent tribute became more and more real with the passing of time. The self-sufficiency of the pioneer was broken down as he began to watch the produce markets of New York and Philadelphia, where the prices of corn and hogs fixed his earnings for the year. THE WEST AND MANUFACTURERS In addition to the commercial bonds between the East and the West, there was growing up a common interest in manufacturers. As skilled white labor increased in the Ohio Valley, the industries springing up in the new cities made Western life more like that of the industrial East than like that of the planting South. Moreover, the Western states produced some important raw materials for American factories, which called for protection against foreign competition, notably wool, hemp, and flax. As the South had little or no foreign competition in cotton and tobacco, the East could not offer protection for her raw materials in exchange for protection for industries. With the West, however, it became possible to establish reciprocity in tariffs, that is, for example, to trade a high rate on wool 
for a high rate on textiles or iron. THE SOUTH DEPENDENT ON THE NORTH While East and West were drawing together, the distinctions between North and South were becoming more marked, the latter, having few industries and producing little save raw materials, was being forced into the position of a dependent section. As a result of the protective tariff, southern planters were compelled to turn more and more to northern mills for their cloth, shoes, hats, hoes, plows, and machinery. Nearly all the goods which they bought in Europe in exchange for their produce came overseas to northern ports, whence transshipments were made by rail and water to southern points of distribution. Their rice, cotton, and tobacco, in as far as they were not carried to Europe in British bottoms, were transported by northern masters. In these ways, a large part of the financial operations connected with the sale of southern produce and the purchase of goods in exchange passed into the hands of northern merchants and bankers who, naturally, made profits from their transactions. Finally, southern planters who wanted to buy more land and more slaves on credit borrowed heavily in the north where huge accumulations made the rates of interest lower than the smaller banks in the south could afford. THE SOUTH RECKONS THE COST OF ECONOMIC DEPENDENCE As southern dependence upon northern capital became more and more marked, southern leaders began to chafe at what they regarded as restraints laid upon their enterprise. In a word, they came to look upon the planter as a tribute-bearer to the manufacturer and financier. The South, expostulated de Beau, stands in the attitude of feeding a vast population of northern merchants, ship-owners, capitalists, and others who, without claims on her progeny, drink up the life-blood of her trade. Where goes the value of our labor but to those who, taking advantage of our folly, ship for us, buy for us, sell to us, and, after turning our own capital to their profitable account, return laden with our money to enjoy their easily earned opulence at home. Southern statisticians, not satisfied with generalities, attempted to figure out how great was this tribute in dollars and cents. They estimated that the planters annually lent to northern merchants the full value of their experts, a hundred millions or more, to be used in the manipulation of foreign imports. They calculated that no less than forty millions, all told, had been paid to shipowners in profits. They reckoned that, if the South were to work up her own cotton, she would realize from seventy to one hundred millions a year that otherwise went north. Finally, to cap the climax, they regretted that planters spent some fifteen millions a year pleasure-seeking in the alluring cities and summer resorts of the north. Southern Opposition to Northern Policies Proceeding from these premises, Southern leaders drew the logical conclusion that the entire program of economic measures demanded in the North was without exception adverse to Southern interests and, by a similar chain of reasoning, injurious to the corn and wheat producers of the West. Cheap labor afforded by free immigration, a protective tariff raising prices of manufactures for the tiller of the soil, ship subsidies increasing the tonnage of carrying trade in Northern hands, internal improvements forging new economic bonds between the East and the West, a national banking system giving strict national control over the currency as a safeguard against paper inflation. All these devices were regarded in the South as contrary to the planting interest. They were constantly compared with the restrictive measures by which Great Britain, more than half a century before, had sought to bind American interests. As oppression justified a war for independence once, statesmen argued, so it can justify it again. It is curious, as it is melancholy and distressing, came a broad hint from South Carolina, to see how striking is the analogy between the colonial vassalage to which the manufacturing states have reduced the planting states, and that which formerly bound the Anglo-American colonies to the British Empire. England said to her American colonies, you shall not trade with the rest of the world for such manufactures as are produced in the mother country. 
the manufacturing states say to their southern colonies you shall not trade with the rest of the world for such manufactures as we produce the conclusion was inexorable either the south must control the national government and its economic measures or it must declare as america had done fourscore years before its political and economic independence as northern mills multiplied as railways spun their mighty web over the face of the north and as accumulated capital rose into the hundreds of millions the conviction of the planters and their statesmen deepened into desperation efforts to start southern industries fail a few of them seeing the predominance of the north made determined efforts to introduce manufactures into the south to the leaders who were averse to succession and nullification this seemed the only remedy for the growing disparity in the power of the two sections societies for the encouragement of mechanical industries were formed the investment of capital was sought and indeed a few mills were built on southern soil the results were meager the natural resources coal and water power were abundant but the enterprise for direction and the skilled labor were wanting the stream of european immigration flowed north and west not south the irish or german laborer even if he finally made his home in a city had before him while in the north the alternative of a homestead on western land to him slavery was a strange if not a repelling institution he did not take to it kindly nor care to fix his home where it flourished while slavery lasted the economy of the south was inevitably agricultural while agriculture predominated leadership with equal necessity fell to the planting interest while the planting interest ruled political opposition to northern economy was destined to grow in strength the southern theory of sectionalism in the opinion of the statesmen who frankly represented the planting interest the industrial system was its deadly enemy their entire philosophy of american politics was summed up in a single paragraph by mcduffie a spokesman for south carolina owing to the federative character of our government the great geographical extent of our territory and the diversity of the pursuits of our citizens in different parts of the union it has so happened that two great interests have sprung up standing directly opposed to each other one of these consists of those manufactures which the northern and middle states are capable of producing but which owing to the high price of labor and the high profits of capital in those states cannot hold competition with foreign manufacturers without the aid of bounties directly or indirectly given either by the general government or by the state governments the other of these interests consists of the great agricultural staples of the southern states which can find a market only in foreign countries and which can be advantageously sold only in exchange for foreign manufactures which come in competition with those of the northern and middle states these interests then stand diametrically and irreconcilably opposed to each other the interest the pecuniary interest of the northern manufacturer is directly promoted at every increase of the taxes imposed upon southern commerce and it is unnecessary to add that the interest of the southern planter is promoted by every diminution of taxes imposed upon the productions of their industry if under these circumstances the manufacturers were clothed with the power of imposing taxes at their pleasure upon the foreign imports of the planter no doubt would exist in the mind of any man that it would have all the characteristics of an absolute and unqualified despotism the economic soundness of this reasoning a subject of interesting speculation for the economist is of little concern to the historian the historical point is that this opinion was widely held in the south and with the progress of time became the prevailing doctrine of the planting statesmen their antagonism was deepened because they also became convinced on what grounds it is not necessary to inquire that the leaders of the industrial interest thus opposed to planting formed a consolidated aristocracy of wealth bent upon the pursuit and attainment of political power at washington by the aid of various associated interests 
continued McDuffie, the manufacturing capitalists have obtained a complete and permanent control over the legislation of Congress on this subject, the tariff. Men confederated together upon selfish and interested principles, whether in pursuit of the offices or the bounties of the government, are ever more active and vigilant than the great majority who act from disinterested and patriotic impulses. Have we not witnessed it on this floor, sir? Who ever knew the tariff men to divide on any question affecting their confederated interests? The watchword is, stick together, right or wrong, upon every question affecting the common cause. Such, sir, is the concert and vigilance, and such the combinations by which the manufacturing party, acting upon the interests of some and the prejudices of others, have obtained a decided and permanent control over public opinion in all the tariff states. Thus, as the southern statesmen would have it, the North, in matters affecting national policies, was ruled by a confederated interest which menaced the planting interest. As the former grew in magnitude, and attached to itself the free farmers of the West through channels of trade and credit, it followed as night the day that in time the planters would be overshadowed and at length overborne in the struggle of giants. Whether the theory was sound or not, southern statesmen believed it and acted upon it. References M. Beard, Short History of the American Labor Movement E. L. Bogart, Economic History of the United States J. R. Commons, History of Labor in the United States Two volumes. E. R. Johnson, American Railway Transportation. C. D. Wright, Industrial Evolution of the United States. Questions. 1. What signs pointed to a complete democratic triumph in 1852? 2. What is the explanation of the extraordinary industrial progress of America? 3. Compare the planting system with the factory system. 4. In what sections did industry flourish before the Civil War? Why? 5. Show why transportation is so vital to modern industry and agriculture. 6. Explain how it was possible to secure so many people to labor in American industries. 7. Trace the steps in the rise of organized labor before 1860. 8. What political and economic reforms did labor demand? 9. Why did the East and the South seek closer ties with the West? 10. Describe the economic forces which were drawing the East and the West together. 11. In what way was the South economically dependent upon the North? 12. State the national policies generally favored in the North and condemned in the South. 13. Show how economic conditions in the South were unfavorable to industry. 14. Give the Southern explanation of the antagonism between the North and the South. Research Topics The Inventions Assign one to each student. Satisfactory accounts are to be found in any good encyclopedia especially the Britannica. River and Lake Commerce Calendar, Economic History of the United States, pages 313 through 326. Railways and Canals Calendar, pages 326 through 344, 359 through 387. Coleman, Industrial History of the United States, pages 216 through 225. The Growth of Industry, 1815 through 1840. Calendar, pages 459 through 471. From 1850 to 1860. Calendar, pages 471 through 486. Early Labor Conditions. Calendar, pages 701 through 718. Early Immigration, Calendar, pages 719 through 732. Clay's Home Market Theory of the Tariff, Calendar, pages 498 through 503. 
The New England View of the Tariff, Calendar, pages 503 through 514. End of section 2. Section 3 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 5, Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 5. Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. Chapter 14. The Planting System and National Politics. James Madison, the father of the Federal Constitution, after he had watched for many days the Battle Royale in the National Convention of 1787, exclaimed that the contest was not between the large and small states, but between the commercial North and the planting South. From the inauguration of Washington to the election of Lincoln, the sectional conflict, discerned by this penetrating thinker, exercised a profound influence on the course of American politics. It was latent during the era of good feeling, when the Jeffersonian Republicans adopted Federalist policies. It flamed up again in the contest between the Democrats and Whigs. Finally it raged in the angry political quarrel which culminated in the Civil War. Slavery, North and South The Decline of Slavery in the North at the time of the adoption of the Constitution, slavery was lawful in all the northern states except Massachusetts. There were almost as many bondmen in New York as in Georgia. New Jersey had more than Delaware or Tennessee, indeed nearly as many as both combined. All told, however, there were only about 40,000 in the north as against nearly 700,000 in the south. Moreover, most of the northern slaves were domestic servants, not laborers necessary to keep mills going or fields under cultivation. There was, in the North, a steadily growing moral sentiment against the system. Massachusetts abandoned it in 1780. In the same year, Pennsylvania provided for gradual emancipation. New Hampshire, where there had been only a handful, Connecticut, with a few thousand domestics, and New Jersey early followed these examples. New York, in 1799, declared that all children born of slaves after July 4 of that year should be free, though held for a term as apprentices, and in 1827 it swept away the last vestiges of slavery. So, with the passing of the generation that had framed the Constitution, chattel servitude disappeared in the commercial states, leaving behind only such discriminations as disenfranchisement or high property qualifications on colored voters. THE GROWTH OF NORTHERN SENTIMENT AGAINST SLAVERY In both sections of the country there early existed, among those more or less philosophically inclined, a strong opposition to slavery on moral as well as economic grounds. In the Constitutional Convention of 1787, Governor Morris had vigorously condemned it and proposed that the whole country should bear the cost of abolishing it. About the same time, a society for promoting the abolition of slavery, under the presidency of Benjamin Franklin, laid before Congress a petition that serious attention be given to the emancipation of those unhappy men who alone in this land of freedom are degraded into perpetual bondage. When Congress, acting on the recommendations of President Jefferson, provided for the abolition of the foreign slave trade on January 1, 1808, Several northern members joined with southern members in condemning the system as well as the trade. Later, colonialization societies were formed to encourage the emancipation of slaves and the return to Africa. James Madison was president and Henry Clay vice-president of such an organization. The anti-slavery sentiment, of which these were the signs, was nevertheless confined to narrow circles and bore no trace of bitterness. We consider slavery your calamity, not your crime, wrote a distinguished Boston clergyman to his southern brethren, and we will share with you the burden of putting an end to it. We will consent that the public land shall be appropriated to this object. I deprecate everything which sows discord and exasperating sectional animosities. Uncompromising Abolition In a little while the spirit of generosity was gone. Just as Jacksonian democracy rose to power, there appeared a new kind of anti-slavery doctrine. 
the dogmatism of the abolition agitator. For mild speculation on the evils of the system was substituted an imperious and belligerent demand for instant emancipation. If a date must be fixed for its appearance, the year 1831 may be taken, when William Lloyd Garrison founded in Boston his anti-slavery paper, The Liberator. With singleness of purpose and utter contempt for all opposing opinions and arguments, he pursued his course of passionate denunciation. He apologized for having ever assented to the popular but pernicious doctrine of gradual abolition. He chose for his motto, Immediate and Unconditional Emancipation, he promised his readers that he would be harsh as truth and uncompromising as justice, that he would not think or speak or write with moderation. Then he flung out his defiant call, I am in earnest, I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard, such is the vow I take, so help me God. Though Garrison complained that the apathy of the people is enough to make every statute leap from its pedestal, he soon learned how alive the masses were to the meaning of his propaganda. Abolition orators were stoned in the street and hissed from the platform. Their meeting-places were often attacked and sometimes burned to the ground. Garrison himself was assaulted in the streets of Boston, finding refuge from the angry mob behind prison bars. Lovejoy, a publisher in Alton, Illinois, for his willingness to give abolition a fair hearing, was brutally murdered, his printing-press was broken to pieces as a warning to all those who disturbed the nation's peace of mind. The South, doubly frightened by a slave revolt in 1831, which ended in the murder of a number of men, women, and children, closed all discussion of slavery in that section. Now, exclaimed Calhoun, it is a question which admits of neither concession nor compromise. As the opposition hardened, the anti-slavery agitation gathered in force and intensity. Whittier blew his blast from the New England hills. No slave hunt in our borders, no pirate on our strand, no fetters in the Bay State, no slave upon our land. Lowell, looking upon the espousal of a great cause as the noblest aim of his art, ridiculed and excoriated bondage in the South. Those abolitionists, not gifted as speakers or writers, signed petitions against slavery and poured them in upon Congress. The flood of them was so continuous that the House of Representatives, forgetting its traditions, adopted in 1836 a gag rule, which prevented the reading of appeals and consigned them to the wastebasket. Not until the Whigs were in power nearly ten years later was John Quincy Adams able, after a relentless campaign, to carry a motion rescinding the rule. How deep was the impression made upon the country by this agitation for immediate and unconditional emancipation cannot be measured. If the popular vote for those candidates who opposed not only slavery, but also its extension to the territories, be taken as a standard, it was slight indeed. In 1844, the Free Soil candidate, Bernie, polled 62,000 votes out of over a million and a half. The free soil vote of the next campaign went beyond a quarter of a million, but the increase was due to the strength of the leader, Martin Van Buren, four years afterward it receded to 156,000, affording all the outward signs for the belief that the pleas of the abolitionists found no widespread response among the people. Yet the agitation undoubtedly ran deeper than the ballot-box. Young statesmen of the North, in whose hands the destiny of frightful years was to lie, found their indifference to slavery broken and their consciences stirred by the unending appeal and the tireless reiteration. Charles Sumner afterward boasted that he read the Liberator two years before Wendell Phillips, the young Boston lawyer who cast aside his profession to take up the dangerous cause. EARLY SOUTHERN OPPOSITION TO SLAVERY in the South the sentiment against slavery was strong. It led some to believe that it would also come to an end there in due time. Washington disliked it, and directed in his will that his own slaves should be set free after the death of his wife. Jefferson, looking into the future, condemned the system by which he also lived, saying, Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? a conviction in the minds of the people that their liberties are the gift of God? Are they not to be violated but with his wrath? 
Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Nor did southern men confine their sentiments to expressions of academic opinion. They accepted in 1787 the ordinance which excluded slavery from the Northwest Territory forever, and also the Missouri Compromise, which shut it out of a vast section of the Louisiana Territory. THE REVOLUTION IN THE SLAVE SYSTEM among the representatives of South Carolina and Georgia, however, the anti-slavery views of Washington and Jefferson were by no means approved, and the drift of Southern economy was decidedly in favor of extending and perpetuating, rather than abolishing, the system of chattel servitude. The invention of the cotton gin and textile machinery created a market for cotton, which the planters, with all their skill and energy, could hardly supply. Almost every available acre was brought under cotton culture as the small farmers were driven steadily from the seaboard into the uplands or to the northwest. The demand for slaves to till the swiftly expanding fields was enormous. The number of bondsmen rose from 700,000 in Washington's day to more than three millions in 1850. At the same time, slavery itself was transformed. Instead of the homestead, where the same family of masters kept the same families of slaves from generation to generation, came the plantation system of the far south and southwest, where masters were ever moving and ever extending their holdings of land and slaves. This in turn reacted on the older south, where the raising of slaves for the market became a regular and highly profitable business. Slavery Defended as a Positive Good as the abolition agitation increased, and the planting system expanded, apologies for slavery became fainter and fainter in the South. Then apologies were superseded by claims that slavery was a beneficial scheme of labor control. Calhoun, in a famous speech in the Senate in 1837, sounded the new note by declaring slavery, instead of an evil, a good, a positive good. His reasoning was as follows. In every civilized society one portion of the community must live on the labor of another. Learning, science, and the arts are built upon leisure. The African slave, kindly treated by his master and mistress, and looked after in his old age, is better off than the free laborers of Europe. And under the slave system conflicts between capital and labor are avoided. The advantages of slavery in this respect, he concluded, will become more and more manifest, if left undisturbed by interference from without, as the country advances in wealth and numbers. Slave owners dominate politics. The new doctrine of Calhoun was eagerly seized by the planters as they came more and more to overshadow the small farmers of the South, and as they beheld the menace of abolition growing upon the horizon. It formed, as they viewed matters, a moral defense for their labor system, sound, logical, invincible. It warranted them in drawing together for the protection of an institution so necessary, so inevitable, so beneficent. Though in 1850 the slave owners were only about 350,000 in a national population of nearly 20 million whites, they had an influence all out of proportion to their numbers. They were knit together by the bonds of a common interest. They had leisure and wealth. They could travel and attend conferences and conventions. Throughout the South, and largely in the North, they had the press, the schools, and the pulpits on their side. They formed, as it were, a mighty union for the protection and advancement of their common cause. Aided by those mechanics and farmers of the North who stuck by Jacksonian democracy through thick and thin, the planters became a power in the federal government. We nominate presidents, exultantly boasted a Richmond newspaper, the North elects them. This jubilant Southern claim was conceded by William H. Seward, a Republican senator from New York, in a speech describing the power of slavery in the national government. A party, he said, is in one sense a joint stock association, in which those who contribute the most direct the action and management of the concern. The slaveholders, contributing in an overwhelming proportion to the strength of the Democratic Party, necessarily dictate and prescribe its policy. He went on, The slaveholding class has become the governing power in each of the slaveholding states, and it practically chooses thirty of the sixty-two members of the Senate, ninety of the two hundred and thirty-three members of the House of Representatives, and one hundred and five of the two hundred and ninety-five electors of President and Vice-President of the United States. 
Then he considered the slave power in the Supreme Court. That tribunal, he exclaimed, consists of a chief justice and eight associate justices. Of these, five were called from slave states and four from free states. The opinions and bias of each of them were carefully considered by the President and Senate when he was appointed. Not one of them was found wanting in soundness of politics, according to the slaveholder's exposition of the Constitution. Such was the northern view of the planting interest that, from the arena of national politics, challenged the whole country in 1860. End of section 3《セクション4オブ・ヒストリー・オブ・ユナイテッド・ステイツ・バイ・チャールズ・ A ・ビアード・アン・マリー・アー・ビアード・パート・ファイブ・セクショナル・コンフリクト・アン・リコンストラクション。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《History of the United States》by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard。Part 5. Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. Chapter Fourteen: The Planting System and National Politics Continued: Slavery in National Politics. National Aspects of Slavery. It may be asked why it was that slavery, founded originally on state law and subject to state government, was drawn into the current of national affairs. The answer is simple: there were, in the first place, constitutional reasons. The Congress of the United States had to make all needful rules for the government of the territories, the District of Columbia, the forts, and other property under national authority. So it was compelled to determine whether slavery should exist in the places subject to its jurisdiction. Upon Congress was also conferred the power of admitting new states. Whenever a territory asked for admission, the issue could be raised as to whether slavery should be sanctioned or excluded. Under the Constitution, provision was made for the return of runaway slaves. Congress had the power to enforce this clause by appropriate legislation. Since the control of the post office was vested in the federal government, it had to face the problem raised by the transmission of abolition literature through the mails. Finally, citizens had the right of petition. It inheres in all free government, and it is expressly guaranteed by the First Amendment to the Constitution. It was therefore legal for abolitionists to present to Congress their petitions, even if they asked for something which it had no right to grant. It was thus impossible, constitutionally, to draw a cordon around the slavery issue and confine the discussion of it to state politics. There were, in the second place, economic reasons why slavery was inevitably drawn into the national sphere. It was the basis of the planting system which had direct commercial relations with the North and European countries. It was affected by federal laws respecting tariffs, bounties, ship subsidies, banking, and kindred matters. The planters of the South, almost without exception, looked upon the protective tariff as a tribute laid upon them for the benefit of Northern industries. As heavy borrowers of money in the North, they were generally in favor of easy money. If not paper currency, as an aid in the repayment of their debts. This threw most of them into opposition to the Whig program for a United States bank. All financial aids to American shipping they stoutly resisted, preferring to rely upon the cheaper service rendered by English shippers. International improvements, those substantial ties that were binding the West to the East and turning the traffic from New Orleans to Philadelphia and New York, they viewed with alarm. Free homesteads from the public lands, which tended to overbalance the South by building free states, became to them a measure dangerous to their interests. Thus, national economic policies, which could not by any twist or turn be confined to state control, drew the slave system and its defenders into the political conflict that centered at Washington. Slavery and the Territories, the Missouri Compromise, 1820. Though men continually talked about taking slavery out of politics, it could not be done. By 1818, slavery had become so entrenched and the anti slavery movement so strong that Missouri's quest for admission brought out both houses of Congress into a deadlock that was broken only by compromise. The South, having half the senators, could prevent the admission of Missouri stripped of slavery, and the North, powerful in the House of Representatives, Could keep Missouri without slavery out of the Union indefinitely. 
an adjustment of pretensions was the last resort. Maine, separated from the parent state of Massachusetts, was brought into the Union with freedom, and Missouri with bondage. At the same time it was agreed that the remainder of the vast Louisiana territory, north of the parallel of thirty-six degrees thirty minutes, should be, like the old Northwest, forever free, while the southern portion was left to slavery. In reality this was an immense gain for liberty. The area dedicated to free farmers was many times greater than that left to the planters. The principle was once more asserted that Congress had full power to prevent slavery in the territories. The Territorial Question Reopened by the Wilmot Proviso To the Southern leaders the annexation of Texas and the conquest of Mexico meant renewed security to the planting interests against the increasing wealth and population of the North. Texas, it was said, could be divided into four slave states. The new territories secured by the Treaty of Peace with Mexico contained the promise of at least three more. Thus, as each new free soil state knocked for admission into the Union, the South could demand, as the price of its consent, a new slave state. No wonder southern statesmen saw, in the annexation of Texas and the conquest of Mexico, slavery and King Cotton triumphant, secure for all time against adverse legislation. Northern leaders were equally convinced that the southern prophecy was true. Abolitionists and moderate opponents of slavery alike were in despair. Texas, they lamented, would fasten slavery upon the country for evermore. No living man, cried one, will see the end of slavery in the United States. It so happened, however, that the events which, it was thought, would secure slavery let loose a storm against it. A sign appeared first on August 6, 1846, only a few months after war was declared on Mexico. On that day, David Wilmot, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, introduced into the House of Representatives a resolution to the effect that, as an express and fundamental condition to the acquisition of any territory from the Republic of Mexico, slavery should be forever excluded from every part of it. The Wilmot Proviso, as the resolution was popularly called, though defeated on that occasion, was a challenge to the South. The South answered the challenge. Speaking in the House of Representatives, Robert Toombs of Georgia boldly declared, in the presence of the living God, if by your legislation you seek to drive us from the territories of California and New Mexico, I am for disunion. South Carolina announced that the day for talk had passed and the time had come to join her sister states in resisting the application of the Wilmot Proviso at any and all hazards. A conference, assembled at Jackson, Mississippi, in the autumn of 1849, called a general convention of southern states to meet at Nashville the following summer. The avowed purpose was to arrest the course of aggression and, if that was not possible, to provide in the last resort for their separate welfare by the formation of a compact and union that will afford protection to their liberties and rights. States that had spurned South Carolina's plea for nullification in 1832 responded to this new appeal with alacrity, an augury of the secession to come. The Great Debate of 1850 The temper of the country was white hot when Congress convened in December 1849. It was a memorable session, memorable for the great men who took part in the debates, and memorable for the grand compromise of 1850 which it produced. In the Senate sat for the last time three heroic figures, Webster from the North, Calhoun from the South, and Clay from a border state. For nearly forty years these three had been leaders of men. All had grown old and gray in service. Calhoun was already broken in health, and in a few months was to be borne from the political arena forever. Clay and Webster had but two more years in their allotted span. Experience, learning, statecraft, all these things they now marshaled in a mighty effort to solve the slavery problem. On January 29, 1850, Clay offered to the Senate a compromise granting concessions to both sides, and a few days later, in a powerful oration, he made a passionate appeal for a union of hearts through mutual sacrifices. Calhoun relentlessly demanded the full measure of justice for the South, equal rights in the territories bought by common blood, the return of runaway slaves as required by the Constitution, the suppression of the abolitionists, and the restoration of the balance of power between the North and the South. 
Webster, in his notable 7th of March speech, condemned the Wilmot Proviso, advocated a strict enforcement of the fugitive slave law, denounced the abolitionists, and made a final plea for the Constitution, Union, and Liberty. This was the address which called forth from Whittier the poem, Ichabod, deploring the fall of the mighty one whom he thought lost to all sense of faith and honor. THE TERMS OF THE COMPROMISE OF 1850 When the debates were closed, the results were totaled in a series of compromise measures, all of which were signed in September 1850 by the new president, Millard Fillmore, who had taken office two months before on the death of Zachary Taylor. By these acts the boundaries of Texas were adjusted and the territory of New Mexico created, subject to the provision that all or any part of it might be admitted to the Union, with or without slavery, as their constitution may provide at the time of their admission. The territory of Utah was similarly organized, with the same conditions as to slavery, thus repudiating the Wilmot Proviso without guaranteeing slavery to the planters. California was admitted as a free state under a constitution in which the people of the territory had themselves prohibited slavery. The slave trade was abolished in the District of Columbia, but slavery itself existed as before at the capital of the nation. This concession to anti-slavery sentiment was more than offset by a new fugitive slave law, drastic in spirit and in letter. It placed the enforcement of its terms in the hands of federal officers appointed from Washington, and so removed it from the control of authorities locally elected. It provided that masters or their agents, on filing claims in due form, might summarily remove their escaped slaves without affording their alleged fugitives the right of trial by jury, the right to witness, the right to offer any testimony in evidence. Finally, to put teeth into the act, heavy penalties were prescribed for all who obstructed or assisted in obstructing the enforcement of the law. Such was the Great Compromise of 1850. THE PRO-SLAVERY TRIUMPH IN THE ELECTION OF 1852 The results of the election of 1852 seemed to show conclusively that the nation was weary of slavery agitation and wanted peace. Both parties, Whigs and Democrats, endorsed the fugitive slave law and approved the Great Compromise. The Democrats, with Franklin Pierce as their leader, swept the country against the war hero, General Winfield Scott, on whom the Whigs had staked their hopes. Even Webster, broken with grief at his failure to receive the nomination, advised his friends to vote for Pierce, and turned away from politics to meditate upon approaching death. The verdict of the voters would seem to indicate that for the time everybody, save a handful of disgruntled agitators, looked upon Clay's settlement as the last word. The people, especially the businessmen of the country, says Elson, were utterly weary of the agitation, and they gave their suffrages to the party that promised them rest. The Free Soil Party, condemning slavery as a sin against God and a crime against man, and advocating freedom for the territories, failed to carry a single state. In fact, it polled fewer voters than it had four years earlier, 156,000 as against nearly three million, the combined vote of the Whigs and Democrats. It is not surprising, therefore, that President Pierce, surrounded in his cabinet by strong Southern sympathizers, could promise to put an end to slavery agitation, and to crush the abolition movement in the bud. Anti-slavery agitation continued. The promise was more difficult to fulfill than to utter. In fact, the vigorous execution of one measure included in the compromise, the fugitive slave law, only made matters worse. Designed as a security for the planters, it proved a powerful instrument in their undoing. Slavery, five hundred miles away on a Louisiana plantation, was so remote from the North that only the strongest imagination could maintain a constant rage against it. Slave-catching, man-hunting by federal officers on the streets of Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, or Milwaukee, and in the hamlets and villages of the wide-stretching farmlands of the North, was another matter. It brought the most odious aspects of slavery home to thousands of men and women who would otherwise have been indifferent to the system. Law-abiding businessmen, mechanics, farmers, and women, when they saw peaceful Negroes, who had resided in their neighborhoods for perhaps years, torn away by federal officers and carried back to bondage, were transformed into enemies of the law. They helped slaves to escape, 
they snatched them away from officers who had captured them, they broke open jails and carried fugitives off to Canada. Assistance to runaway slaves, always more or less common in the North, was by this time organized into a system. Regular routes, known as underground railroads, were laid out across the free states into Canada, and trusted friends of freedom maintained underground stations, where fugitives were concealed in the daytime between their long night journeys. Funds were raised, and secret agents sent into the South to help Negroes to flee. One Negro woman, Harriet Tubman, the Moses of her people, with headquarters at Philadelphia, is accredited with nineteen invasions into slave territory and the emancipation of three hundred Negroes. Those who worked at this business were in constant peril. One underground operator, Calvin Fairbank, spent nearly twenty years in prison for aiding fugitives from justice. Yet perils and prisons did not stay those determined men and women who, in obedience to their consciences, set themselves to this lawless work. From thrilling stories of adventure along the underground railways came some of the scenes and themes of the novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, published two years after the Compromise of 1850. Her stirring tale set forth the worst features of slavery in vivid word-pictures that caught and held the attention of millions of readers. Though the book was unfair to the South, and was denounced as a hideous distortion of the truth, it was quickly dramatized and played in every city and town throughout the North. Topsy, Little Eva, Uncle Tom, The Fleeing Slave, Eliza Harris, and the cruel slave-driver, Simon Legree, with his baying bloodhounds, became living specters in many a home that sought to bar the door to the unpleasant and irritating business of slavery agitation. End of section 4「Section five of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part five. Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part five. Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. Chapter fourteen. The Planting System and National Politics Concluded The Drift of Events Toward the Irrepressible Conflict Repeal of the Missouri Compromise To practical men, after all, the rub-a-dub agitation of a few abolitionists, an occasional riot over fugitive slaves, and the vogue of a popular novel seemed of slight or transient importance. They could point with satisfaction to the election returns of 1852, but their very security was founded upon shifting sands. The magnificent triumph of the pro-slavery Democrats in 1852 brought a turn of affairs that destroyed the foundations under their feet. Emboldened by their own strength and the weakness of their opponents, they now dared to repeal the Missouri Compromise. The leader in this fateful enterprise was Stephen A. Douglas, senator from Illinois, and the occasion for the deed was the demand for the organization of territorial government in the regions west of Iowa and Missouri. Douglas, like Clay and Webster before him, was consumed by a strong passion for the presidency, and, to reach his goal, it was necessary to win the support of the South. This he undoubtedly sought to do when he introduced, on January 4, 1854, a bill organizing the Nebraska Territory on the principle of the Compromise of 1850, namely, that the people in the territory might themselves decide whether they would have slavery or not. Unwittingly the avalanche was started. After a stormy debate, in which important amendments were forced on Douglas, the Kansas-Nebraska Bill became a law on May 30, 1854. The measure created two territories, Kansas and Nebraska, and provided that they, or territories organized out of them, would come into the Union as states with or without slavery as their constitutions may prescribe at the time of their admission. Not content with this, the law went on to declare the Missouri Compromise null and void as being inconsistent with the principle of non-intervention by Congress with slavery in states and territories. Thus by a single blow the very heart of the continent, dedicated to freedom by solemn agreement, was thrown open to slavery. A desperate struggle between slave-owners and the advocates of freedom was the outcome in Kansas. 
If Douglas fancied that the North would receive the overthrow of the Missouri Compromise in the same temper that it greeted Clay's settlement, he was rapidly disillusioned. A blast of rage, terrific in its fury, swept from Maine to Iowa. Stayed old Boston hanged him in effigy with an inscription, Stephen A. Douglas, author of the infamous Nebraska Bill, the Benedict Arnold of 1854. City after city burned him in effigy, until, as he himself said, he could travel from the Atlantic coast to Chicago in the light of the fires. Thousands of Whigs and Free Soil Democrats deserted their parties, which had sanctioned or at least tolerated the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, declaring that the startling measure showed an evident resolve on the part of the planters to rule the whole country. A gauge of defiance was thrown down to the abolitionists. An issue was set even for the moderate and timid, who had been unmoved by the agitation over slavery in the far south. That issue was whether slavery was to be confined within its existing boundaries, or be allowed to spread without interference, thereby placing the free states in the minority, and surrendering the federal government wholly to the slave power. THE RISE OF THE REPUBLICAN PARTY Events of terrible significance, swiftly following, drove the country like a ship before a gale, straight into civil war. The Kansas-Nebraska Bill rent the old parties asunder, and called into being the Republican Party. While that bill was pending in Congress, many Northern Whigs and Democrats had come to the conclusion that a new party, dedicated to freedom in the territories, must follow the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. Several places claim to be the original home of the Republican Party, but historians generally yield it to Wisconsin. At Ripon, in that state, a mass meeting of Whigs and Democrats assembled in February 1854, and resolved to form a new party if the Kansas-Nebraska Bill should pass. At a second meeting, in a fusion committee representing Whigs, Free Soilers, and Democrats was formed, and the name Republican, the name of Jefferson's old party, was selected. All over the country similar meetings were held, and political committees were organized. When the presidential campaign of 1856 began, the Republicans entered the contest. After a preliminary conference in Pittsburgh in February, they held a convention in Philadelphia, at which was drawn up a platform opposing the extension of slavery to the territories. John C. Fremont, the distinguished explorer, was named for the presidency. The results of the election were astounding as compared with the free-soil failure of the preceding election. Prominent men like Longfellow, Washington Irving, William Cullen Bryant, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and George William Curtis went over to the new party, and 1,341,264 votes were rolled up for free labor, free speech, free men, free Kansas, and Fremont. Nevertheless, the victory of the Democrats was decisive. Their candidate, James Buchanan of Pennsylvania, was elected by a majority of 174 to 114 electoral votes. The Dred Scott Decision, 1857 In his inaugural, Buchanan vaguely hinted that in a forthcoming decision the Supreme Court would settle one of the vital questions of the day. This was a reference to the Dred Scott case then pending. Scott was a slave who had been taken by his master into the upper Louisiana Territory, where freedom had been established by the Missouri Compromise, and then carried back into his old state of Missouri. He brought suit for his liberty on the ground that his residence in the free territory made him free. This raised the question whether the law of Congress prohibiting slavery north of 36 degrees 30 minutes was authorized by the Federal Constitution or not. The Court might have avoided answering it by saying that even though Scott was free in the territory, he became a slave again in Missouri by virtue of the law of that state. The Court, however, faced the issue squarely. It held that Scott had not been free anywhere, and that, besides, the Missouri Compromise violated the Constitution and was null and void. The decision was a triumph for the South. It meant that Congress, after all, had no power to abolish slavery in the territories. Under the decree of the highest court in the land, that could be done only by an amendment to the Constitution, which required a two-thirds vote in Congress and the approval of three-fourths of the states. Such an amendment was obviously impossible. The southern states were too numerous, but the Republicans were not daunted. We know, said Lincoln, the court that made it has often overruled its own decisions, and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this. 
legislatures of northern states passed resolutions condemning the decision, and the Republican platform of 1860 characterized the dogma that the Constitution carried slavery into the territories as a dangerous political heresy, at variance with the explicit provisions of that instrument itself. With legislative and judicial precedent, revolutionary in tendency and subversive of the peace and harmony of the country. The Panic of 1857 In the midst of the acrimonious dispute over the Dred Scott decision came one of the worst business panics which ever afflicted the country. In the spring and summer of 1857, fourteen railroad corporations, including the Erie, Michigan Central, and the Illinois Central, failed to meet their obligations. Banks and insurance companies, some of them the largest and strongest institutions in the North, closed their doors. Stocks and bonds came down in a crash on the markets. Manufacturing was paralyzed. Tens of thousands of working people were thrown out of employment. Hunger meetings of idle men were held in the cities, and banners bearing the inscription, We Want Bread, were flung out. In New York, working men threatened to invade the council chamber to demand work or bread, and the frightened mayor called for the police and soldiers. For this distressing state of affairs many remedies were offered, none with more zeal and persistence than the proposal for a higher tariff to take the place of the law of March, 1857, a democratic measure making drastic reductions in the rates of duty. In the manufacturing districts of the North, the panic was ascribed to the democratic assault on business. So an old issue was again vigorously advanced, preparatory to the next presidential campaign. THE LINCOLN-DOUGLAS DEBATES The following year the interest of the whole country was drawn to a series of debates held in Illinois by Lincoln and Douglas, both candidates for the United States Senate. In the course of his campaign Lincoln had uttered his trenchant saying that a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. At the same time, he had accused Douglas, Buchanan, and the Supreme Court of acting in concert to make slavery national. This daring statement arrested the attention of Douglas, who was making his campaign on the doctrine of squatter sovereignty, that is, the right of the people of each territory to vote slavery up or down. After a few long-distance shots at each other, the candidates agreed to meet face to face and discuss the issues of the day. Never had such crowds been seen at political meetings in Illinois. Farmers deserted their plows, smiths their forges, and housewives their baking to hear Honest Abe and the Little Giant. The results of the series of debates were momentous. Lincoln clearly defined his position. The South, he admitted, was entitled, under the Constitution, to a fair fugitive slave law. He hoped that there might be no new slave states, but he did not see how Congress could exclude the people of a territory from admission as a state if they saw fit to adopt a constitution legalizing the ownership of slaves. He favored the gradual abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, and the total exclusion of it from the territories of the United States by act of Congress. Moreover, he drove Douglas into a hole by asking how he squared squatter sovereignty with the Dred Scott decision, how, in other words, the people of a territory could abolish slavery when the court had declared that Congress, the superior power, could not do it under the Constitution. To this baffling question Douglas lamely replied that the inhabitants of a territory, by unfriendly legislation, might make property and slaves insecure, and thus destroy the institution. This answer to Lincoln's query alienated many Southern Democrats, who believed that the Dred Scott decision settled the question of slavery in the territories for all times. Douglas won the election to the Senate, lifted into national fame by the debates, beat him in the campaign for president two years later. John Brown's Raid To the abolitionists, the line of argument pursued by Lincoln, including his proposal to leave slavery untouched in the states where it existed, was wholly unsatisfactory. One of them, a grim and resolute man, inflamed by a hatred for slavery in itself, turned from agitation to violence. These men are all talk. What is needed is action. Action! So spoke John Brown of New York. During the sanguinary struggle in Kansas, he hurried to the frontier, gun and dagger in hand, to help drive slave owners from the free soil of the West. There he committed deeds of such daring and cruelty that he was outlawed and a price put upon his head. Still he kept on the path of action. Aided by funds from his northern friends, he gathered a small band of his followers around him, saying to them, 
If God be for us, who can be against us? He went into Virginia in the autumn of 1859, hoping, as he explained, to effect a mighty conquest, even though it be like the last victory of Samson. He seized the government armory at Harper's Ferry, declared free the slaves whom he found, and called upon them to take up arms in defense of their liberty. This was a hope as forlorn as it was desperate. Armed forces came down upon him, and after a hard battle captured him. Tried for treason, Brown was condemned to death. The governor of Virginia turned a deaf ear to pleas for clemency based on the ground that the prisoner was simply a lunatic. "'This is a beautiful country,' said the stern old Brown, glancing upward to the eternal hills on his way to the gallows, as calmly as if he were returning home from a long journey. So perish all such enemies of Virginia, all such enemies of the Union, all such foes of the human race, solemnly announced the executioner as he fulfilled the judgment of the law. The raid, and its grim ending, deeply moved the country. Abolitionists looked upon Brown as a martyr, and tolled funeral bells on the day of his execution. Longfellow wrote in his diary, This will be a great day in our history, the date of a new revolution as much needed as the old one. Jefferson Davis saw in the affair the invasion of a state by a murderous gang of abolitionists bent on inciting slaves to murder helpless women and children, a crime for which the leader had met a felon's death. Lincoln spoke of the raid as absurd, the deed of an enthusiast who had brooded over the oppression of a people until he fancied himself commissioned by heaven to liberate them, an attempt which ended in little else than his own execution. To Republican leaders as a whole, the event was very embarrassing. They were taunted by the Democrats with responsibility for the deed. Douglas declared his firm and deliberate conviction that the Harper's Ferry crime was the natural, logical, inevitable result of the doctrines and teachings of the Republican Party. So persistent were such attacks that the Republicans felt called upon, in 1860, to denounce Brown's raid as among the gravest of crimes. The Democrats Divided when Democratic Convention met at Charleston in the spring of 1860, a few months after Brown's execution, it soon became clear that there was danger ahead. Between the extreme slavery advocates of the far South and the so-called pro-slavery Democrats of the Douglas type, there was a chasm which no appeals to party loyalty could bridge. As the spokesman of the West, Douglas knew that, while the North was not abolitionist, it was passionately set against an extension of slavery into the territories by act of Congress that squatter sovereignty was the mildest kind of compromise acceptable to the farmers whose votes would determine the fate of the election. Southern leaders would not accept his opinion. Yancey, speaking for Alabama, refused to palter with any plan not built upon the proposition that slavery was in itself right. He taunted the Northern Democrats with taking the view that slavery was wrong, but that they could not do anything about it. That, he said, was the fatal error, the cause of all discord, the source of black republicanism, as well as squatter sovereignty. The gauntlet was thus thrown down at the feet of the northern delegates. You must not apologize for slavery. You must declare it right. You must advocate its extension. The challenge, so bluntly put, was bluntly answered. Gentlemen of the South, responded a delegate from Ohio, you mistake us. You mistake us. We will not do it. For ten days the Charleston Convention wrangled over the platform and balloted for the nomination of a candidate. Douglas, though in the lead, could not get the two-thirds vote required for victory. For more than fifty times the roll of the convention was called without a decision. Then, in sheer desperation, the convention adjourned to meet later at Baltimore. When the delegates again assembled, their passions ran as high as ever. The division into two irreconcilable factions was unchanged uncompromising delegates from the South withdrew to Richmond, nominating John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky for president, and put forth a platform asserting the rights of slave owners in the territories and the duty of the federal government to protect them. The delegates who remained at Baltimore nominated Douglas and endorsed his doctrine of squatter sovereignty. The Constitutional Union Party while the Democratic Party was being disrupted, a fragment of the former Whig Party, known as the Constitutional Unionists, held a convention at Baltimore and selected national candidates, John Bell from Tennessee and Edward Everett from Massachusetts. A melancholy interest attached to this assembly. It was mainly composed of old men whose political views were those of Clay and Webster, cherished leaders now dead and gone. In their platform they sought to exercise the evil spirit of partisanship, 
by inviting their fellow citizens to support the constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. The party that campaigned on this grand sentiment only drew laughter from the Democrats and derision from the Republicans, and polled less than one-fourth the votes. THE REPUBLICAN CONVENTION With the Whigs definitely forced into a separate group, the Republican Convention at Chicago was fated to be sectional in character, although five states did send delegates. As the Democrats were split, the party that had led a forlorn hope four years before was on the high road to success at last. New and powerful recruits were found. The advocates of a high protective tariff and the friends of free homesteads for farmers and working men mingled with enthusiastic foes of slavery. While still firm in their opposition to slavery in the territories, the Republicans went on record in favor of a homestead law, granting free lands to settlers and approved customs duties designed to encourage the development of the industrial interests of the whole country. The platform was greeted with cheers, which, according to the stenographic report of the convention, became loud and prolonged as the protective tariff and homestead planks were read. Having skillfully drawn a platform to unite the North in opposition to slavery and the planting system, the Republicans were also adroit in their selection of a candidate. The tariff plank might carry Pennsylvania, a democratic state, but Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois were equally essential to success at the polls. The southern counties of these states were filled with settlers from Virginia, North Carolina, and Kentucky, who, even if they had no love for slavery, were no friends of abolition. Moreover, remembering the old fight on the United States Bank in Andrew Jackson's day, they were suspicious of men from the East. Accordingly, they did not favor the candidacy of Seward, the leading Republican statesman and favorite son of New York. After much trading and discussion, the convention came to the conclusion that Abraham Lincoln of Illinois was the most available candidate. He was of Southern origin, born in Kentucky in 1809, a fact that told heavily in the campaign in the Ohio Valley. He was a man of the soil, the son of poor frontier parents, a pioneer who in his youth had labored in the fields and forests, celebrated far and wide as Honest Abe the Rail Splitter. It was well known that he disliked slavery, but was no abolitionist. He had come dangerously near to Seward's radicalism in his house divided against itself speech, but he had never committed himself to the reckless doctrine that there was a higher law than the Constitution. Slavery in the South he tolerated as a bitter fact. Slavery in the territories he opposed with all his strength. Of his sincerity there could be no doubt. He was a speaker and a writer of singular power, commanding, by the use of simple and homely language, the hearts and minds of those who heard him speak, or read his printed words. He had gone far enough in his opposition to slavery, but not too far. He was the man of the hour. Amid lusty cheers from ten thousand throats, Lincoln was nominated for the presidency by the Republicans. In the ensuing election he carried all the free states except New Jersey. References P. E. Chadwick, Causes of the Civil War, American Nation Series. W. E. Dodd, Statesman of the Old South. E. Engel, Southern Sidelights, Sympathetic Account of the Old South. A. B. Hart, Slavery and Abolition, American Nation Series. J. F. Rhodes, History of the United States, Volumes 1 and 2. T. C. Smith, Parties and Slavery, American Nation Series. Questions. Number 1. Trace the decline of slavery in the North and explain it. Number 2. Describe the character of early opposition to slavery. Number 3. What was the effect of abolition agitation? Number 4. Why did anti-slavery sentiment practically disappear in the South? Number 5. On what grounds did Calhoun defend slavery? Number 6. Explain how slave owners became powerful in politics. Number 7. Why was it impossible to keep the slavery issue out of national politics? Number 8. Give the leading steps in the long controversy over slavery in the territories. Number 9. State the terms of the Compromise of 1850 and explain its failure. Number 10. What were the startling events between 1850 and 1860? Number 11. Account for the rise of the Republican Party. What party had used the title before? Number 12. How did the Dred Scott decision become a political issue? Number 13. What were some of the points brought out in the Lincoln-Douglas debates? Number 14. Describe the party division in 1860. Number 15. What were the main planks of the Republican platform? Research Topics. 
The Extension of Cotton Planting, Calendar, Economic History of the United States, pages 760 to 768. Abolition Agitation, McMaster, History of the People of the United States, Volume 6, pages 271 to 298. Calhoun's Defense of Slavery, Harding, Select Orations, Illustrating American History, pages 247 to 257. The Compromise of 1850, Clay's Speech in Harding, Select Orations, pages 267 to 289, The Compromise Laws in MacDonald, Documentary Source Book of American History, pages 383 to 394, Narrative Account in McMaster, volume 8, pages 1 through 55, Elson, History of the United States, pages 540 to 548. The Repeal of the Missouri Compromise, McMaster, volume 8, pages 192 to 231, Elson, pages 571 to 582. The Dred Scott Case, McMaster, Volume 8, pages 278 to 282. Compare the opinion of Taney and the dissent of Curtis in MacDonald, Documentary Source Book, pages 405 to 420, Elson, pages 595 to 598. The Lincoln Douglas Debates, Analysis of Original Speeches in Harding, Select Orations, pages 309 to 341, Elson, pages 598 to 604. Biographical Studies, Calhoun, Clay, Webster, A. H. Stevens, Douglas, W. H. Seward, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. End of Section 5《Section 6 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 5, Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 5, Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction, Chapter 15. THE CIVIL WAR AND RECONSTRUCTION PART One. The irrepressible conflict is about to be visited upon us through the black Republican nominee and his fanatical, diabolical Republican Party, ran an appeal to the voters of South Carolina during the campaign of 1860. If that calamity comes to pass, responded the governor of the state, the answer should be a declaration of independence. In a few days the suspense was over. The news of Lincoln's election came speeding along the wires. Prepared for the event, the editor of the Charleston Mercury unfurled the flag of his state amid wild cheers from an excited throng in the streets. Then he seized his pen and wrote, The tea has been thrown overboard. The revolution of 1860 has been initiated. The issue was submitted to the voters in the choice of delegates to a state convention called to cast off the yoke of the Constitution. The Southern Confederacy Secession. As arranged, the Convention of South Carolina assembled in December, and without a dissenting voice passed the ordinance of secession, withdrawing from the Union. Bells were rung exultantly, the roar of cannon carried the news to outlying counties, fireworks lighted up the heavens, and champagne flowed. The crisis so long expected had come at last. Even the conservatives who had prayed that they might escape the dreadful crash greeted it with a sigh of relief. South Carolina now sent forth an appeal to her sister states, states that had in Jackson's day repudiated nullification as leading to the dissolution of the Union. The answer that came this time was in a different vein. A month had hardly elapsed before five other states, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, had withdrawn from the Union. In February, Texas followed. Virginia, hesitating until the bombardment of Fort Sumter forced a conclusion, seceded in April, but fifty-five of the one hundred and forty-three delegates dissented, foreshadowing the creation of the new state of West Virginia, which Congress admitted to the Union in 1863. In May, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee announced their independence. Secession and the Theories of the Union in severing their relations with the Union, the seceding states denied every point in the Northern theory of the Constitution. That theory, as every one knows, was carefully formulated by Webster and elaborated by Lincoln. According to it, the Union was older than the states. It was created before the Declaration of Independence for the purpose of common defense. 
the Articles of Confederation did but strengthen this national bond, and the Constitution sealed it forever. The federal government was not a creature of state governments. It was erected by the people, and derived its powers directly from them. It is, said Webster, the people's constitution, the people's government, made for the people, made by the people, and answerable to the people. The people of the United States have declared that this constitution shall be the supreme law. When a state questions the lawfulness of any act of the federal government, it cannot nullify that act or withdraw from the Union. It must abide by the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. The union of these states is perpetual, ran Lincoln's simple argument in the first inaugural. The federal constitution has no provision for its own termination. It can be destroyed only by some action not provided for in the instrument itself, even if it is a compact among all the states, the consent of all must be necessary to its dissolution. Therefore, no state can lawfully get out of the Union, and acts of violence against the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary. This was the system which he believed himself bound to defend by his oath of office registered in heaven. All this reasoning southern statesmen utterly rejected. In their opinion the thirteen original states won their independence as separate and sovereign powers. The treaty of peace with Great Britain named them all, and acknowledged them to be free, sovereign, and independent states. The Articles of Confederation very explicitly declared that each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence. The Constitution was a league of nations, formed by an alliance of thirteen separate powers, each one of which ratified the instrument before it was put into effect. They voluntarily entered the Union under the Constitution, and voluntarily they could leave it. Such was the constitutional doctrine of Hayne, Calhoun, and Jefferson Davis. In seceding, the southern states had only to follow legal methods, and the transaction would be correct in every particular. So conventions were summoned, elections were held, and sovereign assemblies of the people set aside the Constitution in the same manner as it had been ratified nearly fourscore years before. Thus, said the southern people, the moral judgment was fulfilled, and the letter of the law carried into effect. THE FORMATION OF THE CONFEDERACY Acting on the call of Mississippi, a Congress of delegates from the seceded states met at Montgomery, Alabama, and on February 8, 1861, adopted a temporary plan of union. It selected, as provisional president, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, a man well fitted by experience and moderation for leadership, a graduate of West Point, who had rendered distinguished service on the field of battle in the Mexican War, in public office, and as a member of Congress. In March, a permanent constitution of the Confederate States was drafted. It was quickly ratified by the States, elections were held in November, and the government under it went into effect the next year. This new constitution, in form, was very much like the famous instrument drafted at Philadelphia in 1787. It provided for a President, a Senate, and a House of Representatives along almost identical lines. In the powers conferred upon them, however, there were striking differences. The right to appropriate money for internal improvements was expressly withheld. Bounties were not to be granted from the Treasury, nor import duties so laid as to promote or foster any branch of industry. The dignity of the State, if any might be bold enough to question it, was safeguarded in the opening line by the declaration that each acted in its sovereign and independent character in forming the Southern Union financing the Confederacy. No government ever set out upon its career with more perplexing tasks in front of it. The North had a monetary system, the South had to create one. The North had a scheme of taxation that produced large revenues from numerous sources, the South had to formulate and carry out a financial plan. Like the North, the Confederacy expected to secure a large revenue from customs duties, easily collected and little felt among the masses. To this expectation the blockade of southern ports inaugurated by Lincoln in April 1861 soon put an end. Following the precedent set by Congress under the Articles of Confederation, the Southern Congress resorted to a direct property tax apportioned among the states, only to meet the failure that might have been foretold. The Confederacy also sold bonds, the first issue bringing into the Treasury nearly all the specie available in the southern banks. This specie, by unhappy management, was early sent abroad to pay for supplies, sapping the foundations of a sound currency system. 
large amounts of bonds were sold overseas, commanding at first better terms than those of the North in the markets of London, Paris, and Amsterdam, many an English lord and statesman buying with enthusiasm and confidence to lament within a few years the proofs of his folly. The difficulties of bringing through the blockade any supplies purchased by foreign bond issues, however, nullified the effect of foreign credit, and forced the Confederacy back upon the device of paper money. In all, approximately one billion dollars streamed from the printing presses, to fall in value at an alarming rate, reaching, in January 1863, the astounding figure of fifty dollars in paper money for one in gold. Every known device was used to prevent its depreciation, without result. To the issues of the Confederate Congress were added untold millions poured out by states and by private banks. Human and Material Resources when we measure strength for strength in those signs of power, men, money, and supplies, it is difficult to see how the South was able to embark on secession and war with such confidence in the outcome. In the Confederacy, at the final reckoning, there were eleven states in all, to be pitted against twenty-two, a population of nine millions, nearly one-half servile, to be pitted against twenty-two millions, a land without great industries to produce war supplies, and without vast capital to furnish war finances, joined in battle with a nation already industrial and fortified by property worth eleven billion dollars. Even after the Confederate Congress authorized conscription in 1862, Southern manpower, measured in numbers, was wholly inadequate to uphold the independence which had been declared. How, therefore, could the Confederacy hope to sustain itself against such a combination of men, money, and materials as the North could marshal? Southern Expectations the answer to this question is to be found in the ideas that prevailed among Southern leaders. First of all, they hoped in vain to carry the Confederacy up to the Ohio River, and, with the aid of Missouri, to gain possession of the Mississippi Valley, the granary of the nation. In the second place they reckoned upon a large and continuous trade with Great Britain, the exchange of cotton for war materials. They likewise expected to receive recognition and open aid from European powers that looked with satisfaction upon the break-up of the great American Republic. In the third place they believed that their control over several staples so essential to northern industry would enable them to bring on an industrial crisis in the manufacturing states. I firmly believe, wrote Senator Hammond of South Carolina in 1860, that the slave-holding South is now the controlling power of the world that no other power would face us in hostility. Cotton, rice, tobacco, and naval stores command the world, and we have the sense to know it, and are sufficiently Teutonic to carry it out successfully. The North, without us, would be a motherless calf, bleeding about, and die of mange and starvation. There were other grounds for confidence. Having seized all of the federal military and naval supplies in the South, and having left the national government weak in armed power during their possession of the presidency, Southern leaders looked to a swift war, if it came at all, to put the finishing stroke to independence. The greasy mechanics of the North, it was repeatedly said, will not fight. As to disparity in numbers, they drew historic parallels. Our fathers, a mere handful, overcame the enormous power of Great Britain. A saying of ex-President Tyler ran current to reassure the doubtful. Finally, and this point cannot be too strongly emphasized, the South expected to see a weakened and divided North. It knew that the abolitionists and the southern sympathizers were ready to let the Confederate states go in peace, that Lincoln represented only a little more than one-third the voters of the country, and that the vote for Douglas, Bell, and Breckinridge meant a decided opposition to the Republicans and their policies. EFFORTS AT COMPROMISE Republican leaders, on reviewing the same facts, were themselves uncertain as to the outcome of a civil war, and made many efforts to avoid crisis. Thurlow Weed, an Albany journalist and politician who had done much to carry New York for Lincoln, proposed a plan for extending the Missouri Compromise Line to the Pacific. Jefferson Davis, warning his followers that a war, if it came, would be terrible, was prepared to accept the offer, but Lincoln, remembering his campaign pledges, stood firm as a rock against it. His followers in Congress took the same position with regard to a similar settlement suggested by Senator Crittenden of Kentucky. Though unwilling to surrender his solemn promises respecting slavery in the territories, Lincoln was prepared to give Southern leaders a strong guarantee that his administration would not interfere directly or indirectly with slavery in the states. 
anxious to reassure the South on this point, the Republicans in Congress proposed to write into the Constitution a declaration that no amendment should ever be made authorizing the abolition of or interference with slavery in any state. The resolution, duly passed, was sent forth on March 4, 1861, with the approval of Lincoln. It was actually ratified by three states before the storm of war destroyed it. By the irony of fate, the Thirteenth Amendment was to abolish, not guarantee, slavery. End of section 6section seven of history of the united states by charles a beard and mary r beard part five sectional conflict and reconstruction this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. history of the united states by charles a beard and mary r beard part five sectional conflict and reconstruction chapter fifteen the Civil War and Reconstruction Continued, The War Measures of the Federal Government Raising the Armies The crisis at Fort Sumter, on April 12-14, 1861, forced the President and Congress to turn from negotiations to problems of warfare. Little did they realize the magnitude of the task before them. Lincoln's first call for volunteers, issued on April 15, 1861, limited the number to 75,000, put their term of service at three months, and prescribed their duty as the enforcement of the law against combinations too powerful to be overcome by ordinary judicial process. Disillusionment swiftly followed. The terrible defeat of the Federals at Bull Run on July 21st revealed the serious character of the task before them, and by a series of measures Congress put the entire manpower of the country at the President's command. Under these acts he issued new calls for volunteers. Early in August, 1862, he ordered a draft of militiamen numbering 300,000 for nine months' service. The results were disappointing, ominous, for only about 87,000 soldiers were added to the army. Something more drastic was clearly necessary. In March, 1863, Lincoln signed the inevitable draft law. It enrolled in the national forces liable to military duty all able-bodied male citizens and persons of foreign birth who had declared their intention to become citizens, between the ages of twenty and forty-five years, with exemptions on grounds of physical weakness and dependency. From the men enrolled were drawn by lot those destined to active service. Unhappily the measure struck a mortal blow at the principle of universal liability by excusing any person who found a substitute for himself or paid into the war office a sum, not exceeding three hundred dollars, to be fixed by general order. This provision, so crass and so obviously favoring the well-to-do, sowed seeds of bitterness which sprang up a hundredfold in the North. The beginning of the drawing under the Draft Act in New York City, on Monday, July thirteenth, 1863, was the signal for four days of rioting. In the course of this uprising, draft headquarters were destroyed, the office of the Tribune was gutted, Negroes were seized, hanged, and shot, the homes of obnoxious Unionists were burned down, the residence of the mayor of the city was attacked, and regular battles were fought in the streets between the rioters and the police. Business stopped, and a large part of the city passed absolutely into the control of the mob. Not until late the following Wednesday did enough troops arrive to restore order and enable the residents of the city to resume their daily activities. At least a thousand people had been killed or wounded, and more than a million dollars' worth of damage done to property. The draft, temporarily interrupted by this outbreak, was then resumed and carried out without further trouble. The results of the draft were in the end distinctly disappointing to the government. The exemptions were numerous, and the number who preferred and were able to pay three hundred dollars rather than serve exceeded all expectations. Volunteering, it is true, was stimulated but even that resource could hardly keep the thinning ranks of the army filled. With reluctance, Congress struck out the $300 exemption clause, but still favored the well-to-do by allowing them to hire substitutes if they could find them. With all this power in its hands, the administration was able, by January 1865, to construct a Union army that outnumbered the Confederates two to one. War Finance In the financial sphere the North faced immense difficulties. 
the surplus in the treasury had been dissipated by 1861, and the tariff of 1857 had failed to produce an income sufficient to meet the ordinary expenses of the government. Confronted by military and naval expenditures of appalling magnitude, rising from thirty-five million in the first year of the war to one billion one hundred and fifty-three million in the last year, the administration had to tap every available source of income. The duties on imports were increased, not once, but many times, producing huge revenues, and also meeting the most extravagant demands of the manufacturers for protection. Direct taxes were imposed on the states according to their respective population, but the returns were meagre, all out of proportion to the irritation involved. Stamp taxes and taxes on luxuries, occupations, and the earnings of corporations were laid with a weight that, in ordinary times, would have drawn forth opposition of ominous strength. The whole gamut of taxation was run. Even a tax on incomes and gains by the year, the first in the history of the federal government, was included in the long list. Revenues were supplemented by bond issues, mounting in size and interest rate, until in October, at the end of the war, the debt stood at two billion two hundred and eight million dollars. The total cost of the war was many times the money value of all the slaves in the southern states. To the debt must be added nearly half a billion dollars in greenbacks, paper money issued by Congress in desperation as bond sales and revenues from taxes failed to meet the rising expenditures. This currency issued at par on questionable warrant from the Constitution, like all such paper, quickly began to decline until, in the worst fortunes of 1864, one dollar in gold was worth nearly three in greenbacks. THE BLOCKADE OF SOUTHERN PORTS Four days after his call for volunteers, April 19, 1861, President Lincoln issued a proclamation blockading the ports of the Southern Confederacy. Later the blockade was extended to Virginia and North Carolina as they withdrew from the Union. Vessels attempting to enter or leave these ports, if they disregarded the warnings of a blockading ship, were to be captured and brought as prizes to the nearest convenient port. To make the order effective, immediate steps were taken to increase the naval forces, depleted by neglect, until the entire coastline was patrolled with such a number of ships that it was a rare captain who ventured to run the gauntlet. The collision between the Merrimack and the Monitor in March 1862 sealed the fate of the Confederacy. The exploits of the Union Navy are recorded in the falling export of cotton, $202 million in 1860, $42 million in 1861, and $4 million in 1862. The deadly effect of this paralysis of trade upon Southern war power may be readily imagined. Foreign loans, payable in cotton, could be negotiated but not paid off. Supplies could be purchased on credit, but not brought through the dragnet. With extreme difficulty could the Confederate government secure even paper for the issue of money and bonds. Publishers, in despair at the loss of supplies, were finally driven to the use of brown wrapping paper and wall paper. As the railways and rolling stock wore out, it became impossible to renew them from England or France. Unable to export their cotton, planters on the seaboard burned it in what were called fires of patriotism. In their lurid light the fatal weakness of the southern economy stood revealed. Diplomacy The war had not advanced far before the federal government became involved in many perplexing problems of diplomacy in Europe. The Confederacy early turned to England and France for financial aid and for recognition as an independent power. Davis believed that the industrial crisis created by the cotton blockade would, in time, literally compel Europe to intervene in order to get this essential staple. The crisis came as he expected, but not the result. Thousands of English textile workers were thrown out of employment, and yet, while on the point of starvation, they adopted resolutions favoring the North instead of petitioning their government to aid the South by breaking the blockade. With the ruling classes it was far otherwise. Napoleon III, the Emperor of the French, was eager to help in disrupting the American Republic. If he could have won England's support, he would have carried out his designs. As it turned out, he found plenty of sympathy across the Channel, but not open and official cooperation. According to the eminent historian, Rhodes, four-fifths of the British House of Lords and most members of the House of Commons were favourable to the Confederacy, and anxious for its triumph. Late in 1862 the British ministers, thus sustained, were on the point of recognizing the independence of the Confederacy. 
had it not been for their extreme caution, for the constant and harassing criticism by English friends of the United States, like John Bright, and for the victories of Vicksburg and Gettysburg, both England and France would have doubtless declared the Confederacy to be one of the independent powers of the earth. While stopping short of recognizing its independence, England and France took several steps that were in favor of the South. In proclaiming neutrality, they early accepted the Confederates as belligerents, and accorded them the rights of people at war, a measure which aroused anger in the North at first, but was later admitted to be sound. Otherwise, Confederates taken in battle would have been regarded as rebels or traitors to be hanged or shot. Napoleon III proposed to Russia in 1861 a coalition of powers against the North, only to meet a firm refusal. The next year he suggested intervention to Great Britain, encountering this time a conditional rejection of his plans. In 1863, not daunted by rebuffs, he offered his services to Lincoln as a mediator, receiving in reply a polite letter declining his proposal, and a sharp resolution from Congress suggesting that he attend to his own affairs. In both England and France the governments pursued a policy of friendliness to the Confederate agents. The British ministry, with indifference if not convivance, permitted rams and ships to be built, in British docks, and allowed them to escape to play havoc under the Confederate flag with American commerce. One of them, the Alabama, built in Liverpool by a British firm and paid for by bonds sold in England, ran an extraordinary career and threatened to break the blockade. The course followed by the British government, against the protests of the American minister in London, was later regretted. By an award of a tribunal of arbitration at Geneva in 1872, Great Britain was required to pay the huge sum of $15,500,000 to cover the damages wrought by Confederate cruisers fitted out in England. In all fairness, it should be said that the conduct of the North contributed to the irritation between the two countries. Seward, the Secretary of State, was vindictive in dealing with Great Britain. Had it not been for the moderation of Lincoln, he would have pursued a course verging in the direction of open war. The New York and Boston papers were severe in their attacks on England. Words were, on one occasion at least, accompanied by an act savoring of open hostility. In November 1861, Captain Wilkes, commanding a Union vessel, overhauled the British steamer Trent, and carried off by force two Confederate agents, Mason and Slidell, sent by President Davis to represent the Confederacy at London and Paris, respectively. This was a clear violation of the right of merchant vessels to be immune from search and impressment, and in answer to the demand of Great Britain for the release of the two men, the United States conceded that it was in the wrong. It surrendered the two Confederate agents to a British vessel for safe conduct abroad, and made appropriate apologies. Emancipation. Among the extreme war measures adopted by the northern governments must be counted in the emancipation of the slaves in the states in arms against the Union. This step was early and repeatedly suggested to Lincoln by the abolitionists, but was steadily put aside. He knew that the abolitionists were a mere handful, that emancipation might drive the border states into secession, and that the northern soldiers had enlisted to save the Union. Moreover, he had before him a solemn resolution passed by Congress on July 22, 1861, declaring the sole purpose of the war to be the salvation of the Union, and disavowing any intention of interfering with slavery. The federal government, though pledged to the preservation of slavery, soon found itself beaten back upon its course, and out upon a new tack. Before a year had elapsed, namely, on April 10, 1862, Congress resolved that financial aid should be given to any state that might adopt gradual emancipation. Six days later it abolished slavery in the District of Columbia. Two short months elapsed. On June 19, 1862, it swept slavery forever from the territories of the United States. Chief Justice Taney still lived. The Dred Scott decision stood as written in the book. But the Constitution had been re-read in the light of the Civil War the drift of public sentiment in the North was being revealed. While these measures were pending in Congress, Lincoln was slowly making up his mind. By July of that year he had come to his great decision. Near the end of that month he read to his cabinet the draft of a proclamation of emancipation, but he laid it aside until a military achievement would make it something more than an idle gesture. In September, the severe check administered to Lee at Antietam seemed to offer the golden opportunity. 
on the twenty second the immortal document was given to the world announcing that unless the states in arms returned to the union by january one eighteen sixty three the fatal blow at their peculiar institution would be delivered southern leaders treated it with slight regard and so on the date set the promise was fulfilled the proclamation was issued as a war measure adopted by the president as commander-in-chief of the armed forces on grounds of military necessity it did not abolish slavery it simply emancipated slaves in places then in arms against federal authority everywhere else slavery as far as the proclamation was concerned remained lawful to seal forever the proclamation of emancipation and to extend freedom to the whole country congress in january eighteen sixty five on the urgent recommendation of lincoln transmitted to the states the thirteenth amendment abolishing slavery throughout the union by the end of eighteen sixty five the amendment was ratified the house was not divided against itself it did not fall it was all free the restraint of civil liberty as in all great wars particularly those in the nature of a civil strife it was found necessary to use strong measures to sustain opinion favorable to the administration's military policies and to frustrate the designs of those who sought to hamper its action within two weeks of his first call for volunteers lincoln empowered general scott to suspend the writ of habeas corpus along the line of march between philadelphia and washington and thus to arrest and hold without interference from civil courts any one whom he deemed a menace to the union at a later date the area thus ruled by military officers was extended by executive proclamation by an act of march three eighteen sixty three congress desiring to lay all doubts about the president's power authorized him to suspend the writ throughout the united states or in any part thereof it also freed military officers from the necessity of surrendering to civil courts persons arrested under their orders or even making answers to writs issued from such courts in the autumn of that year the president acting under the terms of this law declared this ancient and honorable instrument for the protection of civil liberties the habeas corpus suspended throughout the length and breadth of the land the power of the government was also strengthened by an act defining and punishing certain conspiracies passed on july thirty first eighteen sixty one a measure which imposed heavy penalties on those who by force intimidation or threat interfered with the execution of the law thus doubly armed the military authorities spared no one suspected of active sympathy with the southern cause editors were arrested and imprisoned their papers suspended and their newsboys locked up those who organized peace meetings soon found themselves in the toils of the law members of the maryland legislature the mayor of baltimore and local editors suspected of entertaining secessionist opinions were imprisoned on military orders although charged with no offence and were denied the privilege of examination before a civil magistrate a vermont farmer too outspoken in his criticism of the government found himself behind the bars until the government in its good pleasure saw fit to release him these measures were not confined to the theatre of war nor to the border states where the spirit of secession was strong enough to endanger the cause of union they were applied all through the northern states up to the very boundaries of canada zeal for the national cause too often supplemented by a zeal for persecution spread terror among those who wavered in the singleness of their devotion to the union these drastic operations on the part of military authorities so foreign to the normal course of civilized life naturally aroused intense and bitter hostility meetings of protest were held throughout the country thirty-six members of the house of representatives sought to put on record their condemnation of the suspension of the habeas corpus act only to meet a firm denial by the supporters of the act chief justice taney before whom the case of a man arrested under the president's military authority was brought emphatically declared in a long and learned opinion bristling with historical examples that the president had no power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in congress and out democrats abolitionists and champions of civil liberty denounced lincoln and his cabinet in unsparing terms vallandigham a democratic leader of ohio afterwards banished to the south for his opposition to the war constantly applied to lincoln the epithet of caesar wendell phillips saw in him a more unlimited despot than the world knows this side of china sensitive to such stinging thrusts and no friend of wanton persecution lincoln attempted to mitigate the rigors of the law by 
paroling many political prisoners. The general policy, however, he defended in homely language, very different in tone and meaning from the involved reasoning of the lawyers. Must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts, while I must not touch a hair of the wily agitator who induces him to desert? He asked, in a quiet way, of some spokesman for those who protested against arresting people for talking against the war. This summed up his philosophy. He was engaged in a war to save the Union, and all measures necessary and proper to accomplish that purpose were warranted by the Constitution, which he had sworn to uphold. Military Strategy, North and South The broad outlines of military strategy followed by the commanders of the opposing forces are clear, even to the layman who cannot be expected to master the details of a campaign, or, for that matter, the maneuvers of a single great battle. The problem for the South was one of defense mainly, though even for defense swift and paralyzing strokes at the North were later deemed imperative measures. The problem of the North was, to put it baldly, one of invasion and conquest. Southern territory had to be invaded, and Southern armies beaten on their own ground, or worn down to exhaustion there. In the execution of this undertaking, geography, as usual, played a significant part in the disposition of forces. The Appalachian Ranges, stretching through the Confederacy to northern Alabama, divided the campaigns into eastern and western enterprises. Both were of signal importance. Victory in the east promised the capture of the Confederate capital of Richmond, a stroke of moral worth, hardly to be overestimated. Victory in the west meant severing the Confederacy and opening the Mississippi Valley down to the Gulf. As it turned out, the western forces accomplished their task first— vindicating the military powers of Union soldiers and shaking the confidence of opposing commanders. In February 1862, Grant captured Fort Donelson on the Tennessee River, rallied wavering Unionists in Kentucky, forced the evacuation of Nashville, and opened the way for two hundred miles into the Confederacy. At Shiloh, Murfreesboro, Vicksburg, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, desperate fighting followed, and in spite of varying fortunes, it resulted in the discomfiture and retirement of the Confederate forces to the southeast into Georgia. By the middle of 1863, the Mississippi Valley was open to the Gulf, the initiative taken out of the hands of Southern commanders in the West, and the way prepared for Sherman's final stroke, the march from Atlanta to the sea, a maneuver executed with needless severity in the autumn of 1864. For the almost unbroken succession of achievements in the West by Generals Grant, Sherman, Thomas, and Hooker, against Albert Sidney Johnson, Bragg, Pemberton, and Hood, the Union forces in the East offered at first an almost equally unbroken series of misfortunes and disasters. Far from capturing Richmond, they had been thrown on the defensive. General after general, McClellan, Pope, Burnside, Hooker, and Meade, was tried and found wanting. None of them could administer a crushing defeat to the Confederate troops, and more than once the Union soldiers were beaten in a fair battle. They did succeed, however, in delivering a severe check to advancing Confederates under General Robert E. Lee, first at Antietam in September 1862, and then at Gettysburg in July 1863, checks reckoned as victories, though in each instance the Confederates escaped without demoralization. Not until the beginning of the next year, when General Grant, supplied with almost unlimited men and munitions, began his irresistible hammering at Lee's army, did the final phase of the war commence. The pitiless drive told at last. General Lee, on April 9, 1865, seeing the futility of further conflict, surrendered an army still capable of hard fighting, at Appomattox, not far from the capital of the Confederacy. Abraham Lincoln the services of Lincoln to the cause of Union defy description. A judicial scrutiny of the war reveals his thought and planning in every part of the varied activity that finally crowned northern arms with victory. Is it in the field of diplomacy? Does Seward, the Secretary of State, propose harsh and caustic measures likely to draw England's sword into the scale? Lincoln counsels moderation. He takes the irritating message and with his own hands strikes out, erases, tones down, and interlines, exchanging for words that sting and burn the language of prudence and caution. Is it a matter of compromise with the South, so often proposed by men on both sides sick of carnage? Lincoln is always ready to listen, and turns away only when he is invited to surrender principles essential to the safety of the Union. 
Is it high strategy of war, a question of the general best fitted to win Gettysburg, Hooker, Sedgwick, or Meade? Lincoln goes in person to the War Department in the dead of night to take counsel with his secretary and to make the fateful choice. Is it a complaint from a citizen, deprived, as he believes, of his civil liberties unjustly or in violation of the Constitution? Lincoln is ready to hear it and anxious to afford relief, if warrant can be found for it. Is a mother begging for the life of a son sentenced to be shot as a deserter? Lincoln hears her petition, and grants it even against the protests made by his generals in the name of military discipline. Do politicians sow dissensions in the army and among civilians? Lincoln grandly waves aside their petty personalities and invites them to think of the greater cause. Is it a question of securing votes to ratify the Thirteenth Amendment, abolishing slavery? Lincoln thinks it not beneath his dignity to traffic and huckster with politicians over the trifling jobs asked in return by the members who hold out against him. Does a New York newspaper call him an ignorant Western boor? Lincoln's reply is a letter to a mother who has given her all, her sons on the field of battle, and an address at Gettysburg, both of which will live as long as the tongue in which they were written. These are tributes not only to his mastery of the English language, but also to his mastery of all those sentiments of sweetness and strength, which are the finest flowers of culture. Throughout the entire span of service, however, Lincoln was beset by merciless critics. The fiery apostles of abolition accused him of cowardice, when he delayed the bold stroke at slavery. Anti-war Democrats lashed out at every step he took. Even in his own party he found no peace. Charles Sumner complained, Our president is now dictator, imperator, whichever you like, but how vain to have the powers of a god and not to use it godlike. Leaders among the Republicans sought to put him aside in 1864 and place Chase in his chair. I hope we may never have a worse man, was Lincoln's quiet answer. Wide were the dissensions in the North during that year, and the Republicans, while selecting Lincoln as their candidate again, cast off their old name and chose the simple title of the Union Party. Moreover, they selected a Southern man, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, to be associated with him as a candidate for vice president. This combination the Northern Democrats boldly confronted with a platform declaring that after four years of failure to restore the Union by the experiment of war, during which, under the pretense of military necessity or war power, higher than the Constitution, the Constitution itself has been disregarded in every part, and public liberty and private right alike trodden down, justice, humanity, liberty, and public welfare demand that immediate efforts be made for a cessation of hostilities, to the end that peace may be restored on the basis of the Federal Union of the States. It is true that the Democratic candidate, General McClellan, sought to break the yoke imposed upon him by the platform, saying that he could not look his old comrades in the face and pronounce their efforts vain, but the party call to the nation to repudiate Lincoln and his works had gone forth. The response came, giving Lincoln 2,200,000 votes against 1,800,000 for his opponent. The bitter things said about him during the campaign he forgot and forgave. When in April 1865 he was struck down by the assassin's hand, he, above all others in Washington, was planning measures of moderation and healing. End of section 7section 8 of history of the united states by charles a beard and mary r beard part 5 sectional conflict and reconstruction this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of the united states by charles a beard and mary r beard part 5 sectional conflict and reconstruction Chapter 15. The Civil War and Reconstruction. Concluded. The Results of the Civil War. There is a strong and natural tendency on the part of writers to stress the dramatic and heroic aspects of the war, but the long judgment of history requires us to include all other significant phases as well. Like every great armed conflict, the Civil War outran the purposes of those who took part in it. Waged over the nature of the Union, it made a revolution in the Union, changing public policies and constitutional principles, and giving a new direction to agriculture and industry. THE SUPREMACY OF THE UNION First and foremost, the war settled for all time the long dispute as to the nature of the federal system. 
the doctrine of state sovereignty was laid to rest. Men might still speak of the rights of states, and think of their commonwealths with affection, but nullification and secession were destroyed. The nation was supreme. THE DESTRUCTION OF THE SLAVE POWER Next to the vindication of national supremacy was the destruction of the planting aristocracy of the South, that great power which had furnished leadership of undoubted ability, and had so long contested with the industrial and commercial interests of the North. The first paralyzing blow at the planters was struck by the abolition of slavery. The second and third came with the fourteenth, 1868, and fifteenth, 1870, amendments, giving the ballot to freed men and excluding from public office the Confederate leaders, driving from the work of reconstruction the finest talents of the South. As if to add bitterness to gall and wormwood, the fourteenth amendment forbade the United States or any state to pay any debts incurred in age of the Confederacy or in the emancipation of the slaves, plunging into utter bankruptcy the southern financiers who had stripped their section of capital to support their cause. So the southern planters found themselves excluded from public office and ruled over by their former bondmen under the tutelage of Republican leaders. Their labor system was wrecked, and their money and bonds were as worthless as waste paper. The South was subject to the North. That which neither the Federalists nor the Whigs had been able to accomplish in the realm of statecraft was accomplished on the field of battle. THE TRIUMPH OF INDUSTRY The wreck of the planting system was accompanied by a mighty upswing of northern industry which made the old Whigs of Massachusetts and Pennsylvania stare in wonderment. The demands of the federal government for manufactured goods at unrestricted prices gave a stimulus to business which more than replaced the lost markets of the South. Between 1860 and 1870 the number of manufacturing establishments increased 79.6 per cent, as against 14.2 for the previous decade, while the number of persons employed almost doubled. There was no doubt about the future of American industry. THE VICTORY FOR THE PROTECTIVE TARIFF Moreover, it was henceforth to be well protected. For many years before the war the friends of protection had been on the defensive. The Tariff Act of 1857 imposed duties so low as to presage a tariff for revenue only. The war changed all that. The extraordinary military expenditures, requiring heavy taxes on all sources, justified tariffs so high that a follower of Clay or Webster might well have gasped with astonishment. After the war was over the debt remained, and both interest and principal had to be paid. Protective arguments based on economic reasoning were supported by a plain necessity for revenue which admitted no dispute. A LIBERAL IMMIGRATION POLICY Linked with industry was the labor supply. The problem of manning industries became a pressing matter, and Republican leaders grappled with it. In the platform of the Union Party adopted in 1864, it was declared that foreign immigration, which in the past has added so much to the wealth, the development of resources, and the increase of power to this nation, the asylum of the oppressed of all nations, should be fostered and encouraged by a liberal and just policy. In that very year Congress, recognizing the importance of the problem, passed a measure of high significance, creating a Bureau of Immigration and authorizing a modified form of indentured labor, by making it legal for immigrants to pledge their wages in advance to pay their passage over. Though the bill was soon repealed, the practice authorized by it was long continued. The cheapness of the passage shortened the term of service, but the principle was older than the days of William Penn. THE HOMESTEAD ACT OF 1862 In the immigration measure guaranteeing a continuous and adequate labor supply, the manufacturers saw an offset to the Homestead Act of 1862, granting free lands to settlers, the homestead law they had resisted in a long and bitter congressional battle. Naturally, they had not taken kindly to a scheme which lured men away from the factories, or enabled them to make unlimited demands for higher wages, as the price of remaining. Southern planters likewise had feared free homesteads for the good reason that they only promised to add to the overbalancing power of the North. In spite of the opposition, supporters of a liberal land policy made steady gains. Free soil Democrats, Jacksonian farmers and mechanics, labor reformers and political leaders like Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois and Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, kept up the agitation in season and out. More than once were they able to force a homestead bill through the House of Representatives 
only to have it blocked in the Senate, where Southern interests were entrenched. Then, after the Senate was won over, a Democratic president, James Buchanan, vetoed the bill. Still the issue lived. The Republicans, strong among the farmers of the Northwest, favored it from the beginning, and pressed it upon the attention of the country. Finally the manufacturers yielded. They received their compensation in the contract labor law. In 1862 Congress provided for the free distribution of land in 160-acre lots, among men and women of strong arms and willing hearts, ready to build their serried lines of homesteads to the Rockies and beyond. INTERNAL IMPROVEMENTS If farmers and manufacturers were early divided on the matter of free homesteads, the same could hardly be said of internal improvements. The western tiller of the soil was as eager for some easy way of sending his produce to market as the manufacturer was for the same means to transport his goods to the consumer on the farm. While the Confederate leaders were writing to their Constitution a clause forbidding all appropriations for internal improvements, the Republican leaders at Washington were planning such expenditures from the Treasury in the form of public land grants to railways, as would have dazed the authors of the National Road Bill half a century earlier. Sound Finance National Banking From Hamilton's day to Lincoln's, businessmen in the East had contended for a sound system of national currency. The experience of the states with paper money, painfully impressive in the years before the framing of the Constitution, had been convincing to those who understood the economy of business. The Constitution, as we have seen, bore the signs of this experience. States were forbidden to emit bills of credit, paper money in short. This provision stood clear in the document, but judicial ingenuity had circumvented it in the age of Jacksonian democracy. The states had enacted and the Supreme Court, after the death of John Marshall, had sustained laws chartering banking companies and authorizing them to issue paper money. So the country was beset by the old curse, the banks of western and southern states issuing reams of paper notes to help borrowers pay their debts. In dealing with war finances, the Republicans attacked this ancient evil. By Act of Congress in 1864, they authorized a series of national banks founded on the credit of government bonds and empowered to issue notes. The next year they stopped all bank paper sent forth under the authority of the states by means of a prohibitive tax. In this way, by two measures, Congress restored federal control over the monetary system, although it did not re-establish the United States Bank, so hated by Jacksonian democracy. Destruction of States' Rights by Fourteenth Amendment These acts and others not cited here were measures of centralization and consolidation at the expense of the powers and dignity of the States. They were all of high import, but the crowning act of nationalism was the Fourteenth Amendment, which, among other things, forbade the states to deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The immediate occasion, though not the actual cause of this provision, was the need for protecting the rights of freedmen against hostile legislatures in the South. The result of the amendment, as was prophesied in protests loud and long from every quarter of the Democratic Party, was the subjection of every act of state, municipal, and county authorities to possible annulment by the Supreme Court at Washington. The expected happened. Few Negroes ever brought cases under the Fourteenth Amendment to the attention of the courts, but thousands of state laws, municipal ordinances, and acts of local authorities were set aside as null and void under it. Laws of states regulating railway rates, fixing hours of labor in bake shops, and taxing corporations were in due time to be annulled, as conflicting with an amendment erroneously supposed to be designed solely for the protection of Negroes. As centralized power over tariffs, railways, public lands, and other national concerns went to Congress, so centralized power over the acts of state and local authorities involving an infringement of personal and property rights was conferred on the federal judiciary, the apex of which was the Supreme Court at Washington. Thus the old federation of independent states, all equal in rights and dignity, each wearing the jewel of sovereignty, so celebrated in southern oratory, had gone the way of all flesh under the withering blasts of civil war. Reconstruction in the South Theories about the position of the seceding states On the morning of April ninth, 1865, when General Lee surrendered his army to General Grant, eleven states stood in a peculiar relation to the Union, now declared perpetual. 
lawyers and political philosophers were much perturbed, and had been for some time, as to what should be done with the members of the former Confederacy. Radical Republicans held that they were conquered provinces at the mercy of Congress, to be governed under such laws as it saw fit to enact, and until, in its wisdom, it decided to readmit any or all of them to the Union. Men of more conservative views held that, as the war had been waged by the North on the theory that no state could succeed from the Union, the Confederate states had merely attempted to withdraw and failed. The corollary of this latter line of argument was simple. The southern states are still in the Union, and it is the duty of the President, as Commander-in-Chief, to remove the Federal troops as soon as order is restored, and the state governments are ready to function once more as usual. Lincoln's Proposal some such simple and conservative form of reconstruction had been suggested by Lincoln in a proclamation of December 8, 1863. He proposed a pardon and a restoration of property, except in slaves, to nearly all who had directly or by implication participated in the existing rebellion, on condition that they take an oath of loyalty to the Union. He then announced that when, in any of the states named, a body of voters, qualified under the law as it stood before secession and equal in number to one-tenth the votes cast in 1860, took the oath of allegiance, they should be permitted to re-establish a state government. Such a government, he added, should be recognized as a lawful authority and entitled to protection under the federal constitution. With reference to the status of the former slaves, Lincoln made it clear that, while their freedom must be recognized, he would object to any legislation which may yet be consistent as a temporary arrangement with their present condition as a laboring, landless, and homeless class. Andrew Johnson's Plan His Impeachment Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, the Vice President, soon after taking office, proposed to pursue a somewhat similar course. In a number of states he appointed military governors, instructing them at the earliest possible moment to assemble conventions, chosen by that portion of the people of the said states who are loyal to the United States, and proceed to the organization of regular civil government. Johnson, a Southern man and a Democrat, was immediately charged by the Republicans with being too ready to restore the Southern states. As the months went by, the opposition to his measures and policies in Congress grew in size and bitterness. The contest resulted in the impeachment of Johnson by the House of Representatives in March, 1868, and his acquittal by the Senate, merely because his opponents lacked one vote of the two-thirds required for conviction. Congress enacts Reconstruction Laws In fact, Congress was in a strategic position. It was the law-making body, and it could, moreover, determine the conditions under which Senators and Representatives from the South were to be readmitted, it therefore proceeded to pass a series of Reconstruction Acts, carrying all of them over Johnson's veto. These measures, the first of which became a law on March 2, 1867, betrayed an animus not found anywhere in Lincoln's plans or Johnson's proclamations. They laid off the ten states, the whole Confederacy, with the exception of Tennessee, still outside the Pale, into five military districts, each commanded by a military officer appointed by the President. They ordered the commanding general to prepare a register of voters for the election of delegates to conventions chosen for the purpose of drafting new constitutions. Such voters, however, were not to be, as Lincoln had suggested, loyal persons duly qualified under the law existing before secession, but the male citizens of said state, twenty-one years old and upward, of whatever race, color, or previous condition, except such as may be disenfranchised for participation in the rebellion or for felony at common law. This was the death knell to the idea that the leaders of the Confederacy and their white supporters might be permitted to share in the establishment of the new order. Power was thus arbitrarily thrust into the hands of the newly emancipated male Negroes and the handful of whites who could show a record of loyalty. That was not all. Each state was, under the Reconstruction Acts, compelled to ratify the Fourteenth Amendment to the Federal Constitution as a price of restoration to the Union. The composition of the conventions thus authorized may be imagined. Bondmen, without the asking, without preparation, found themselves the governing power. An army of adventurers from the North, carpetbaggers, as they were called, poured in upon the scene to aid in Reconstruction. Undoubtedly, many men of honor and fine intentions gave unstinted service, but the results of their deliberations only aggravated the open wound left by the war. 
any number of political doctors offered their prescriptions, but no effective remedy could be found. Under measures admittedly open to grave objections, the southern states were one after another restored to the Union by the grace of Congress, the last one in 1870. Even this grudging concession of the formalities of statehood did not mean a full restoration of honors and privileges. The last soldier was not withdrawn from the last southern capital until 1877, and federal control over elections long remained as a sign of congressional supremacy. THE STATUS OF THE FREEDMEN Even more intricate than the issues involved in restoring the seceded states to the Union was the question of what to do with the newly emancipated slaves. That problem, often put to abolitionists before the war, had become at last a real concern. The Thirteenth Amendment abolishing slavery had not touched it at all. It declared bondmen free, but did nothing to provide them with work or homes, and did not mention the subject of political rights. All these matters were left to the states, and the legislatures of some of them, by their famous black codes, restored a form of servitude under the guise of vagrancy and apprentice laws. Such methods were, in fact, partly responsible for the reaction that led Congress to abandon Lincoln's policies and undertake its own program of reconstruction. Still, no extensive effort was made to solve by law the economic problems of the bondmen. Radical abolitionists had advocated that the slaves, when emancipated, should be given outright the fields of their former masters, but Congress steadily rejected the very idea of confiscation. The necessity of immediate assistance it recognized by creating, in 1865, the Freedmen's Bureau to take care of refugees. It authorized the issue of food and clothing to the destitute, and the renting of abandoned and certain other lands under federal control to former slaves at reasonable rates. But the larger problem of the relation of the freedmen to the land, it left to the slow working of time. Against sharp protests from conservative men, particularly among the Democrats, Congress did insist, however, on conferring upon the freedmen certain rights by national law. These rights fell into broad divisions, civil and political. By an act passed in 1866, Congress gave to former slaves the rights of white citizens in the matter of making contracts, giving testimony in courts, and purchasing, selling, and leasing property. As it was doubtful whether Congress had the power to enact this law, there was passed and submitted to the states the Fourteenth Amendment, which gave citizenship to the freedmen, assured them of the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, and declared that no state should deprive any person of his life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Not yet satisfied, Congress attempted to give social equality to Negroes by the Second Civil Rights Bill of 1875, which promised to them, among other things, the full and equal enjoyment of inns, theatres, public conveyances, and places of amusement, a law later declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. The matter of political rights was even more hotly contested, but the radical Republicans, like Charles Sumner, asserted that civil rights were not secure unless supported by the suffrage. In this same Fourteenth Amendment they attempted to guarantee the ballot to all Negro men, leaving the women to take care of themselves. The amendment declared, in effect, when any state deprived adult male citizens of the right to vote, its representation in Congress should be reduced in the proportion such persons bore to the voting population. This provision, having failed to accomplish its purpose, the Fifteenth Amendment was passed and ratified, expressly declaring that no citizen should be deprived of the right to vote, on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. To make assurance doubly secure, Congress enacted in 1870, 1872, and 1873 three drastic laws, sometimes known as force bills, providing for the use of federal authorities, civil and military, in supervising elections in all parts of the Union. So the federal government, having destroyed chattel slavery, sought by legal decree to sweep away all its signs and badges, civil, social, and political. Never, save perhaps in some of the civil conflicts of Greece or Rome, had there occurred in the affairs of a nation a social revolution so complete, so drastic, and far-reaching in its results. Summary of the Sectional Conflict Just as the United States, under the impetus of Western enterprise, rounded out the continental domain, its very existence as a nation was challenged by a fratricidal conflict between two sections. This storm had been long gathering upon the horizon. From the very beginning, in colonial times, there had been a marked difference between the South and the North. 
The former, by climate and soil, was dedicated to a planting system, the cultivation of tobacco, rice, cotton, and sugar-cane, and in the course of time slave labor became the foundation of the system. The North, on the other hand, supplemented agriculture by commerce, trade, and manufacturing. Slavery, though lawful, did not flourish there. An abundant supply of free labor kept the northern wheels turning. This difference between the two sections, early noted by close observers, was increased with the advent of the steam engine and the factory system. Between 1815 and 1860 an industrial revolution took place in the North. Its signs were gigantic factories, huge aggregations of industrial workers, immense cities, a flourishing commerce, and prosperous banks. Finding an unfavorable reception in the South, the new industrial system was confined mainly to the North. By canals and railways, New York, Boston, and Philadelphia were linked with the wheat fields of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. A steel net wove North and Northwest together. A commercial net supplemented it. Western trade was diverted from New Orleans to the East, and Eastern credit sustained Western enterprise. In time, the industrial North and the planting South evolved different ideas of political policy. The former looked with favor on protective tariffs, ship subsidies, a sound national banking system, and internal improvements. The farmers of the West demanded that the public domain be divided up into free homesteads for farmers. The South steadily swung around to the opposite view. Its spokesmen came to regard most of these policies as injurious to the planting interests. The economic questions were all involved in a moral issue. The northern states, in which slavery was of slight consequence, had early abolished the institution. In the course of a few years there appeared uncompromising advocates of universal emancipation. Far and wide the agitation spread. The South was thoroughly frightened. It demanded protection against the agitators, the enforcement of its rights in the case of runaway slaves, and equal privileges for slavery in the new territories. With the passing years the conflict between the two sections increased in bitterness. It flamed up in 1820, and was allayed by the Missouri Compromise. It took on the form of a tariff controversy and nullification in 1832. It appeared again after the Mexican War, when the question of slavery in the new territories was raised. Again compromise, the great settlement of 1850, seemed to restore peace, only to prove an illusion. A series of startling effects swept the country into war. The repeal of the Missouri Compromise in 1854, the rise of the Republican Party pledged to the prohibition of slavery in the territories, the Dred Scott decision of 1857, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, John Brown's raid, the election of Lincoln, and secession. The Civil War, lasting for four years, tested the strength of both North and South, in leadership, in finance, in diplomatic skill, in material resources, in industry, and in armed forces. By the blockade of southern ports, by an overwhelming weight of men and materials, and by relentless hammering on the field of battle, the North was victorious. The results of the war were revolutionary in character. Slavery was abolished and the freedmen given the ballot. The southern planters, who had been the leaders of their section, were ruined financially, and almost to a man excluded from taking part in political affairs. The union was declared to be perpetual, and the right of a state to succeed settled by the judgment of battle. Federal control over the affairs of states, counties, and cities was established by the Fourteenth Amendment. The power and prestige of the federal government were enhanced beyond imagination. The North was now free to pursue its economic policies, a protective tariff, a national banking system, land grants for railways, free lands for farmers. Planting had dominated the country for nearly a generation. Business enterprise was to take its place. References Northern Accounts J. K. Hosmer, The Appeal to Arms and the Outcome of the Civil War, American Nation Series J. Ropes, History of the Civil War, Best Account of Military Campaigns J. F. Rhodes, History of the United States, Volumes 3, 4, and 5. J. T. Morse, Abraham Lincoln, Two Volumes. Southern Accounts. W. E. Dodd, Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis, Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. E. Pollard, The Lost Cause. A. H. Stevens, The War Between the States. Questions. 1. Contrast the reception of secession in 1860 with that given to nullification in 1832. 2. Compare the northern and southern views of the Union. 3. 
What were the peculiar features of the Confederate Constitution? 4. How was the Confederacy financed? 5. Compare the resources of the two sections. 6. On what foundations did Southern hopes rest? 7. Describe the attempts at a peaceful settlement. 8. Compare the raising of armies for the Civil War with the methods employed in the World War. See below, Chapter 25. 9. Compare the financial methods of the government in the two wars. 10. Explain why the blockade was such a deadly weapon. 11. Give the leading diplomatic events of the war. 12. Trace the growth of anti-slavery sentiment. 13. What measures were taken to restrain criticism of the government? 14. What part did Lincoln play in all phases of the war? 15. State the principal results of the war. 16. Compare Lincoln's plan of reconstruction with that adopted by Congress. 17. What rights did Congress attempt to confer upon the former slaves? Research Topics Was secession lawful? The Southern View by Jefferson Davis in Harding, Select Orations Illustrating American History, pages 364 to 369, Lincoln's View, Harding, pages 371 to 381. The Confederate Constitution. Compare with the Federal Constitution in MacDonald, Documentary Source Book, pages 424 to 433, and pages 271 to 279. Federal Legislative Measures. Prepare a table and brief digest of the important laws relating to the war. MacDonald, pages 433 to 482. Economic Aspects of the War. Coleman, Industrial History of the United States, pages 279 to 301. Dewey, Financial History of the United States, chapters 12 and 13. Tabulate the economic measures of Congress in MacDonald. Military Campaigns. The great battles are fully treated in Rhodes, History of the Civil War, and teachers desiring to emphasize military affairs may assign campaigns to members of the class for study and report. A briefer treatment in Elson, History of the United States, pages 641 to 785. Biographical Studies. Lincoln, Davis, Lee, Grant, Sherman, and other leaders in civil and military affairs, with reference to local war governors. English and French Opinion of the War. Rhodes, History of the United States, Volume 4, pages 337 to 394. The South During the War. Rhodes, Volume 5, pages 343 to 382. The North During the War. Rhodes, Volume 5, pages 189 to 342. Reconstruction Measures. MacDonald, Source Book, pages 500 to 511, 514 to 518, 529 to 530. Elson, pages 786 to 799. The Force Bills. MacDonald, pages 547 to 551, 554 to 564. End of Section 8. End of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary R. Beard, Part 5. Sectional Conflict and Reconstruction. Chapter 16 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 6. National Growth and World Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ben Wilford. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 6. National Growth and World Politics, Chapter 16 The Political and Economic Evolution of the South The outcome of the Civil War in the South was nothing short of a revolution. The ruling class, the law, and the government of the old order had been subverted. To political chaos was added the havoc wrought in agriculture, business, and transportation by military operations. And as if to fill the cup to the brim, the task of reconstruction was committed to political leaders from another section of the country, strangers to the life and traditions of the South. The South at the close of the war, a ruling class disenfranchised. As the sovereignty of the planters had been the striking feature of the old regime, so their ruin was the outstanding fact of the new. The situation was extraordinary. The American Revolution was carried out by people experienced in the arts of self-government, and at its close they were free to follow the general course to which they had long been accustomed. 
the french revolution witnessed the overthrow of the clergy and the nobility but middle classes who took their places had been steadily rising in intelligence and wealth the southern revolution was unlike either of these catechisms it was not brought about by a social upheaval but by an external crisis it did not enfranchise a class that sought and understood power but bondsmen who had played no part in the struggle moreover it struck down a class equipped to rule the leading planters were almost to a man excluded from state and federal offices and the fourteenth amendment was a bar to their return all civil and military places under the authority of the united states and of the states were closed to every man who had taken an oath to support the constitution as a member of congress as a state legislature or as a state or federal officer and afterward engaged in insurrection or rebellion or given aid and comfort to the enemies of the united states this sweeping provision supplemented by the reconstruction acts laid under the ban most of the talent energy and spirit of the south the condition of the state governments the legislative executive and judicial branches of the state governments thus passed into the control of former slaves led principally by northern adventurers or southern novices known as scallywags the result was a carnival of waste folly and corruption the reconstruction assembly of south carolina bought clocks at four hundred and eighty dollars apiece and chandeliers at six hundred and fifty dollars to purchase land for former bondsmen the sum of eight hundred thousand dollars was appropriated and swamps bought at seventy-five cents an acre were sold to the state at five times the cost in the years between eighteen sixty eight and eighteen seventy three the debt of the states rose from about five million eight hundred thousand dollars to twenty four million dollars and millions of the increase could not be accounted for by the authorities responsible for it economic ruin urban and rural no matter where southern men turned in eighteen sixty five they found devastation in the towns in the country and along the highways atlanta the city to which sherman applied the torch lay in ashes nashville and chattanooga had been partially wrecked richmond and augusta had suffered severely from fires charleston was described by a visitor as a city of ruins of desolation of vacant houses of rotted wharves of deserted warehouses of weed gardens of miles of grass-grown streets how few young men there are how generally the young women are dressed in black the flower of their proud aristocracy is buried on scores of battlefields those who journeyed through the country about the same time reported desolation equally widespread and equally pathetic an english traveler who made his way along the course of the tennessee river in eighteen seventy wrote the trail of war is visible throughout the valley in burnt up gin houses ruined bridges mills and factories and large tracts of once cultivated land are stripped of every vestige of fencing the roads long neglected are in disorder and having in many places become impassable new tracks have been made through the woods and fields without much respect to boundaries many a great plantation has been confiscated by the federal authorities while the owner was in confederate service many more lay in waste in the wake of the armies the homes of rich and poor alike if spared the torch had been despoiled of the stock and seeds necessary to renew agriculture railways dilapidated transportation was still more demoralized this is revealed in the pages of congressional reports based upon first-hand investigations one eloquent passage illustrates all the rest from pocahontas to decatur alabama a distance of one hundred and fourteen miles we are told the railroad was almost entirely destroyed except the roadbed and iron rails and they were in very bad condition every bridge and trestle destroyed cross ties rotted buildings burned water tanks gone tracks grown up in weeds and bushes not a sawmill near the line and the labor system of the country gone about forty miles of the track was burned the cross ties entirely destroyed and the rails bent and twisted in such a manner as to require great labor to straighten and a large portion of them requiring renewal capital and credit destroyed the fluid capital of the south money and credit was in the same prostrate condition as the material capital the confederate currency inflated to the bursting point had utterly collapsed and was as worthless as waste paper 
the bonds of the confederate government were equally valueless species had nearly disappeared from circulation the fourteenth amendment to the federal constitution had made all debts obligations and claims incurred in aid of the confederate cause illegal and void millions of dollars owed to northern creditors before the war were overdue and payment was pressed upon the debtors where such debts were secured by mortgage on land executions against the property could be obtained in federal courts the restoration of white supremacy intimidation in both politics and economics the process of reconstruction in the south was slow and arduous the first battle in the political contest for white supremacy was won outside the halls of legislatures and the courts of law it was waged in the main by secret organizations amongst which the ku klux klan and the white carmelia were the most prominent the first of these societies appeared in tennessee in eighteen sixty six and held its first national convention the following year it was in origin a social club according to its announcements its objects were to protect the weak the innocent and the defenseless from the indignities wrongs and outrages of the lawless the violent and the brutal and to succor the suffering especially the widows and orphans of the confederate soldiers the whole south was called the empire and was ruled by a grand wizard each state was a realm and each county a province in the secret orders there were enrolled over a half a million men the methods of the ku klux and the white carmelia were similar solemn parades of masked men on horses decked in long robes were held sometimes in the daytime and sometimes at the dead of night notices were sent to obnoxious persons warning them to stop certain practices if warnings failed something more convincing was tried fright was the emotion most commonly stirred a horseman at the witching hour of midnight would ride up to the house of some offender lift his headgear take off a skull and hand it to the trembling victim with the request that he hold it for a few minutes frequently violence was employed either officially or unofficially by members of the clan tar and feathers were freely applied the whip was sometimes laid on unmercifully and occasionally a brutal murder was committed often the members were fired upon from bushes or behind trees and swift retaliation followed so alarming did the clashes become that in eighteen seventy congress forbade interference with electors or going into disguise for the purpose of obstructing the exercise of the rights enjoyed under federal law in anticipation of such a step on the part of the federal government the ku klux was officially dissolved by the grand wizard in eighteen sixty nine nevertheless the local societies continued their organization and methods the spirit survived the national association on the whole says a southern writer it is not easy to see what other course was open to the south armed resistance went out of the question and yet there must be some control had of the situation if force was denied craft was inevitable the struggle for the ballot box the effects of intimidation were soon seen at elections the freedmen into whose inexperienced hand the ballot had been thrust was ordinarily loath to risk his head by the exercise of his new rights he had not obtained them by a long and laborious contest of his own and he saw no urgent reason why he should battle for the privilege of using them the mere show of force the mere existence of a threat deterred thousands of ex-slaves from appearing at the polls thus the whites steadily recovered their dominance nothing could prevent it congress enacted forced bills establishing federal supervision of elections and the northern politicians protested against the return of former confederates to practical if not official power but all such opposition was like resistance to the course of nature amnesty for southerners the recovery of white supremacy in this way was quickly felt in national councils the democratic party in the north welcomed it as a sign of its return to power the more moderate republicans anxious to heal the breach in american unity sought to encourage rather than repress it so it came about that amnesty for confederates was widely advocated yet it must be said that the struggle for the removal of disabilities was stubborn and bitter lincoln with characteristic generosity in the midst of the war had issued a general proclamation of amnesty to nearly all who had been in arms against the union on condition that they take an oath of loyalty but johnson 
vindictive towards the southern leaders, and determined to make treason infamous, had extended the list of exceptions. Congress, even more relentless in its pursuit of Confederates, pushed through the 14th Amendment, which worked the sweeping disabilities we have just described. To appeals for comprehensive clemency, Congress was at first adamant. In vain did men like Carl Schurz exhort their colleagues to crown their victory in battle with a noble act of universal pardon and oblivion. Congress would not yield. It would grant amnesty in individual cases, for the principle of proscription it stood fast. When finally in 1872, seven years after the surrender at Appomattox, it did pass the General Amnesty Bill. It insisted on certain exceptions. Confederates who had been members of Congress just before the war, or had served in other high posts, civil or military, under the federal government, were still excluded from important offices. Not until the summer of 1898, when the war with Spain produced once more a union of hearts, did Congress relent and abolish the last of the disabilities imposed on the Confederates. The force bills attacked and nullified. The granting of amnesty encouraged the Democrats to redouble their efforts all along the line. In 1874, they captured the House of Representatives and declared war on the force bills. As the Republican Senate blocked immediate repeal, they resorted in an ingenious parliamentary trick. To the appropriation bill for the support of the army, they attached a rider, or condition, to the effect that no troops should be used to sustain the Republican government in Louisiana. The Senate rejected the proposal. A deadlock ensued, and Congress adjourned without making provision for the army. Satisfied with a technical victory, the Democrats let the army bill pass the next session, but kept up their fight on the force laws until they wrung from President Hayes a measure forbidding the use of United States troops in supervising elections. The following year, they again had recourse to a writer on the army bill and carried it through, putting an end to the use of money for military control of elections. The Reconstruction program were clearly going to pieces, and the Supreme Court helped along the process of dissolution by declaring parts of the laws invalid. In 1878, the Democrats even won a majority in the Senate, and returned to power a large number of men once prominent in the Confederate cause. The passions of the war by this time were evidently cooling. A new generation of men were coming on the scene. The supremacy of the whites in the South, if not yet complete, was at least assured. Federal marshals, their deputies, and supervisors of elections still possessed authority over the polls, but their strength had been shorn by the withdrawal of United States troops. The war on the remaining remnants of the force bills lapsed into desultory skirmishing. When in 1894 the last fragment was swept away, the country took little note of the fact. The only task that lay before the southern leaders was to write in the constitutions of their respected states the provisions of law which would clinch the gains so far secure and establish white supremacy beyond the reach of outside intervention. White supremacy sealed by new state constitutions. The impetus to this final step was given by the rise of the populist movement in the South, which sharply divided the whites and in many communities threw the balance of power into the hands of the few colored voters who survived the process of intimidation. Southern leaders now devised new constitutions so constructed as to deprive Negroes of the ballot by law. Mississippi took the lead in 1890, South Carolina followed five years later, Louisiana in 1898, North Carolina in 1900, Alabama and Maryland in 1901, and Virginia in 1902. The author of these measures made no attempt to conceal their purposes. The intelligent white men of the South, said Governor Tillman, intend to govern here. The 15th Amendment to the Federal Constitution, however, forbade them to deprive any citizen of the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. This made necessary the devices of indirection. They were few, simple, and effective. The first and most easily administered was the ingenious provision requiring each prospective voter to read a section of the state constitution or understand and explain it when read to him by the election officers. As an alternative, the payment of taxes or the ownership of a small amount of property was accepted as a qualification for voting. 
Southern leaders, unwilling to disfranchise any of the poor white men who had stood side by side with them in the dark days of Reconstruction, also resorted to a famous provision known as the Grandfather Clause. This plan admitted to the suffrage any man who did not have either property or educational qualifications, provided he had voted on or before 1867 or was the son or grandson of any such person. The devices worked effectively. Of the 147,000 Negroes in Mississippi above the age of 21, only about 8,600 registered under the Constitution of 1890. Louisiana had 127,000 colored voters enrolled in 1896. Under the Constitution drafted two years later, the registration fell to 5,300. An analysis of the figures for South Carolina in 1900 indicates that only about one Negro out of every 100 adult males of that race took part in elections. Thus was closed this chapter of Reconstruction. The Supreme Court refuses to intervene. Numerous efforts were made to prevail upon the Supreme Court of the United States to declare such laws unconstitutional, but the court, usually on technical grounds, avoided coming to a direct decision on the merits of the matter, in one case, the court remarked that it could not take charge of and operate the election machinery of Alabama. It concluded that, relief from a great political wrong, if done as alleged, by the people of a state and by the state itself, must be given by them or by the legislative and executive departments of the government of the United States. Only one of several schemes employed, namely the Grandfather Clause, was held to be a violation of the federal constitution. This blow, affected in 1950 by the decision in the Oklahoma and Maryland cases, left, however, the main structure of disenfranchisement unimpaired. Proposals to Reduce Southern Representation in Congress These provisions excluding thousands of male citizens from the ballot did not, in express terms, deprive any one of the vote on account of race or color. They did not, therefore, run counter to the letter of the 15th Amendment, but they did unquestionably make the states which adopted them liable to the operations of the 14th Amendment. The latter very explicitly provides that whenever any state deprives adult male citizens of the right to vote, except in certain minor cases, the representation of the state in Congress shall be reduced in the proportion which such number of disfranchised citizens bears to the whole number of male citizens over 21 years of age. Mindful of this provision, those who protested against disenfranchisement in the South turned to the Republican Party for relief, asking for action by the political branches of the federal government as the Supreme Court has suggested. The Republicans responded in their platform of 1908 by condemning all devices designed to deprive any one of the ballot for reasons of color alone. They demanded the enforcement in letter and spirit of the 14th as well as other amendments. Though victorious in their election, the Republicans refrained from reopening the ancient contest. They made no attempt to reduce Southern representation in the House. Southern leaders, while protesting against the declarations of their opponents, were able to view them as idle threats in no way endangering the security of the measures by which political reconstruction had been undone. The Solid South Out of the thirty-year conflict against carpetbag rule, there emerged what was long known as the Solid South, a South that, except occasionally in the border states, never gave an electoral vote to a Republican candidate for president. Before the Civil War, the Southern people had been divided on political questions. Take, for example, the election of 1860. In all of the 15 slave states, the variety of opinions was marked. In nine of them, Delaware, Virginia, Tennessee, Missouri, Maryland, Louisiana, Kentucky, Georgia, and Arkansas, the combined vote against the representative of the extreme Southern point of view, Breckinridge, constituted a safe majority. In each of the six states which were carried by Breckinridge, there was a large and powerful minority. In North Carolina, Breckinridge's majority over Bell and Douglas was only 849 votes. 
equally astonishing to those who imagined the South united in defense of extreme views in 1860 was the vote for Bell, the Unionist candidate, who stood firmly for the Constitution and silence on slavery. In every southern state, Bell's vote was large. In Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, and Tennessee, it was greater than that received by Breckinridge. In Georgia, it was 42,000 against 51,000. In Louisiana, 20,000 against 22,000. In Mississippi, 25,000 against 40,000. The effect of the Civil War upon these divisions was immediate and decisive. Save in the border states where thousands of men continued to adhere to the cause of the Union, in the Confederacy itself nearly all dissent was silenced by war. Men who had been bitter opponents joined hands in defense of their homes. When the armed conflict was over, they remained side by side working against Republican misrule and Negro domination. By 1890, after Northern supremacy was definitely broken, they boasted that there were at least 12 Southern states in which no Republican candidate for president could win a single electoral vote. Dissent in the Solid South Though everyone grew accustomed to speak of the South as solid, it did not escape close observers that in a number of southern states there appeared from time to time a fairly large body of dissenters. In 1892, the populists made heavy inroads upon the Democratic ranks. On other occasions, the contest between factions within the Democratic Party over the nomination of candidates revealed sharp differences of opinion. In some places, moreover, there grew up a Republican minority of respectable size. For example, in Georgia, Mr. Taft in 1908 polled 41,000 votes against 72,000 for Mr. Bryan. In North Carolina, 114,000 against 136,000. In Tennessee, 118,000 against 135,000. In Kentucky, 235,000 against 244,000. In 1920, Senator Harding, the Republican candidate, broke the record by carrying Tennessee as well as Kentucky, Oklahoma, and Maryland. The Economic Advance of the South The Breakup of the Great Estates In the dissolution of chattel slavery, it was inevitable that the great estate should give away before the small farm. The plantation was in fact founded on slavery. It was continued and expanded by slavery. Before the war, the prosperous planter, either by inclination or necessity, invested his surplus in more land to add to his original domain. As his slaves increased in number, he was forced to increase his acreage or sell them, and he usually preferred the former, especially in the far south. Still another element favored the large estate. Slave labor quickly exhausted the soil, and of its own force compelled the cutting of the forest and the extension of the area under cultivation. Finally, the planter took a natural pride in his great estate. It was a sign of his prowess and his social prestige. In 1865, the foundations of the planting system were gone. It was difficult to get efficient labor to till the vast plantations. The planters themselves were burdened with debts and handicapped by lack of capital. Negroes commonly preferred tilling plots of their own, rented or bought under mortgage, to the more irksome wage labor under white supervision. The land hunger of the white farmer, once checked by the planting system, reasserted itself. Before these forces, the plantation broke up. The small farm became the unit of cultivation in the South as in the North. Between 1870 and 1900, the number of farms doubled in every state south of the line of the Potomac and Ohio rivers, except in Arkansas and Louisiana. From year to year, the process of breaking up continued, with all that it implied in the creation of land-owning farmers. The diversification of crops. No less significant was the concurrent diversification of crops. Under slavery, tobacco, rice, and sugar were staples, and cotton was keen. These were standard crops. The methods of cultivation were simple and easily learned. They tested neither the skill nor the ingenuity of the slaves. As the returns were quick, they did not call for long-time investments of capital. After slavery was abolished, they still remained the staples, 
but far-sighted agriculturalists saw the dangers of depending upon a few crops. The mild climate all the way around the coast from Virginia to Texas and the character of the alluvial soil invited the exercise of more imagination. Peaches, oranges, peanuts, and other fruits and vegetables were found to grow luxuriously. Refrigeration for steamships and freight cars put the markets of great cities at the doors of southern fruit and vegetable gardeners. The South, which in planting days had relied so heavily upon the Northwest for its foodstuffs, began to battle for independence. Between 1880 and the close of the century, the value of its farm crops increased from $660 million to $1,270 million. The Industrial and Commercial Revolution on top of the radical changes in agriculture came an industrial and commercial revolution. The South had long been rich in natural resources, but the slave system had been unfavorable to their development. Rivers that would have turned millions of spindles tumbled unheeded to the seas. Coal and iron beds lay unopened. Timber was largely sacrificed in clearing lands for planting, or fell to earth in decay. Southern enterprise was consumed in planting. Slavery kept out the white immigrants who might have supplied the skilled labor for industry. After 1865, achievement in fortune no longer lay on the land alone. As soon as the paralysis of the war was over, the South caught the industrial spirit that had conquered feudal Europe and the agricultural North. In the development of mineral wealth, enormous tries were taken. Iron ore of every quality was found, the chief beds being in Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, and Texas. Five important coal bases were uncovered. In Virginia, North Carolina, the Appalachian chain from Maryland to the northern Alabama, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Texas. Oil pools were found in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas. Within two decades, 1880 to 1900, the output of mineral wealth multiplied tenfold, from ten millions a year to one hundred millions. The iron industries of West Virginia and Alabama began to rival those of Pennsylvania. Birmingham became the Pittsburgh and Atlanta, the Chicago of the South. In other lines of industry, lumbering and cotton manufacturing took a high rank. The development of southern timber resources was in every respect remarkable, particularly in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi. At the end of the first decade of the 20th century, primacy in lumber had passed from the Great Lakes region to the south. In 1913, eight southern states produced nearly four times as much lumber as the lake stakes and twice as much as the vast forests of Washington and Oregon. The development of the cotton industry, in the meantime, was similarly astonishing. In 1865, cotton spinning was a negligible matter in the southern states. In 1880, they had one-fourth of the mills of the country. At the end of the century, they had one-half the mills, the two Carolinas taking the lead by consuming more than one-third of their entire cotton crop. Having both the raw materials and the power at hand, they enjoyed many advantages over the New England rivals, and at the opening of the new century were outstripping the latter in the proportion of spindles annually put into operation. Moreover, the cotton planters, finding a market at the neighboring mills, began to look forward to a day when they could be somewhat emancipated from an absolute dependence upon the cotton exchanges of New York, New Orleans, and Liverpool. Transportation kept pace with industry. In 1860, the South had about 10,000 miles of railway. By 1880, the figure had doubled. During the next 20 years, over 30,000 miles were added, most of the increase being in Texas. About 1898, there opened a period of consolidation in which scores of short lines were united, mainly under the leadership of northern capitalists, and new through service open to the north and west. Thus, southern industries were given easily outlets to the markets of the nation and brought within the main currents of national business enterprise. The Social Effects of the Economic Changes As long as the slave system lasted, and planning was a major interest, the South was banned to be sectional in character. With slavery gone, crops diversified, natural resources developed, and industries promoted. The social order of the antebellum days inevitably dissolved. 
the South became more and more assimilated to the system of the North. In this process several lines of development are evident. In the first place we see the steady rise of the small farmer. Even in the old days there had been a large class of white yeomen who owned no slaves and tilled the soil with their own hands, but they labored under severe handicaps. They found the fertile lands of the coast and river valleys nearly all monopolized by planters, and they were by the forces of circumstances driven into the uplands where the soil was thin and the crops were light. Still they increased in numbers and zealously worked their freeholds. The war proved to be their opportunity. With the breakup of the plantations, they managed to buy land more worthy of their plows. By intelligent labor and intensive cultivation, they were able to restore much of the worn-out soil to its original fertility. In the meantime, they rose with their prosperity in the social and political scale. It became common for the sons of white farmers to enter the professions while their daughters went away to college and prepared for teaching. Thus a more democratic tone was given to the white society of the South. Moreover, the migration to the North and West, which had formerly carried thousands of energetic sons and daughters to search for new homesteads, was materially reduced. The energy of the agriculture population went into rehabilitation. The increase in the number of independent farmers was accomplished by the rise of small towns and villages, which gave diversity to the life of the South. Before 1860, it was possible to travel through endless stretches of cotton and tobacco. The social affairs of the planter's family centered in the homestead, even if they were occasionally interrupted by trips to distant cities or abroad. Carpentry, brick-laying, and blacksmithing were usually done by slaves skilled in simple handicrafts. Supplies were bought wholesale. In this way, there were little place in plantation economy for village and towns with their stores and mechanics. The abolition of slavery altered this. Small farms spread out where plantations had once stood. The skilled freemen turned to agriculture rather than to handicrafts. White men of a business or mechanical bent found an opportunity to serve the needs of their communities. So the local merchants and mechanics became an important element in the social system. In the county seats, once dominated by the planters, business and professional men assumed the leadership. Another vital outcome of this revolution was the transference of a large part of planning enterprise to business. Mr. Bruce, a southern historian of fine scholarship, has summed up this process in a single telling paragraph. The higher planning class that under the old system gave so much distinction to rural life has, so far as it has survived at all, been concentrated in the cities. The families that in the time of slavery would have been found only in the country are now found, with a few exceptions, in the towns. The transplantation has been practically universal. The talent, the energy, the ambition that formerly sought expression in the management of great estates and the control of hosts of slaves, now seek a field of action in trade, in manufacturing enterprises, or in the general enterprise of development. This was for the ruling class of the South the natural outcome of the great economic revolution that followed the war. As in all other parts of the world, the mechanical revolution was attended by the growth of a population of industrial workers dependent not upon the soil but upon wages for their livelihood. When Jefferson David was inaugurated president of the Southern Confederacy, there were approximately only 100,000 persons employed in southern manufacturers as against more than a million in northern mills. Fifty years later, Georgia and Alabama alone had more than 150,000 wage earners. Necessarily, this meant also a material increase in urban population, although the wide dispersion of cotton spending among small centers prevented the congestion that had accompanied the rise of the textile industry in New England. In 1910, New Orleans, Atlanta, Memphis, Nashville, and Houston stood in the same relation to the New South that Cincinnati, Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit had stood in the New West 50 years before. The problems of labor and capital and municipal administration, which the earlier writers boasted would never perplex the planning South, had come in full force. The Revolution in the Status of the Slaves 
No part of Southern society was so profoundly affected by the Civil War and the economic reconstruction as the former slaves. On the day of emancipation, they stood free, but empty-handed. The owners of no tools or property, the masters of no trade, and wholly inexperienced in the arts of self-help that characterized the whites in general, they had never been accustomed to looking out for themselves. The plantation bell had called them to labor and released them. Doles of food and clothing had been regularly made in given quantities. They did not understand wages, ownership, renting, contracts, mortgages, leases, bills, or accounts. When they were emancipated, four courses were open to them. They could flee from the plantation to the nearest town or city, or to the distant north, to seek a livelihood. Thousands of them chose this way, overcrowding cities where disease mowed them down. They could remain where they were in their cabins and work for daily wages instead of food, clothing, and shelter. This second course the major portion of them chose, but, as few masters had cash to dispense, the new relation was much like the old, in fact. It was still one of barter. The planter offered food, clothing, and shelter. The former slaves gave their labor in return. That was the best that many of them could do. A third course open to freedmen was that of renting from the former master, paying him usually with a share of the produce of the land. This way a large number of them chose. It offered them a chance to become landowners in time, and it afforded an easier life. The renter being, to a certain extent at least, master of his own hours of labor. The final and most difficult path was that to ownership of land. Many a master helped his former slave to acquire small holdings by offering easy terms. The more enterprising and the more fortunate who started life as renters or wage earners made their way upward to ownership in so many cases that by the end of the century one-fourth of the colored laborers on the land owned the soil they tilled. In the meantime, the South, though relatively poor, made relatively large expenditures for the education of the colored population. By the opening of the 20th century, facilities were provided for more than one-half of the colored children of school age. While in many respects this progress was disappointing, its significance, to be appreciated, must be derived from the comparison with the total illiteracy which prevailed under slavery. In spite of all that happened, however, the status of the Negroes in the South continued to give a peculiar character to that section of the country. They were almost entirely excluded from the exercise of the suffrage, especially in the far South. Special rooms were set aside for them at the railway station and special cars on the railway lines. In the field of industry, calling for technical skill, it appears, from the census figures, that they lost ground between 1890 and 1900, a condition which their friends ascribed to discriminations against them in law and in labor organizations, and their critics ascribed to their lack of aptitude. Whatever may be the truth, the fact remained that at the opening of the 20th century, neither the hopes of the emancipators nor the fears of their opponents were realized. The marks of the peculiar institution were still largely impressed upon Southern society. The situation, however, was by no means unchanging. On the contrary, there was a decided drift in affairs. For one thing, the proportion of Negroes in the South had slowly declined. By 1900, they were in a majority in only two states, South Carolina and Mississippi. In Arkansas, Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina, the proportion of the white population was steadily growing. The colored migration northward increased while the westward movement of the white farmers, which characterized pioneer days, declined. At the same time, a part of the foreign immigration to the United States was diverted southward. As the years passed, these tendencies gained momentum. The already huge colored quarters in some northern cities were widely expanded as whole counties in the south were stripped of their colored laborers. The race question, in its political and economic aspects, became less and less sectional, and more and more national. The south was drawn into the mainstream of national life. The separatist forces which produced the cataclysms of 1861 sank irresistibly into the background. References H. W. Grady, The New South, 1890
H. A. Herbert, Why the Solid South, W. G. Brown, The Lower South, E. G. Murphy, Problems of the Present South, B. T. Washington, The Negro Problem, The Story of the Negro, The Future of the Negro, A. B. Hart, The Southern South, and R. S. Baker, Following the Color Line, Two Works by Northern Writers, T. N. Page, The Negro, The Southerner's Problem. Question. 1. Give the three main subdivisions of the chapter. 2. Compare the condition of the South in 1865 with that of the North. Compare with the condition of the United States at the close of the Revolutionary War, at the close of the World War in 1918. 3. Contrast the enfranchisement of the slaves with the enfranchisement of white men 50 years earlier. 4. What was the condition of the planters as compared with that of the northern manufacturers? 5. How does money capital contribute to prosperity? Describe the plight of southern finance. 6. Give the chief steps in the restoration of white supremacy. 7. Do you know of any other societies to compare it with the Ku Klux Klan? 8. Give Lincoln's plan for amnesty. What principles do you think should govern the granting of amnesty? 9. How were the force bills overcome? 10. Compare the 14th and 15th Amendments with regard to the suffrage provisions. 11. Explain how they may be circumvented. 12. Account for the Solid South. What was the situation before 1860? 13. In what ways did Southern agriculture tend to become like that of the North? What were the social results? 14. Name the chief results of an industrial revolution in general, in the South in particular. 15. What courses were open to freedmen in 1865? 16. Give the main features in the economic and social status of the colored population in the South. 17. Explain why the race question is national now rather than sectional. Research topics. Amnesty for Confederates. Study carefully the provisions of the 14th Amendment in the appendix. MacDonald. Documentary Source Book of American History, pages 470 and 564. A Plea for Amnesty in Harding. Select Orations Illustrating American History, page 467 through 488. Political Conditions in the South in 1868. Dunning. Reconstruction. Political and Economic. American Nation Series. Pages 109 through 123. Hart. American History Told by Contemporaries. Volume 4. Pages 445 through 458. Page 497 through 500. Elson. History of the United States. Pages 799 through 805. Movement for White Supremacy. Dunning. Reconstruction. Pages 266 through 280. Paxson, The New Nation, Riverside Series, pages 39 through 58. Beard, American Government and Politics, pages 454 through 457. The Withdrawal of Federal Troops from the South. Sparks, National Development, American Nation Series, pages 84 through 102. Rhodes, History of the United States, Volumes 8, page 1 through 12. Southern Industry, Paxson, The New Nation, page 192 through 207. T.M. Young, The American Cotton Industry, pages 54 through 99. The Race Question, B.T. Washington, Up from Slavery, Sympathetic Presentation. A.H. Stone, Studies in the American Race Problems, Coldly Analytical, Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 4, pages 647 through 649, 652 through 654, 663 through 669. End of Chapter 16, recorded by Ben Wilford of Jackson, Tennessee.
Chapter Seventeen of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part Six: National Growth and World Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Von Ullman. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part Six: National Growth and World Politics, Chapter Seventeen. Chapter 17 Business Enterprise and the Republican Party If a single phrase be chosen to characterize American life during the generation that followed the age of Douglas and Lincoln, it must be business enterprise. The tremendous, irresistible energy of a virile people, mounting in numbers toward a hundred million, and applied without let or hindrance to the developing of natural resources of unparalleled richness. The chief goal of this effort was high profits for the captains of industry on the one hand, and high wages for the workers, on the other. Its signs, to use the language of a Republican orator in 1876, were golden harvest fields, whirling spindles, turning wheels, open furnace doors, flaming forges, and chimneys filled with eager fire. The device, blazoned on its shield and written over its factory doors, was prosperity. A Republican president was its advance agent. Released from the hampering interference of the southern planters, and the confusing issues of the slavery controversy, business enterprise sprang forward to the task of winning the entire country. Then it flung its outpost to the uttermost parts of the earth, Europe, Africa, and the Orient, where were to be found markets for American goods and natural resources for American capital to develop. Railway and Industry The Outward Signs of Enterprise it is difficult to comprehend all the multitudinous activities of American business energy or to appraise its effect upon the life and destiny of the American people, for beyond the horizon of the twentieth century lie consequences as yet undreamed of in our poor philosophy. Statisticians attempt to record its achievements in terms of miles of railway built, factories open, men and women employed, fortunes made, wages paid, cities founded, rivers spanned, boxes, bales, and tons produced. Historians apply standards of comparison with the past. Against the slow and leisurely stagecoach, they set the swift express, rushing from New York to San Francisco in less time than Washington consumed in his triumphal tour from Mount Vernon to New York for his first inaugural. Against the lazy sailing vessel, drifting before a genial breeze, they placed the turbine steamer crossing the Atlantic in five days, or the still swifter airplane in fifteen hours. For the old workshop where a master and dozen workmen and apprentices wrought by hand, they offer the giant factory where ten thousand persons attend the whirling wheels driven by steam. They write of the romance of invention and the captains of industry. The Service of the Railway All this is fitting in its way. Figures and contrasts cannot, however, tell the whole story. Take, for example, the extension of railways. It is easy to relate that there were 30,000 miles in 1860, 166,000 in 1890, and 202,000 in 1910. Is it easy to show, upon a map, how few straggling lines became a perfect mesh of closely knitted railways? Or how, like the tentacles of a great monster, the few roads ending in the Mississippi Mississippi Valley in 1860 were extended and multiplied until they tapped every wheat field, mine, and forest beyond the valley. All this, eloquent of enterprise as it truly is, does not reveal the significance of railways for American life. It does not indicate how railways made a continental market for American goods, nor how they standardized the whole country, giving to cities on the advancing frontier the leading features of cities in the Old East nor how they carried to the pioneer the comforts of civilization, nor yet how in the West they were the forerunners of civilization, the makers of homesteads, the builders of states. Government aid for railways. Still, the story is not ended. The significant relation between railways and politics must not be overlooked. The bounty of a lavish government, for example, made possible the work of railway promoters. By the year 1872, the federal government had granted a native railways 155 million acres of land, an area estimated as almost equal to Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. 
the Union Pacific Company alone secured from the federal government a free right-of-way through the public domain, twenty sections of land with each mile of railway, and a loan up to fifty millions of dollars secured by a second mortgage on the company's property. More than half of the northern tier of states lying against Canada, from Lake Michigan to the Pacific, was granted to private companies in aid of railways and wagon roads. About half of New Mexico, Arizona, and California was also given outright to railway companies. These vast grants from the federal government were supplemented by gifts from the states in land and by subscriptions amounting to more than $200 million. The history of these gifts and their relation to the political leaders that engineered them would alone fill a large and interesting volume. Railway Fortunes and Capital Out of this gigantic railway promotion, the first really immense American fortunes were made. Henry Adams, the grandson of John Quincy Adams, related that his grandfather on his mother's side, Peter Brooks, on his death in 1849, left a fortune of two million dollars, supposed to be the largest estate in Boston, then one of the few centers of great riches. Compared with the opulence that sprang out of the Union Pacific, the Northern Pacific, the Southern Pacific, with their subsidiary and component lines, the estate of Peter Brooks was a poor man's heritage. The capital invested in these railways was enormous beyond the imagination of the men of the stagecoach generation. The total debt of the United States incurred in the Revolutionary War, a debt which those of little faith thought the country could never pay, was reckoned at a figure well under $75 million. When the Union Pacific Railway Road was completed, there were outstanding against it $27 million in first mortgage bonds, $27 million in second mortgage bonds held by the government, $10 million in income bonds, ten million in land grant bonds, and on top of that huge bonded indebtedness, thirty six million in stock, making one hundred and ten million in all. If the amount due the United States government be subtracted, still there remained in private hands stocks and bonds exceeding in value the whole national debt of Hamilton's day, a debt that strained all the resources of the federal government in seventeen ninety. Such was the financial significance of the railways. Growth and Extension of Industry In the field of manufacturing, mining, and metalworking, the results of business enterprise far outstripped, if measured in mere dollars, the results of railway construction. By the end of the century, there were about $10 billion invested in factories alone, and 5 million wage earners employed in them, while the total value of the output, $14 billion, was 15 times the figure for 1860. In the eastern states, industries multiplied. In the Northwest Territory, the old home of Jacksonian democracy, they overtopped agriculture. By the end of the century, Ohio had almost reached, and Illinois had surpassed Massachusetts in the annual value of manufacturing output. That was not all. Untold wealth in the form of natural resources was discovered in the South and West. Coal deposits were found in the Appalachians, stretching from Pennsylvania down to Alabama, in Michigan, in the Mississippi Valley, and in western mountains from North Dakota to New Mexico. In nearly every coal-bearing region, iron was also discovered, and the great fields of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota soon rivaled those of the Appalachian area. Copper, lead, gold, and silver, in fabulous quantities, were unearthed by the restless prospectors who left no plain or mountain fastness unexplored. Petroleum, first pumped from the wells of Pennsylvania in the summer of 1859, made new fortunes equaling those of trade, railways, and land speculation. It scattered its riches with an especially lavish hand throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and California. The Trust, an instrument of industrial progress. Business enterprise, under the direction of powerful men working single-handed, or of small groups of men pulling their capital for one or more undertakings, had not advanced far before there appeared on the scene still mightier leaders of even greater imagination. New constructive genius now brought together and combined under one management hundreds of concerns or thousands of miles of railways, revealing the magic strength of cooperation on a national scale, price cutting in oil threatening ruin to those engaged in the industry as early as 1879 led a number of companies in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia to unite in price fixing. Three years later, a group of oil interests formed a close organization, placing all their stocks in the hands of trustees, among whom was John D. Rockefeller. The trustees, in turn, issued certificates representing the share to which each participant was entitled, and took over the management of the entire business. Such was the nature of the trust, 
which was to play such a unique role in the progress of America. The idea of combination was applied in time to iron and steel, copper, lead, sugar, cordage, coal, and other commodities, until in each field there loomed a giant trust or corporation, controlling, if not most of the output, at least enough to determine in a large measure the prices charged to consumers. With the passing years, the railways, mills, mines, and other business concerns were transferred from individual owners to corporations. At the end of the 19th century, the whole face of American business was changed. Three-fourths of the output from industries came from factories under corporate management, and only one-fourth from individual and partnership undertakings. The Banking Corporation Very closely related to the growth of business enterprise on a large scale was the system of banking. In the old days before banks, a person with savings either employed them in his own undertakings, lent them to a neighbor, or hid them away where they set no industry in motion. Even in the early stages of modern business, it was common for a manufacturer to rise from small beginnings by financing extensions out of his own earnings and profit. This state of affairs was profoundly altered by the growth of the huge corporations requiring millions and even billions of capital. The banks, once an adjunct to business, became the leaders in business. It was the banks that undertook to sell the stocks and bonds issued by new corporations and trusts, and to supply them with credit in order to carry out their operations. Indeed, many of the great mergers or combinations in business were initiated by magnates in the banking world with millions and billions under their control. Through their connections with one another, the banks formed a perfect network of agencies gathering up the pennies and dollars of the masses, as well as the thousands of the rich, and pouring them all into the channels of business and manufacturing. In this growth of banking on a national scale, it was inevitable that a few great centers, like Wall Street in New York or State Street in Boston, should rise to a position of dominance both in concentrating the savings and profits of the nation and in financing new as well as old corporations. The Significance of the Corporation The corporation, in fact, became the striking feature of American business life, one of the most marvelous institutions of all time, comparable in wealth and power and the number of its servants with kingdoms and states of old. The effect of its rise and growth cannot be summarily estimated, but some special facts are obvious. It made possible gigantic enterprises once entirely beyond the reach of any individual, no matter how rich. It eliminated many of the futile and costly wastes of competition in connection with manufacture, advertising, and selling. It studied the cheapest methods of production and shut down mills that were poorly equipped or disadvantageously located. It established laboratories for research in industry, chemistry, and mechanical inventions. Through the sale of stocks and bonds, it enabled tens of thousands of people to become capitalists, if only in a small way. The corporation made it possible for one person to own, for instance, a $50 share in a million-dollar business concern, a thing entirely impossible under regime of individual owners and partnerships. There was, of course, another side to the picture. Many of the corporations sought to become monopolies and to make profits, not by economies and good management, by extor but by extortion from purchasers. Sometimes they mercilessly crush small businessmen, their competitors, bribe members of legislatures to secure favorable laws, and contributed to the campaign funds of both leading parties. Wherever a trust approached the position of a monopoly, it acquired a dominance over the labor market, which enabled it to break even the strongest trade unions. In short, the power of the trust in finance, in manufacturing, in politics, and in the field of labor control can hardly be measured. THE CORPORATION AND LABOR In the development of the corporation there was to be observed a distinct severing of the old ties between master and workman, which existed in the days of small industries. For the personal bond between the owner and the employees was substituted a new relation. In most parts of our country, as President Wilson once said, men work not for themselves, not as partners in the old way in which they used to work, but generally as employees in a higher or lower grade of great corporations. The owner disappeared from the factory, and in his place came the manager, representing the usually invisible stockholders and dependent for his success upon his ability to make profits for the owners. Hence the term soulless corporation, which was to exert such a deep influence on American thinking about industrial relations. Cities and Immigration Expressed in terms of human life, this area of unprecedented enterprise meant huge industrial cities and an immense labor supply derived mainly from European immigrants. 
Here, too, figures tell only a part of the story. In Washington's day, nine-tenths of the American people were engaged in agriculture and lived in the country. In 1890, more than one-third of the population dwelt in towns of 2,500 and over. In 1920, more than half of the population lived in towns of over 2,500. In 40 years, between 1860 and 1900, Greater New York had grown from 1,174,000 to 3,437,000. San Francisco from 56,000 to 342,000, Chicago from 109,000 to 1,698,000. The miles of city tenements began to rival, in the number of their residents, the farm homesteads of the West. The time so dreaded by Jefferson had arrived. People were piled upon another in great cities, and the republic of small farmers had passed away. To these industrial centers flowed annually an ever-increasing tide of immigration, reaching the half-million point in 1880, rising to three-quarters of a million three years later, and passing the million mark in a single year at the opening of the new century. Immigration was as old as America, but new elements now entered the situation. In the first place, there were radical changes in the nationality of the newcomers. The migration from northern Europe, England, Ireland, Germany, and Scandinavia diminished. That from Italy, Russia, and Austria-Hungary increased more than three-fourths of the entire number coming from these three lands before, between the years of 1900 and 1910. These later immigrants were Italians, Poles, Mygars, Czechs, Slovaks, Russians, and Jews, who came from countries far removed from the languages and tradition of England, whence came the founders of America. In the second place, the reception accorded the newcomers differed from that given to immigrants in the early days. By 1890, all the free land was gone. They could not, therefore, be dispersed widely among the Native Americans to assimilate quickly and unconsciously the habits and ideas of American life. On the contrary, they were diverted mainly to industrial centers. There they crowded, nay, overcrowded, into colonies of their own where they preserved their languages, their newspapers, and their old world customs and views. So eager were the American businessmen to get an enormous labor supply that they asked few questions about the effect of this alien invasion upon the old America inherited from the fathers. They even stimulated invasion artificially by importing huge armies of foreigners under contract to work in specified mines and mills. There seemed to be no limit to the factories, forges, refineries, and railways that could be built, to the multitudes that could be employed in conquering a continent. As for the future, that was in the hands of Providence. Business Theories of Politics As the statesmen of Hamilton's school and the planters of Calhoun's had their theories of government and politics, so the leaders in business enterprise had theirs. It was simple and easily stated. It is the duty of the government, they urge, to protect American industry against foreign competition by means of high tariffs on imported goods, to aid railways by generous grants of land, to sell mineral and timber lands at low prices to energetic men ready to develop them, and then to leave the rest of the initiative and drive of indi individuals and companies. All government interference with the management, prices, rates, charges, and conduct of private business they held to be either wholly pernicious or intolerably impertinent. Judging from their speeches and writings, they conceived the nation as a great collection of individuals, companies, and labor unions, all struggling for profits or high wages, and held together by a government whose principal duty was to keep the peace among them, and protect industry against the foreign manufacturer. Such was the political theory of business during the generation that followed the Civil War. The Supremacy of the Republican Party, 1861 to 1885 Businessmen and Republican Policies most of the leaders in industry gravitated to the Republican ranks. They worked in the North, and the Republican Party was essentially Northern. It was, moreover, at least so far as the majority of its members were concerned, committed to protective tariffs, a sound monetary and banking system, the promotion of railways and industry by land grants, and the development of internal improvements. It was, furthermore, generous in its immigration policy. It proclaimed America to be an asylum for the oppressed of all countries, and flung wide the doors for immigrants eager to fill the factories, man the mines, and settle upon western lands. In a word, the Republicans stood for all those specific measures which favored the enlargement and prosperity of business. At the same time, they resisted government interference with private enterprise. They did not regulate railway rates, prosecute trusts for forming combinations, or prevent railway companies from giving com lower rates to some shippers than to others. To sum it up, the political theories of the Republican Party for three decades after the Civil War were the theories of American business, prosperous and profitable industries for the owners, 
and the full dinner pail for the workmen. Naturally, a large proportion of those who flourished under its policies gave their support to it, voted for its candidates, and subscribed to its campaign funds. Sources of Republican Strength in the North The Republican Party was, in fact, a political organization of singular power. It originated in a wave of moral enthusiasm. Having attracted to itself, if not the abolitionists, certainly all those idealists like James Russell Lowell and George William Curtis, who had opposed slavery when opposition was neither safe nor popular. To moral principles it added practical considerations. Business men had confidence in it. Working men who longed for the independence of the farmer owed to its indulgent land policy the opportunity of securing free homesteads in the West. The immigrant, landing penniless on these shores, as a result of the same beneficent system, often found himself in a little while with an estate as large as many a baronial domain in the old world. Under a Republican administration, the Union had been saved. To it, the veterans of the war could turn with confidence for those rewards of service which the government could bestow, pensions surpassing in liberality anything that the world had ever seen. Under a Republican administration, also the great debt had been created in the defense of the Union, and to the Republican Party, every investor in government bonds could look for the full and honorable discharge of the interest in principle. The spoils system, inaugurated by Jacksonian democracy, in turn placed all the federal offices in Republican hands, furnishing an army of party workers to be counted on for loyal service in every campaign. Of all these things, Republican leaders made full and vigorous use. Sometimes ascribing to the party, in accordance with ancient political usage, merits and achievements not wholly its own. Particularly was this true in the case of saving the Union. When in the economy of Providence this land was to be purged of human slavery, the Republican Party came to power, ran a declaration in one platform. The Republican Party suppressed a gigantic rebellion, emancipated four million slaves, decreed the equal citizenship of all, and established universal suffrage, ran another. As for the aid rendered by the millions of Northern Democrats who stood by the Union, and the tens of thousands of them who actually fought in the Union Army, the Republicans in their zeal were inclined to be oblivious. They repeatedly charged the Democratic Party with being the same in character and spirit as when it sympathized with treason. Republican Control of the South To the strength enjoyed in the North, the Republicans for a long time added advantages that came from control over the former Confederate states, where the newly enfranchised Negroes, under white leadership, gave a grateful support to the party responsible for their freedom. In this branch of politics, motives were so mixed that no historian can hope to appraise them all at their proper values. On the one side of the ledger must be set the vigorous efforts of the honest and sincere friends of the freedmen to win for them complete civil and political equality, wiping out not only slavery but all of its badges of misery and servitude. On the same side must be placed the labor of those who had valiantly fought in form and field to save the Union, and who regarded the continual Republican supremacy after the war was after the war as absolutely necessary to prevent the former leaders in a succession from coming back to power. At the same time, there were undoubtedly some of the baser sort who looked on politics as a game and who made use of carpetbagging in the South to win the spoils that might result from it. At all events, both by laws and presidential acts, the Republicans for many years kept a keen eye upon the maintenance of their dominion in the South. Their declaration that neither the law nor its administration should admit any discrimination in respect of citizens by reasons of race, color, or previous condition of servitude appealed to idealists and brought results in elections. Even South Carolina, where reposed the ashes of John C. Calhoun, went Republican in 1872 by a vote of three to one. Republican control was made easy by the force bills described in a previous chapter, measures which vested the supervision of elections in federal officers appointed by Republican presidents. These drastic measures, departing from American tradition, the Republican authors urged were necessary to safeguard the purity of the ballot, not merely in the South, where the timid freed man might readily be frightened from using it, but also in the North, particularly in New York City, where it was claimed that fraud was regularly practiced by Democratic leaders. The Democrats, on their side, indignantly denied the charges, replying that the force bills were nothing but devices created by the Republicans for the purpose of securing their continued rule through systematic interference with elections. Even the measures of Reconstruction were deemed by Democratic leaders as thinly veiled schemes to establish Republican party, power throughout the country. Nor is the slightest doubt, exclaims Samuel J. Tidden, 
spokesman of the Democrats in New York and candidate for president in 1876, that the paramount object and motive of the Republican Party is by these means to secure itself against a reaction of opinion adverse to it in our great populist northern commonwealths. When the Republican Party resolved to establish Negro supremacy in the ten states in order to gain it to itself the representation of those states in Congress, it had to begin by governing the people of those states by the sword. The next was the creation of new electoral bodies for those ten states, in which by exclusion, by disenfranchisements and prescriptions, by control over registration, by applying testos, by intimidation and by every form of influence, three million Negroes are made to predominate over four and a half million whites. The war as a campaign issue. Even the repeal of force bills could not allay the sectional feelings engendered by the war. The Republicans could not forgive the men who had so recently been in arms against the Union and insisted on calling them traitors and rebels. The Southerners, smarting under the Reconstruction Acts, could regard the Republicans only as political oppressors. The passions of the war had been too strong, the distress too deep to be soon forgotten. The generation that went through it all remembered it all. For twenty years the Republicans, in their speeches and platforms, made a straight appeal to the patriotism of the Northern voters. They maintained that their party, which had saved the Union and emancipated the slaves, was alone worthy of protecting the Union and uplifting the freedmen. Though the Democrats, especially in the North, resented this policy, and dubbed it with the expressive but inelegant phrase, waving the bloody shirt, the Republicans refused to surrender a slogan which made such a ready popular appeal. As late as 1884, a leader expressed the hope that they might wring one more president from the bloody shirt. They refused to let the country forget that the Democratic candidate, Grover Cleveland, had escaped military service by hiring a substitute, and they made political capital out of the fact that he had insulted the veterans of the Grand Army of the Republic by going fishing on Decoration Day. Three Republican Presidents Fortified by all these elements of strength, the Republican held the presidency from 1869 to 1885. The three presidents elected in this period, Grant, Hayes, and Garfield, had certain striking characteristics in common. They were all of humble origin, enough to please the most exacting Jacksonian Democrat. They had been generals in the Union Army. Grant, next to Lincoln, was regarded as the savior of the Constitution. Hayes and Garfield, though lesser lights in the military firmament, had honorable records duly appreciated by veterans of the war, now thoroughly organized into the Grand Army of the Republic. It is true that Grant was not a politician and had never voted the Republican ticket, but this was readily overlooked. Hayes and Garfield, on the other hand, were loyal party men. The former had served in Congress and for three terms as governor of his state. The latter had long been a member of the House of Representatives and was senator-elect when he received the nomination for president. All of them possessed, moreover, another important asset, which was not forgotten by the astute managers who led in selecting candidates. All of them were from Ohio, though Grant had been in Illinois when the summons to military duties came, and Ohio was a strategic state. It lay between the manufacturing east and the agrarian country to the west. Having growing industries and wool to sell, it benefited from the protective tariff. Yet, being mainly agricultural still, it was not without sympathy for the farmers who showed low tariff or free trade tendencies. Whatever share the East had in shaping laws and framing policies, it was clear that the West was to have the candidates. This division in privileges, not uncommon in political management, was always accompanied by a judicious selection of the candidate for vice president. With Garfield, for example, was associated a prominent New York politician, Chester A. Arthur, who, as fate decreed, was destined to more than three years' service as chief magistrate on the assassination of his superior in office. The Disputed Election of 1876 While taking note of the long years of Republican supremacy, it must be recorded that grave doubts exist in the minds of many historians as to whether one of the three presidents, Hayes, was actually the victor in 1876 or not. His Democratic opponent, Samuel J. Tilden, received a popular plurality of a quarter of a million, and had a plausible claim to a majority of the electoral vote. At all events, four states sent in double returns, one set for Tilden and another for Hayes, and a deadlock ensued. Both parties vehemently claimed the election, and the passions ran so high 
that sober men did not shrink from speaking of civil war again. Fortunately, in the end, the councils of peace prevailed. Congress provided for an electoral commission of fifteen men to review the contested returns. The Democrats, inspired by Tilden's moderation, accepted the judgment in favor of Hayes, even though they were not convinced that he was really entitled to the office. The Growth of Opposition to Republican Rule Abuses in American Political Life During their long tenure of office, the Republicans could not escape the inevitable consequences of power, that is, evil practices and corrupt conduct on the part of some who found shelter within the party. For that matter, neither did the Democrats manage to avoid such difficulties in those states and cities where they had the majority. In New York City, for instance, the local Democratic organization, known as Tammany Hall, passed under the sway of a group of politicians headed by Boss Tweed. He plundered the city treasury until public spirits and citizens, supported by Samuel J. Tilden, the Democratic leader of their state, rose in revolt, drove the ringleader from power, and sent him to jail. In Philadelphia, the local Republican bosses were guilty of offenses as odious as those committed by New York politicians. Indeed, the decade that followed the Civil War was marred by so many scandals in public life that one acute editor was moved to inquire, are not all the great communities of the Western world growing more corrupt as they grow in wealth? In the sphere of national politics, where the opportunities were greater, betrayals of public trust were even more flagrant. One revelation after another showed officers, high and low, possessed with the spirit of peculation. Members of Congress, it was found, accepted railway stock in exchange for votes in favor of land grants and other concessions to the companies. In the administration, as well as the legislature, the disease was rife. Revenue officers permitted whiskey distillers to evade their taxes and received heavy bribes in return. A probe into the post office department revealed the malodorous star route frauds delivered overpayment of certain mail carriers whose lines were indicated in the official record by asterisks or stars. Even cabinet officers did not escape suspicion, for the trail of the serpent led straight to the door of one of them. In the lower ranges of official life, the spoil system became more virulent as the number of federal employees increased. The holders of offices and the seekers after them constituted a ver veritable political army. They crowded into Republican councils, for the Republicans being in power could alone dispense federal favors. They, filed, they filled positions in the party ranging from the lowest township committee to the national convention. They helped to nominate candidates and draft platforms and elbowed to one side the busy citizen not conversant with party intrigues who could only give an occasional day to political matters. Even the Civil Service Act of 1883, wrung from a reluctant Congress two years after the assassination of Garfield, made little change for a long time. It took away from the spoilsmen a few thousand government positions, but it formed no check on the practice of rewarding party workers from the public treasury. On viewing this state of affairs, many a distinguished citizen became proud, profoundly discouraged. James Russell Lowell, for example, thought he saw a steady decline in public morals. In 1865, hearing of Lee's surrender, he had exclaimed, There is something magnificent in having a country to love. Ten years later, when asked to write an ode for the centennial, in Philadelphia in 1876, he could think only of abiding satire on the nation. Show your state legislatures, show your rings, and challenge Europe to produce such things as high officials sitting half in sight to share the plunder and fix things right. If that don't fetch her, why you need only to show your latest style in martyrs, Tweed, she'll find it hard to hide her spiteful tears at such advance in one poor hundred years. When his critics condemned him for this attack upon his native land, Lowell replied in sadness, These fellows have no notion of what love of country means. It was in my very blood and bones, if I am not an American who ever was. What fills me with doubt and despair is the degradation of the moral tone. Is it, or is it not, a result of democracy? Is ours a government of the people, by the people, for the people? Or a cacistocracy, a government of the worst? rather than for the benefit of knaves at the cost of fools. The Reform Movement in Republican Ranks The sentiment is expressed by Lowell, himself a Republican and for a time American ambassador to England, was shared by many men in his party. Very soon after the close of the Civil War, some of them began to pro protest vigorously against the policies and conduct of their leaders. In 1872, the dissenters, calling themselves liberal Republicans, broke away altogether nominated a candidate of their own, Horace Greeley, 
and put forward a platform indicting the Republican president fiercely enough to please the most uncompromising Democrat. They accused Grant of using the powers and opportunities of his high office for the promotion of personal ends. They charged him with retaining notoriously corrupt and otherworthy men in places of power and responsibility. They alleged that the Republican Party kept alive the passions and resentments of the late Civil War to use them for their own advantage, and employed the public service of the government as a machinery of corruption and personal influence. It was not apparent, however, from the ensuing election that any considerable number of Republicans accepted the views of the liberals. Greeley, though endorsed by the Democrats, was utterly routed and died of a broken heart. The lesson of his discomfiture seemed to be that independent action was futile. So at least it was regarded by most men of the rising generation like Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts and Theodore Roosevelt of New York. Profiting by the experience of Greeley, they insisted in season and out that reformers who desired to rid the party of abuses should remain loyal to it and do their work on the inside. The Mugwumps and Cleveland Democracy in 1884 Though aided by Republican dissensions, the Democrats were slow in making headway against the political current. They were deprived of the energetic and capable leadership once afforded by the planters, like Calhoun, Davis, and Toombs. They were saddled by their opponents with responsibility for secession, and they were stripped of the support of the prostate South. Not until the last Southern state was restored to the Union, not until a general amnesty was wrung from Congress, not until white supremacy was established at the polls, and the last federal soldier withdrawn from the southern capitals, did they succeed in capturing the presidency. The opportune moment for them came in 1884, when a number of circumstances favored their aspirations. The Republicans, leaving the Ohio Valley in search of a candidate, nominated James G. Blaine of Maine, a vigorous and popular leader, but a man under fire from the reformers in his own party. The Democrats, on their side, were able to find at this juncture an able candidate who had no political enemies in the sphere of national politics, Grover Cleveland, then governor of New York and widely celebrated as a man of sterling honesty. At the same time, a number of dissatisfied Republicans openly espoused the Democratic cause, among them Carl Schurz, George Willem Curtis, Henry Ward Beecher, and William Everett, men of fine ideals and undoubted integrity. Though regular Republicans called them mugwumps and laughed at them as the men milners, the Delantitai, the carpet knights of politics, they had a following that was not to be despised. The campaign which took place that year was one of the most savage in American history. Issues were thrust into the background. The tariff, though mentioned, was not taken seriously. Abuse of the opposition was the favorite resource of party orators. The Democrats insisted that the Republican Party, so far as principle is concerned, is a reminiscence. In practice, it is an organization for enriching those whose control its machinery. For the Republican candidate, Blaine, they could hardly find words to express their contempt. The Republicans retaliated in kind. They praised their own good works, as of old, in saving the Union, and denounced the fraud and violence practiced by the democracy in the southern states. Seeing little objectionable in the public record of Cleveland as mayor of Buffalo and governor of New York, they attacked his personal character. Perhaps never in the history of political campaigns did the discussions on the platform and in the press sink to so low a level. Decent people were sickened. Even hot partisans shrank from their own words when, after the election, they had time to reflect on their heedless passions. Moreover, nothing was decided by the balloting. Cleveland was elected, but his victory was a narrow one. A change of a few hundred votes in New York would have sent his opponent to the White House instead. Changing Political Fortunes, 1888 to 1896 After the Democrats had settled down to the enjoyment of their hard-earned victory, President Grover Cleveland, in his message of 1887, attacked the tariff as vicious, inequitable, and illogical, as a system of taxation that laid a burden upon every consumer in the land for the benefit of our manufacturers. Business enterprise was thoroughly alarmed. The Republicans characterized the tariff message as a free trade assault upon the industries of the country. Mainly on that issue, they elected in 1888 Benjamin Harrison of Indiana, a shrewd lawyer, a reticent politician, a descendant of the hero of Tippecanoe, and a son of the Old Northwest. Accepting the outcome of the election as a vindication of their principles, the Republicans, under the leadership of William McKinney in the House of Representatives, enacted in 1890 a tariff law imposing the highest duties that laid in our history. To their utter surprise, however, they were instantly informed by the country that their program was not approved. That very autumn they lost in the congressional elections, and two years later they were decisively beaten in the presidential campaign, Cleveland once more leading his party to victory. References 
L. H. Haney, Congressional History of Railways, two volumes. J. P. Davis, Union Pacific Railway. J. M. Swank, History of the Manufacture of Iron. M. T. Copeland, The Cotton Manufacturing Industry in the United States, Harvard Studies. E. W. Bryce, Progress of Invention in the Nineteenth Century. Ida Tarbell, History of the Standard Oil Company, Critical. G. H. Montague, Rise and Progress of the Standard Oil Company, Friendly. H. V. Fairchild, Immigration. And F. J. Wayne, Immigra The Immigrant Invasion, Both Works Favor Exclusion. I. A. Hourwich, Immigration, Against Exclusionist Policies. J. F. Rhodes, History of the United States, 1877 to 1896, Volume 8. Edward Stanwood, A History of the Presidency, Volume 1, for the Presidential Elections of the Period. Questions. Contrast the state of industry and commerce at the close of the Civil War with its condition at the close of the Revolutionary War. 2. Enumerate the services rendered to the nation by the railways. 3. Explain the peculiar relation of railways to government. 4. What sections of the country have been industrialized? 5. How do you account for the rise and growth of the trusts? Exclaim some of the economic advantages of the trust. 6. Are the people in cities more or less independent than the farmers? What was Jefferson's view? 7. State some of the problems re raised by unrestricted immigration. 8. What was the theory of the relation of government to businesses in this period? Has it changed in recent times? 9. State the leading economic policies sponsored by the Republican Party. 10. Why were the Republicans especially strong immediately after the Civil War? 11. What illustrations can you give showing the influence of war in American political campaigns? 12. Account for the strength of Middle Western candidates. 13. Enumerate some of the abuses that appeared in American political life after 1865. 14. Sketch the rise and growth of the reform movement. 15. How is the fluctuating state of public opinion reflected in the elections from 1880 to 1896? Research Topics Invention, Discovery, and Transformation Sparks, National Development, American Nation Series Page 37-67 to 67. Bogart Economic History of the United States, Chapters 21, 22, and 23. Business and Politics. Paxson, The New Nation, Riverside Series, page 92 to 107. Rhodes, History of the United States, Volume 7, pages 1 through 29, 64 through 73, 175 through 206. Wilson, History of the American People, Volume 4, page 78 through 96. Immigration. Coleman, Industrial History of the United States, 2nd edition, page 369 to 374. E.L. Bogart, Economic History of the United States, pages 420 to 422, 434 to 437. Jenks and Lauk, Immigration Problems, Commons, Race and Immigrants. The Disputed Elections of 1876. Haworth, The United States in Our Own Time, pages 82 to 94. Dunning, Reconstruction, Political and Economic, American Nation Series, pages 294 to 341. Elson, History of the United States, pages 835 to 841. Abuses in Political Life, Dunning, Reconstruction, pages 281 to 293. See Criticisms in Party Platforms in Stanwood, History of the Presidency, Volume 1. Bryce, American Commonwealth, 1910 edition, Volume 2, pages 379 through 448 and 136 through 167. Studies of Presidential Administrations. A. Grant, B. Hayes, C. Garfield Arthur, D. Cleveland, and E. Harrison in Hayworth. The United States in Our Own Time, or in Paxson, the New Nation, Riverside Series, or, still more briefly, in Elson. Cleveland Democracy. Hayworth, United States, pages 164 to 183. Rhodes, History of the United States, Volume 8, pages 240 to 327. Elson, page... 857 to 887. Analysis of Modern Immigration Problems, Syllabus in History, New York State, 1919, pages 110 to 112. End of Chapter 17. Recording by Von Ullman. V O N S T A K E S. Dot blogspot. Dot com.
Chapter 18 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 6, National Growth and World Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 6, National Growth and World Politics. Chapter 18. The Development of the Great West At the close of the Civil War, Kansas and Texas were sentinel states on the middle border. Beyond the Rockies, California, Oregon, and Nevada stood guard, the last of them having been just admitted to furnish another vote for the 15th Amendment abolishing slavery. Between the near and far frontiers lay a vast reach of plain, desert, plateau, and mountain, almost wholly undeveloped a broad domain extending from Canada to Mexico, and embracing the regions now included in Washington, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, the Dakotas, and Oklahoma, had fewer than half a million inhabitants. It was laid out into territories, each administered under a governor appointed by the President and Senate, and, as soon as there was the requisite number of inhabitants, a legislature elected by the voters. No railway line stretched across the desert. St. Joseph on the Missouri was the terminus of the eastern lines. It required twenty-five days for a passenger to make the overland journey to California by the stagecoach system, established in 1858, and more than ten days for the Swift Pony Express, organized in 1860, to carry a letter to San Francisco. Indians still roamed the plain and desert, and more than one powerful tribe disputed the white man's title to the soil. The Railways as Trailblazers Opening Railways to the Pacific A decade before the Civil War, the importance of rail connection between the East and the Pacific Coast had been recognized. Pressure had already been brought to bear on Congress to authorize the construction of a line and to grant land and money in its aid. Both the Democrats and Republicans approved the idea, but it was involved in the slavery controversy. Indeed, it was submerged in it. Southern statesmen wanted connections between the Gulf and the Pacific through Texas, while Northerners stood out for a central route. The North had its way during the war. Congress, by legislation initiated in 1862, provided for the immediate organization of companies to build a line from the Missouri River to California, and made grants of land and loans of money to aid in the enterprise. The western end, the Central Pacific, was laid out under the supervision of Leland Stanford. It was heavily financed by the Mormons of Utah, and also by the state government, the ranchmen, miners, and businessmen of California, and it was built principally by Chinese labor. The eastern end, the Union Pacific, starting at Omaha, was constructed mainly by veterans of the Civil War and immigrants from Ireland and Germany. In 1869, the two companies met near Ogden in Utah, and the driving of the last spike, uniting the Atlantic and the Pacific, was the occasion of a great demonstration. Other lines to the Pacific were projected at the same time but the panic of 1873 checked railway enterprise for a while. With the revival of prosperity at the end of that decade, construction was renewed with vigor, and the year 1883 marked a series of railway triumphs. In February, trains were running from New Orleans through Houston, San Antonio, and Yuma to San Francisco as a result of a union of the Texas Pacific with the Southern Pacific and its subsidiary corporations. In September, the last spike was driven in the northern Pacific at Helena, Montana. Lake Superior was connected with Puget Sound. The waters explored by Joliet and Marquette were joined to the waters plowed by Sir Francis Drake while he was searching for a route around the world. That same year also, a third line was opened to the Pacific by way of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, making connections through Albuquerque and Needles with San Francisco. The fondest hopes of railway promoters seemed to be realized. Western Railways Precede Settlement In the Old World and on our Atlantic seaboard, railways followed population and markets. 
in the far west railways usually preceded the people railway builders planned cities on paper before they laid tracks connecting them they sent missionaries to spread the gospel of western opportunity to people in the middle west in the eastern cities and in southern states then they carried their enthusiastic converts bag and baggage in long trains to the distant dakotas and still farther afield so the development of the far west was not left to the tedious processes of time it was pushed by men of imagination adventurers who made a romance of money-making and who had dreams of empire unequalled by many kings of the past these empire builders bought railway lands in huge tracts they got more from the government they overcame every obstacle of canyon mountain and stream with the aid of science they built cities according to the plans made by the engineers having the towns ready and railway and steamboat connections formed with the rest of the world they carried out the people to use the railways the steamships the houses and the land it was in this way that quote, the frontier speculator paved the way for the frontier agriculturalist who had to be near a market before he could farm end quote. the spirit of this imaginative enterprise which laid out railways and towns in advance of the people is seen in an advertisement of that day quote, this extension will run forty-two miles from york northeast through the island lake country and will have five good north dakota towns the stations on the line will be well equipped with elevators and will be constructed and ready for operation at the commencement of the grain season prospective merchants have been active in securing desirable locations at the different towns on the line there are still opportunities for hotels general merchandise hardware furniture and drug stores etc End quote. among the railway promoters and builders in the west james j hill of the great northern and allied lines was one of the most forceful figures he knew that tracks and trains were useless without passengers and freight without a population of farmers and town dwellers he therefore organized publicity in the virginias iowa ohio indiana illinois wisconsin and nebraska especially he sent out agents to tell the story of western opportunity in this vein quote, you see your children come out of school with no chance to get farms of their own because the cost of land in your older part of the country is so high that you can't afford to buy land to start your sons out in life around you they have to go to the cities to make a living or become laborers in the mills or hire out as farm hands there is no future for them there if you are doing well where you are and can safeguard the future of your children and see them prosper around you don't leave here but if you want independence if you are renting your land if the money lender is carrying you along and you are running behind year after year you can do no worse by moving you farmers talk of free trade and protection and what this or that political party will do for you why don't you vote a homestead for yourself that is the only thing uncle sam will ever give you jim hill hasn't an acre of land to sell you we are not in the real estate business we don't want you to go out west and make a failure of it because the rates at which we haul you and your goods make the first transaction a loss we must have landless men for a manless land End quote. unlike steamship companies stimulating immigration to get the fares hill was seeking permanent settlers who would produce manufacture and use the railways as a means of exchange consequently he fixed low rates and let his passengers take a good deal of livestock and household furniture free by doing this he made an appeal that was answered by eager families in eighteen ninety four the vanguard of home seekers left indiana in fourteen passenger coaches filled with men women and children and forty-eight freight cars carrying their household goods and livestock in the ten years that followed one hundred thousand people from the middle west and the south responding to his call went to the western country where they brought eight million acres of prairie land under cultivation when hill got his people on the land he took an interest in everything that increased the productivity of their labor was the output of food for his freight cars limited by bad drainage on the farms hill then interested himself in practical ways of ditching and tiling 
were farmers hampered in hauling their goods to his trains by bad roads in that case he urged upon the states the improvement of highways did the traffic slacken because the food shipped was not of the best quality then livestock must be improved and scientific farming promoted did the farmers need credit banks must be established close at hand to advance it in all conferences on scientific farm management conservation of natural resources banking and credit in relation to agriculture and industry hill was an active participant his was the long vision seeing in conservation and permanent improvements the foundation of prosperity for the railways and the people indeed he neglected no opportunity to increase the traffic on the lines he wanted no empty cars running in either direction and no wheat stored in warehouses for the lack of markets so he looked to the orient as well as to europe as an outlet for the surplus of the farms he sent agents to china and japan to discover what american goods and produce those countries would consume and what manufactures they had to offer to americans in exchange to open the pacific trade he bought two ocean monsters the minnesota and the dakota thus preparing for emergencies west as well as east when some japanese came to the united states on their way to europe to buy steel rails hill showed them how easy it was for them to make their purchase in this country and ship by way of american railways and american vessels so the railway builder and promoter who helped to break the virgin soil of the prairies lived through the pioneer epoch and into the age of great finance before he died he saw the wheat fields of north dakota linked with the spinning jennies of manchester and the docks of yokohama the evolution of grazing and agriculture the removal of the indians unlike the frontier of new england in colonial days or of kentucky later the advancing lines of home builders in the far west had little difficulty with warlike natives indian attacks were made on the railway construction gangs general custer had his fatal battle with the sioux in 1876 and there were minor brushes but they were all of relatively slight consequence the former practice of treating with the indians as independent nations was abandoned in 1871 and most of them were concentrated in reservations where they were mainly supported by the government the supervision of their affairs was vested in a board of commissioners created in 1869 and instructed to treat them as wards of the nation, a trust which unfortunately was often betrayed. A further step in Indian policy was taken in 1887, when provision was made for issuing lands to individual Indians, thus permitting them to become citizens and settle down among their white neighbors as farmers or cattle raisers. The disappearance of the buffalo, the main food supply of the wild Indians, had made them more tractable and more willing to surrender the freedom of the hunter for the routine of the reservation, ranch, or wheat field. The Cowboy and Cattle Ranger Between the frontier of farms and the mountains were plains and semi-arid regions in vast reaches suitable for grazing. As soon as the railways were open into the Missouri Valley, affording an outlet for stock, there sprang up to the westward cattle and sheep raising on an immense scale the far-famed american cowboy was the hero in this scene great herds of cattle were bred in texas with the advancing spring and summer seasons they were driven northward across the plains and over the buffalo trails in a single year eighteen eighty four it is estimated that nearly one million head of cattle were moved out of texas to the north by four thousand cowboys supplied with thirty thousand horses and ponies during the two decades from 1870 to 1890, both the cattlemen and the sheep raisers had an almost free run of the plains, using public lands without paying for the privilege and waging war on one another over the possession of ranges. At length, however, both had to go, as the homesteaders and land companies came and fenced in the plain and desert with endless lines of barbed wire. Already in 1893, a writer familiar with the frontier lamented the passing of the picturesque days. Quote, the unique position of the cowboys among the Americans is jeopardized in a thousand ways. Towns are growing up on their pasture lands, 
irrigation schemes of a dozen sorts threaten to turn bunch grass scenery into farmland views. Farmers are preempting valleys and the sides of waterways. And the day is not far distant when stock raising must be done mainly in small herds with winter corrals, and then the cowboy's days will end. Even now his condition disappoints those who knew him only half a dozen years ago. His breed seems to have deteriorated, and his ranks are filling with men who work for wages rather than for the love of the free life and bold companionship that once tempted men into that calling. Splendid Cheyenne saddles are less and less numerous in the outfits. The distinctive hat that made its way up from Mexico may or may not be worn. All the civil authorities in nearly all towns in the grazing country forbid the wearing of sidearms. Nobody shoots up these towns any more. The fact is, the old Simon pure cowboy days are gone already. End quote. Settlement under the Homestead Act of 1862 Two factors gave a special stimulus to the rapid settlement of the western lands which swept away the Indians and the cattle rangers. The first was the policy of the railway companies in selling large blocks of land received from the government at low prices to induce immigration. The second was the operation of the Homestead Law passed in 1862. This measure practically closed the long controversy over the disposition of the public domain that was suitable for agriculture. It provided for granting, without any cost save a small registration fee, public lands in lots of 160 acres each to citizens and aliens who declared their intention of becoming citizens. The one important condition attached was that the settler should occupy the farm for five years before his title was finally confirmed. Even this stipulation was waived in the case of the Civil War veterans, who were allowed to count their term of military service as a part of the five years' occupancy required. As the soldiers of the Revolutionary and Mexican Wars had advanced in great numbers to the frontier in earlier days, so now veterans led in the settlement of the middle border. Along with them went thousands of German, Irish, and Scandinavian immigrants, fresh from the old world. Between 1867 and 1874, 27 million acres were staked out in quarter-section farms. In 20 years, 1860 to 1880, the population of Nebraska leaped from 28,000 to almost half a million, Kansas from 100,000 to a million, Iowa from 600,000 to 1,600,000, and the Dakotas from 5,000 to 140,000. The Diversity of Western Agriculture in soil, produce, and management, western agriculture presented many contrasts to that of the east and south. In the region of arable and watered lands, the typical American unit, the small farm tilled by the owner, appeared as usual, but by the side of it many a huge domain owned by foreign or eastern companies and tilled by hired labor. Sometimes the great estate took the shape of the bonanza farm devoted mainly to wheat and corn and cultivated on a large scale by machinery. Again it assumed the form of the cattle ranch embracing tens of thousands of acres. Again it was a vast holding of diversified interest, such as the Santa Anita Ranch near Los Angeles, a domain of 60,000 acres, quote, cultivated in a glorious sweep of vineyards and orange and olive orchards, rich sheep and cattle pastures and horse ranches, their life and customs handed down from the Spanish owners of the various ranches which were swept into one estate. End quote. Irrigation. In one respect, agriculture in the far west was unique. In a large area spreading through eight states, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of adjoining states, the rainfall was so slight that the ordinary crops to which the American farmer was accustomed could not be grown at all. The Mormons were the first Anglo-Saxons to encounter aridity, and they were baffled at first. But they studied it and mastered it by magnificent irrigation systems. As other settlers poured into the West, the problem of the desert was attacked with a will, some of them replying to the commiseration of Eastern farmers, by saying that it was easier to scoop out an irrigation ditch than to cut forests and wrestle with stumps and stones. 
private companies bought immense areas at low prices, built irrigation works, and disposed of their lands in small plots. Some ranchers with an instinct for water, like that of the miner for metal, sank wells into the dry sand and were rewarded with gushers that, quote, soused the thirsty desert and turned its good-for-nothing sand into good-for-anything loam, end quote. The federal government came to the aid of the arid regions in 1894 by granting lands to the states to be used for irrigation purposes. In this work, Wyoming took the lead with a law which induced capitalists to invest in irrigation and at the same time provided for the sale of the redeemed lands to actual settlers. Finally, in 1902, the federal government, by its Liberal Reclamation Act, added its strength to that of individuals, companies, and states in conquering arid America. Nowhere, writes Powell, a historian of the West, in his picturesque End of the Trail, quote, has the white man fought a more courageous fight or won a more brilliant victory than in Arizona. His weapons have been the transit and the level, the drill and the dredge, the pick and the spade. And the enemy which he has conquered has been the most stubborn of all foes, the hostile forces of nature. The story of how the white man within the space of less than thirty years penetrated, explored, and mapped this almost unknown region, of how he carried law, order, and justice into a section which had never had so much as a speaking acquaintance with any one of the three before, of how, realizing the necessity for means of communication, he built highways of steel across this territory from east to west and from north to south, of how, undismayed by the savageness of the countenance which the desert turned upon him, he laughed and rolled up his sleeves and spat upon his hands and slashed the face of the desert with canals and irrigating ditches and filled those ditches with water brought from deep in the earth or high in the mountains and of how, in the conquered and submissive soil, he replaced the aloe with alfalfa, the mesquite with maize, the cactus with cotton, forms one of the most inspiring chapters in our history. It is one of the epics of civilization, this reclamation of the Southwest, and its heroes, thank God, are Americans. Other desert regions have been redeemed by irrigation, Egypt, for example, and Mesopotamia and parts of the Sudan, but the people of all these regions lay stretched out in the shade of a convenient palm, metaphorically speaking, and waited for someone with more energy than themselves to come along and do the work. But the Arizonians, mindful of the fact that God, the government, and Carnegie helped those who helped themselves, spent their days wielding the pick and shovel, and their evenings in writing letters to Washington with toil-hardened hands. After a time the government was prodded into action, and the great dams at Laguna and Roosevelt are the result. Then the people, organizing themselves into cooperative leagues and water users' associations, took up the work of reclamation where the government left off. It is to these energetic, persevering men who have drilled wells, plowed fields, and dug ditches through the length and breadth of that great region which stretches from Yuma to Tucson that the metamorphosis of Arizona is due. End quote. The effect of irrigation, wherever introduced, was amazing. Stretches of sand and sagebrush gave way to fertile fields bearing crops of wheat, corn, fruits, vegetables, and grass. Huge ranches grazed by browsing sheep were broken up into small plots. The cowboy and ranchmen vanished. In their place rose the prosperous community, a community unlike the township of Iowa or the industrial center of the East. Its intensive tillage left little room for hired labor. Its small holdings drew families together in village life rather than dispersing them on the lonely plain. Often the development of water power in connection with irrigation afforded electricity for labor-saving devices and lifted many a burden that in other ways fell heavily upon the shoulders of the farmer and his family. Mining and Manufacturing in the West Mineral Resources In another important particular, the Far West differed from the Mississippi Valley states. That was in the predominance of mining over agriculture throughout a vast section. Indeed, it was the minerals rather than the land that attracted the pioneers who first opened the country. 
the discovery of gold in California in 1848, was the signal for the great rush of prospectors, miners, and promoters who explored the valleys, climbed the hills, washed the sands, and dug up the soil in their feverish search for gold, silver, copper, coal, and other minerals. In Nevada and Montana, the development of mineral resources went on all during the Civil War. Alder Gulch became Virginia City in 1863. Last Chance Gulch was named Helena in 1864. The Confederate Gulch was christened Diamond City in 1865. At Butte, the miners began operations in 1864, and within five years had washed out eight million dollars worth of gold. Under the gold they found silver, under the silver they found copper. Even at the end of the 19th century, after agriculture was well advanced and stock and sheep raising introduced on a large scale, minerals continued to be the chief source of wealth in a number of states. This was revealed by the figures for 1910. The gold, silver, iron, and copper of Colorado were worth more than the wheat, corn, and oats combined. The copper of Montana sold for more than all the cereals and four times the price of the wheat. The interest of Nevada was also mainly mining, the receipts from the mineral output being $43 million, or more than one-half the national debt of Hamilton's day. The yield of the mines of Utah was worth four or five times the wheat crop. The coal of Wyoming brought twice as much as the great wool clip. The minerals of Arizona were totaled at $43 million, as against a wool clip reckoned at $1,200,000, while in Idaho alone of this group of states did the wheat crop exceed in value the output of the mines. Timber Resources The forests of the Great West, unlike those of the Ohio Valley, proved a boon to the pioneers rather than a foe to be attacked. In Ohio and Indiana, for example, the frontier line of homemakers had to cut, roll, and burn thousands of trees before they could put out a crop of any size. Beyond the Mississippi, however, there were already for the breaking plow great reaches of almost treeless prairie, where every stick of timber was precious. In the other parts, often rough and mountainous, where stood primeval forests of the finest woods, the railroads made good use of the timber. They consumed acres of forests themselves in making ties, bridge timbers, and telegraph poles, and they laid a heavy tribute upon the forests for their annual upkeep. The surplus trees, such as had burdened the pioneers of the Northwest Territory a hundred years before, they carried off to markets on the east and west coasts. Western Industries the peculiar conditions of the far west stimulated a rise of industries more rapid than is usual in new country. The mining activities which in many sections preceded agriculture called for sawmills to furnish timber for the mines and smelters to reduce and refine ores. The ranches supplied sheep and cattle for the packing houses of Kansas City as well as Chicago. The waters of the northwest afforded salmon for 4,000 cases in 1866, and for 1,400,000 cases in 1916. The fruits and vegetables of California brought into existence innumerable canneries. The lumber industry, starting with crude sawmills to furnish rough timbers for railways and mines, ended in specialized factories for paper, boxes, and furniture. As the railways preceded settlement and furnished a ready outlet for local manufacturers, so they encouraged the early establishment of varied industries, thus creating a state of affairs quite unlike that which obtained in the Ohio Valley in the early days before the opening of the Erie Canal. Social Effects of Economic Activities In many respects, the social life of the Far West also differed from that of the Ohio Valley. The treeless prairies, though open to homesteads, favored the great estate tilled in part by tenant labor, and in part by migratory seasonal labor, summoned from all sections of the country for the harvests. The mineral resources created hundreds of huge fortunes, which made the accumulations of eastern mercantile families look trivial by comparison. Other millionaires won their fortunes in the railway business, and still more from the cattle and sheep ranges. In many sections, the cattle king, as he was called, was as dominant as the planter had been in the Old South. 
everywhere in the grazing country he was a conspicuous and important person. He, quote, sometimes invested money in banks, in railroad stocks, or in city property. He had his rating in the commercial reviews, and could hobnob with bankers, railroad presidents, and metropolitan merchants. He attended party caucuses and conventions, ran for the state legislature, and sometimes defeated a lawyer or metropolitan businessman in the race for a seat in Congress. In proportion to their numbers, the ranchers have constituted a highly impressive class. End quote. Although many of the early capitalists of the Great West, especially from Nevada, spent their money principally in the East, others took leadership in promoting the sections in which they had made their fortunes. A railroad pioneer, General Palmer, built his home at Colorado Springs, founded the town, and encouraged local improvements. Denver owed its first impressive buildings to the civic patriotism of Horace Tabor, a wealthy mine owner. Leland Stanford paid his tribute to California in the endowment of a large university. Colonel W. F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, started his career by building a boom town which collapsed and made a large sum of money supplying buffalo meat to construction hands, hence his popular name. By his famous Wild West show, he increased it to a fortune which he devoted mainly to the promotion of a western reclamation scheme. While the Far West was developing this vigorous, aggressive leadership in business, a considerable industrial population was springing up. Even the cattle ranges and hundreds of farms were conducted like factories in that they were managed through overseers who hired plowmen, harvesters, and cattlemen at regular wages. At the same time there appeared other peculiar features which made a lasting impression on Western economic life. Mining, lumbering, and fruit growing, for instance, employed thousands of workers during the rush months and turned them out at other times. The inevitable result was an army of migratory laborers wandering from camp to camp, from town to town, and from ranch to ranch, without fixed homes or established habits of life. From this extraordinary condition there issued many a long and lawless conflict between capital and labor, giving a distinct color to the labor movement in whole sections of the mountain and coast states. The Admission of New States The Spirit of Self-Government The instinct of self-government was strong in the western communities. In the very beginning, it led to the organization of volunteer committees, known as vigilantes, to suppress crime and punish criminals. As soon as enough people were settled permanently in a region, they took care to form a more stable kind of government. An illustration of this process is found in the Oregon Compact made by the pioneers in 1843, the spirit of which is reflected in an editorial in an old copy of the Rocky Mountain News. Quote, we claim that any body or community of American citizens which from any cause or under any circumstances is cut off from, or from isolation is so situated as not to be under any active and protecting branch of the central government, have a right, if on American soil, to frame a government and enact such laws and regulations as may be necessary for their own safety, protection, and happiness, always with the condition precedent that they shall, at the earliest moment when the central government shall extend an effective organization and laws over them, give it their unqualified support and obedience. End quote. People who turned so naturally to the organization of local administration were equally eager for admission to the Union as soon as any shadow of a claim to statehood could be advanced. As long as a region was merely one of the territories of the United States, the appointment of the governor and other officers was controlled by politics at Washington. Moreover, the disposition of land, mineral rights, forests, and water power was also in the hands of national leaders. Thus practical considerations were united with the spirit of independence in the quest for local autonomy. Nebraska and Colorado Two states, Nebraska and Colorado, had little difficulty in securing admission to the Union. The first, Nebraska, had been organized as a territory by the famous Kansas-Nebraska Bill, which did so much to precipitate the Civil War. Lying to the north of Kansas, which had been admitted in 1861, it escaped the invasion of slave owners from Missouri, 
and was settled mainly by farmers from the north. Though it claimed a population of only 67,000, it was regarded with kindly interest by the Republican Congress at Washington, and, reduced to its present boundaries, it received the coveted statehood in 1867. This was hardly accomplished before the people of Colorado to the southwest began to make known their demands. They had been organized under territorial government in 1861 when they numbered only a handful, but within ten years the aspect of their affairs had completely changed. The silver and gold deposits of the Leadville and Cripple Creek regions had attracted an army of miners and prospectors. The city of Denver, founded in 1858 and named after the governor of Kansas, whence came many of the early settlers, had grown from a straggling camp of log huts into a prosperous center of trade. By 1875 it was reckoned that the population of the territory was not less than 100,000. The following year Congress, yielding to the popular appeal, made Colorado a member of the American Union. Six New States, 1889-1890 to 1890. For many years there was a deadlock in Congress over the admission of new states. The spell was broken in 1889 under the leadership of the Dakotas. For a long time the Dakota Territory, organized in 1861, had been looked upon as the home of the powerful Sioux Indians whose enormous reservation blocked the advance of the frontier. The discovery of gold in the Black Hills, however, marked their doom. Even before Congress could open their lands to prospectors, pioneers were swarming over the country. Farmers from the adjoining Minnesota and the eastern states, Scandinavians, Germans, and Canadians, came in swelling waves to occupy the fertile Dakota lands, now famous even as far away as the fjords of Norway. Seldom had the plow of man cut through richer soil, and was found in the bottoms of the Red River Valley, and it became all the more precious when the opening of the Northern Pacific in 1883 afforded a means of transportation east and west. The population, which had numbered 135,000 in 1880, passed the half-million mark before ten years had elapsed. Remembering that Nebraska had been admitted with only 67,000 inhabitants, the Dakotans could not see why they should be kept under federal tutelage. At the same time, Washington, far away on the Pacific coast, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, boasting of their populations and their riches, put in their own eloquent pleas. But the members of Congress were busy with politics. The Democrats saw no good reason for admitting new Republican states until after their defeat in 1888. Near the end of their term the next year, they opened the door for North and South Dakota, Washington, and Montana. In 1890, a Republican Congress brought Idaho and Wyoming into the Union, the latter with woman suffrage, which had been granted 21 years before. Utah Although Utah had long presented all the elements of a well-settled and industrious community, its admission to the Union was delayed on account of popular hostility to the practice of polygamy. The custom, it is true, had been prohibited by an act of Congress in 1862, but the law had been systematically evaded. In 1882, Congress made another and more effective effort to stamp out polygamy. Five years later, it even went so far as to authorize the confiscation of the property of the Mormon Church in case the practice of plural marriages was not stopped. Meanwhile, the Gentile or non-Mormon population was steadily increasing and the leaders in the church became convinced that the battle against the sentiment of the country was futile. At last, in 1896, Utah was admitted as a state under a constitution which forbade plural marriages absolutely and forever. Horace Greeley, who visited Utah in 1859, had prophesied that the Pacific Railroad would work a revolution in the land of Brigham Young. His prophecy had come true. Rounding out the continent. Three more territories now remained out of the Union. Oklahoma, long an Indian reservation, had been opened for settlement to white men in 1889. The rush upon the fertile lands of this region, the last in the history of America, was marked by all the frenzy of the final desperate chance. At a signal from a bugle, an army of men with families in wagons, men and women on horseback and on foot, burst into the territory. 
During the first night a city of tents was raised at Guthrie and Oklahoma City. In ten days wooden houses rose on the plains. In a single year there were schools, churches, business blocks, and newspapers. Within fifteen years there was a population of more than half a million. To the west, Arizona, with a population of about 125,000, and New Mexico, with 200,000 inhabitants, joined Oklahoma in asking for statehood. Congress, then Republican, looked with reluctance upon the addition of more democratic states. But in 1907, it was literally compelled by public sentiment and a sense of justice to admit Oklahoma. In 1910, the House of Representatives went to the Democrats, and within two years Arizona and New Mexico were under the roof. So the continental domain was rounded out. The Influence of the Far West on National Life The Last of the Frontier When Horace Greeley made his trip west in 1859, he thus recorded the progress of civilization in his journal. Quote, May 12th, Chicago. Chocolate and morning journals last seen on the hotel breakfast table. 23rd, Leavenworth, Kansas. Room bells and bathtubs make their final appearance. 26th, Manhattan. Potatoes and eggs last recognized among the blessings that brighten the day as they take their flight. 27th, Junction City. Last visitation of a boot black with dissolving views of a board bedroom. Beds bid us goodbye. End quote. Within thirty years, travelers were riding across that country in Pullman cars and enjoying at the hotels all the comforts of a standardized civilization. The Wild West was gone, and with it that frontier of pioneers and settlers who had long given such a bent and tone to American life, and had, quote, poured in upon the floor of Congress, end quote, such a long line of backwoods politicians, as they were scornfully styled. Free Land and Eastern Labor it was not only the picturesque features of the frontier that were gone. Of far more consequence was the disappearance of free lands with all that meant for American labor. For more than a hundred years, any man of even moderate means had been able to secure a homestead of his own and an independent livelihood. For a hundred years, America had been able to supply farms to as many immigrants as cared to till the soil. Every new pair of strong arms meant more farms and more wealth. Workmen in eastern factories, mines, or mills, who did not like their hours, wages, or conditions of labor, could readily find an outlet to the land. Now all that was over. By about 1890, most of the desirable land available under the Homestead Act had disappeared. American industrial workers confronted a new situation. Grain Supplants King Cotton in the meantime, a revolution was taking place in agriculture. Until 1860, the chief staples sold by America were cotton and tobacco. With the advance of the frontier, corn and wheat supplanted them both in agrarian economy. The West became the granary of the East and of Western Europe. The scoop shovel once used to handle grain was superseded by the towering elevator, loading and unloading thousands of bushels every hour. The refrigerator car and ship made the packing industry as stable as the production of cotton or corn, and gave an immense impetus to cattle raising and sheep farming. So the meat of the West took its place on the English dinner table by the side of bread baked from Dakotan wheat. Aid in American Economic Independence The effects of this economic movement were manifold and striking. Billions of dollars worth of American grain, dairy, produce, and meat were poured into European markets, where they paid off debts due money lenders and acquired capital to develop American resources. Thus they accelerated the progress of American financiers toward national independence. The country, which had timidly turned to the old world for capital in Hamilton's day, and had borrowed at high rates of interest in London in Lincoln's day, moved swiftly toward the time when it would be among the world's first bankers and money lenders itself. Every grain of wheat and corn pulled the balance down on the American side of the scale. Eastern Agriculture Affected In the East, as well as abroad, the opening of the Western granary produced momentous results. 
the agricultural economy of that part of the country was changed in many respects. Whole sections of the poorest land went almost out of cultivation, the abandoned farms of the New England hills bearing solemn witness to the competing power of western wheat fields. Sheep and cattle raising, as well as wheat and corn production, suffered at least a relative decline. Thousands of farmers cultivating land of the lower grade were forced to go west or were driven to the margin of subsistence. Even the herds that supplied eastern cities with milk were fed upon grain brought halfway across the continent. The Expansion of the American Market Upon industry as well as agriculture, the opening of vast food-producing regions told in a thousand ways. The demand for farm machinery, clothing, boots, shoes, and other manufactures gave to American industries such a market as even Hamilton had never foreseen. Moreover, it helped to expand far into the Mississippi Valley, the industrial area once confined to the northern seaboard states, and to transform the region of the Great Lakes into an industrial empire. Herein lies the explanation of the growth of Midwestern cities after 1865. Chicago, with its thirty-five railways, tapped every locality of the west and south. To the railways were added the water routes of the lakes, thus creating a strategic center for industries. Long foresight carried the McCormick Reaper Works to Chicago before 1860. From Troy, New York, went a large stove plant. That was followed by a shoe factory from Massachusetts. The packing industry rose, as a matter of course, at a point so advantageous for cattle raisers and shippers, and so well connected with eastern markets. To the opening of the far west also the lake region was indebted for a large part of that waterborne traffic which made it the Mediterranean basin of North America. The produce of the west and the manufactures of the east poured through it in an endless stream. The swift growth of shipbuilding on the Great Lakes helped to compensate for the decline of the American marine on the high seas. In response to this stimulus, Detroit could boast that her shipwrights were able to turn out a 10,000-ton leviathan for ore or grain about, quote, as quickly as carpenters could put up an eight-room house, end quote. Thus, in relation to the far west, the old Northwest Territory, the wilderness of Jefferson's time, had taken the position formerly occupied by New England alone. It was supplying capital and manufactures for a vast agricultural empire west and south. America on the Pacific It had been said that the Mediterranean Sea was the center of ancient civilization, that modern civilization has developed on the shores of the Atlantic, and that the future belongs to the Pacific. At any rate, the sweep of the United States to the shores of the Pacific quickly exercised a powerful influence on world affairs, and it undoubtedly has a still greater significance for the future. Very early regular traffic sprang up between the Pacific ports and the Hawaiian Islands, China, and Japan. Two years before the adjustment of the Oregon controversy with England, namely in 1844, the United States had established official and trading relations with China. Ten years later, four years after the admission of California to the Union, the barred door of Japan was forced open by Commodore Perry. The commerce which had long before developed between the Pacific ports and Hawaii, China, and Japan now flourished under official care. In 1865, a ship from Honolulu carried sugar, molasses, and fruits from Hawaii to the Oregon port of Astoria. The next year, a vessel from Hong Kong brought rice, mats, and tea from China. An era of lucrative trade was opened. The annexation of Hawaii in 1898, the addition of the Philippines at the same time, and the participation of American troops in the suppression of the Boxer Rebellion in Peking in 1900 were but signs and symbols of American power on the Pacific. Conservation and the Land Problem The disappearance of the frontier also brought new and serious problems to the governments of the states and the nation the people of the whole United States suddenly were forced to realize that there was a limit to the rich new land to exploit and to the forests and minerals awaiting the axe and the pick. Then arose in America the questions which had long perplexed the countries of the old world, the scientific use of the soils and conservation of natural resources. 
Hitherto the government had followed the easy path of giving away arable land and selling forest and mineral lands at low prices. Now it had to face far more difficult and complex problems. It also had to consider questions of land tenure again, especially if the ideal of a nation of home-owning farmers was to be maintained. While there was plenty of land for every man or woman who wanted a home on the soil, it made little difference if single landlords or companies got possession of millions of acres, if a hundred men in one western river valley owned seventeen million acres. But when the good land for small homesteads was all gone, then was raised the real issue. At the opening of the twentieth century, the nation, which a hundred years before had land and natural resources apparently without limit, was compelled to enact law after law conserving its forests and minerals. Then it was that the great state of California, on the very border of the continent, felt constrained to enact a land settlement measure providing government assistance in an effort to break up large holdings into small lots and to make it easy for actual settlers to acquire small farms. America was passing into a new epoch. References Henry Inman, The Old Santa Fe Trail R. I. Dodge, The Plains of the Great West, 1877 C. H. Shin, the Story of the Mine. Cy Warman, The Story of the Railroad. Emerson Howe, The Story of the Cowboy. H. H. Bancroft is the author of many works on the West, but his writings will be found only in the larger libraries. Joseph Schaefer, History of the Pacific Northwest, Edition, 1918. T. H. Hiddle, History of California, Four Volumes. W. H. Olin, American Irrigation Farming. W. E. Smythe, The Conquest of Arid America. H. A. Millis, The American Japanese Problem. E. S. Meany, History of the State of Washington. H. K. Norton, The History of California. Questions. 1. Name the states west of the Mississippi in 1865. 2. In what manner was the rest of the western region governed? 3. How far had settlement been carried? 4. What were the striking physical features of the West? 5. How was settlement promoted after 1865? 6. Why was admission to the Union so eagerly sought? 7. Explain how politics became involved in the creation of new states. 8. Did the West rapidly become like the older sections of the country? 9. What economic peculiarities did it retain or develop? 10. How did the federal government aid in Western agriculture? 11. How did the development of the West affect the East, the South? 12. What relation did the opening of the great grain areas of the West bear to the growth of America's commercial and financial power? 13. State some of the new problems of the West. 14. Discuss the significance of American expansion to the Pacific Ocean. Research Topics The Passing of the Wild West Hayworth, The United States in Our Own Times, pages 100 to 124 The Indian Question, Sparks, National Development, American Nation Series, pages 265 to 281 the Chinese Question, Sparks, National Development, pages 229 to 250, Rhodes, History of the United States, Volume 8, pages 180 to 196. The Railway Age, Schaefer, History of the Pacific Northwest, pages 230 to 245, E.V. Smalley, The Northern Pacific Railroad, Paxson, The New Nation, Riverside Series, pages 20 to 26, especially the map on page 23, and pages 142 to 148. Agriculture and Business, Schaefer, Pacific Northwest, pages 246 to 289. Ranching in the Northwest, Theodore Roosevelt, Ranch Life, and Autobiography, pages 103 to 143. The Conquest of the Desert, W. E. Smythe, the Conquest of Arid America. 
Studies of Individual Western States. Consult any good encyclopedia. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 6. National Growth and World Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Wilson. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 6. National Growth and World Politics. Chapter 19. Domestic Issues Before the Country, 1865 through 1897. For thirty years after the Civil War, the leading political parties, although they engaged in heated presidential campaigns, were not sharply and clearly opposed on many matters of vital significance. During none of that time was there a clash of opinion over specific issues such as rent the country in 1800, when Jefferson rode a popular wave to victory, or again in 1828 when Jackson's western hordes came sweeping into power. The Democrats, who before 1860 definitely opposed protective tariffs, federal banking, internal improvements, and heavy taxes, now spoke cautiously on all these points. The Republicans, conscious of the fact that they had been a minority of the voters in 1860, and warned by the early loss of the House of Representatives in 1874, also moved with considerable prudence among the perplexing problems of the day. Again and again the votes in Congress showed that no clear line separated all the Democrats from all the Republicans. There were Republicans who favored tariff reductions and cheap money. There were Democrats who looked with partiality upon high protection or with indulgence upon the contraction of the currency. Only on matters relating to the coercion of the South was the division between the parties fairly definite. This could be readily accounted for on practical as well as sentimental grounds. After all, the vague criticisms and proposals that found their way into the political platforms did but reflect the confusion of mind prevailing in the country. The fact that out of the 18 years between 1875 and 1893, the Democrats held the House of Representatives for 14 years while the Republicans had every president but one, showed that the voters, like the politicians, were in a state of indecision. Hayes had a Democratic House during his entire term and a Democratic Senate for two years of the four. Cleveland was confronted by a belligerent Republican majority in the Senate during his first administration and at the same time was supported by a Democratic majority in the House. Harrison was sustained by continuous Republican successes in senatorial elections. But in the House he had the barest majority from 1889 to 1891, and lost that altogether at the election held in the middle of his term. The opinion of the country was evidently unsettled and fluctuating. It was still distracted by memories of the dead past and uncertain as to the trend of the future. The Currency Question Nevertheless, these years of muddled politics and nebulous issues proved to be a period in which social forces were gathering for the great campaign of 1896. Except for the three new features, the railways, the trusts, and the trade unions, the subjects of debate among the people were the same as those that had engaged their attention since the foundation of the republic, the currency, the national debt, banking, the tariff, and taxation debtors and the fall in prices. For many reasons, the currency question occupied the center of interest. As of old, the farmers and planters of the West and South were heavily in debt to the East for borrowed money secured by farm mortgages, and they counted upon the sale of cotton, corn, wheat, and hogs to meet interest and principal when due. During the war, the Western farmers had been able to dispose of their produce at high prices and thus discharge their debts with comparative ease. But after the war, prices declined. Wheat that sold at $2 a bushel in 1865 brought 64 cents 20 years later. 
the meaning of this for the farmers in debt and nearly three-fourths of them were in that class can be shown by a single illustration a thousand dollar mortgage on a western farm could be paid off by five hundred bushels of wheat when prices were high whereas it took about fifteen hundred bushels to pay the same debt when wheat was at the bottom of the scale for the farmer it must be remembered wheat was the measure of his labor the product of his toil under the summer sun and in its price he found the test of his prosperity creditors and falling prices to the bondholders or creditors on the other hand falling prices were clear gain if a fifty dollar coupon on a bond bought seventy or eighty bushels of wheat instead of twenty or thirty the advantage to the owner of the coupon was obvious moreover the advantage seemed to him entirely just creditors had suffered heavy losses when the civil war carried prices skyward while the interest rates on their old bonds remained stationary for example if a man had a one thousand dollar bond issued before eighteen sixty and paying interest at five per cent he received fifty dollars a year from it before the war each dollar would buy a bushel of wheat in eighteen sixty five it would only buy half a bushel when prices that is the cost of living began to go down creditors therefore generally regarded the change with satisfaction as a return to normal conditions the cause of falling prices the fall in prices was due no doubt to many factors among them must be reckoned the discontinuance of government buying for war purposes labor-saving farm machinery immigration and the opening of new wheat-growing regions the currency too was an element in the situation whatever the cause the discontented farmers believed that the way to raise prices was to issue more money they viewed it as a case of supply and demand if there was a small volume of currency in circulation prices would be low if there was a large volume prices would be high hence they looked with favor upon all plans to increase the amount of money in circulation first they advocated more paper notes greenbacks and then they turned to silver as the remedy the creditors on the other hand naturally approved the reduction of the volume of currency they wished to see the greenbacks withdrawn from circulation and gold a metal more limited in volume than silver made the sole basis of the national monetary system the battle over the greenbacks the contest between the factions began as early as eighteen sixty six in that year congress enacted a law authorizing the treasury to withdraw the greenbacks from circulation the paper money parties set up a shrill cry of protest and kept up the fight until in eighteen seventy eight it forced congress to provide for the continuous reissue of the legal tender notes as they came into the treasury in payment of taxes and other dues then could the friends of easy money rejoice thou greenback tis of thee fair money of the free of thee we sing resumption of specie payment there was however another side to this victory the opponents of the greenbacks unable to stop the circulation of paper induced congress to pass a law in eighteen seventy five providing that on and after january first eighteen seventy nine the secretary of the treasury shall redeem in coin the united states legal tender notes then outstanding on their presentation at the office of the assistant treasurer of the united states in the city of new york in sums of not less than fifty dollars the way to resume john sherman had said is to resume when the hour for redemption arrived the treasury was prepared with a large hoard of gold on the appointed day wrote the assistant secretary anxiety reigned in the office of the treasury hour after hour passed no news from new york inquiry by wire showed that all was quiet at the close of the day this message came one hundred thirty five thousand dollars of notes presented for coin four hundred thousand dollars of gold for notes that was all resumption was accomplished with no disturbance by five o'clock the news was all over the land and the new york bankers were sipping their tea in absolute safety the specie problem the parity of gold and silver 
defeated in their efforts to stop the present suicidal and destructive policy of contraction the advocates of an abundant currency demanded an increase in the volume of silver in circulation this precipitated one of the sharpest political battles in american history the issue turned on legal as well as economic points the constitution gave congress the power to coin money and it forbade the states to make anything but gold and silver legal tender in the payment of debts it evidently contemplated the use of both metals in the currency system such at least was the view of many eminent statesmen including no less a personage than james g blaine the difficulty however lay in maintaining gold and silver coins on a level which would permit them to circulate with equal facility obviously if the gold in a gold dollar exceeds the value of the silver in a silver dollar on the open market men will hoard gold money and leave silver money in circulation when for example congress in seventeen ninety two fixed the ratio of the two metals at one to fifteen one ounce of gold declared worth fifteen of silver it was soon found that gold had been undervalued when again in eighteen thirty four the ratio was put at one to sixteen it was found that silver was undervalued consequently the latter metal was not brought in for coinage and silver almost dropped out of circulation many a silver dollar was melted down by silverware factories silver demonetized in eighteen seventy three so things stood in eighteen seventy three at that time congress in enacting a mintage law discontinued the coinage of the standard silver dollar then practically out of circulation this act was denounced later by the friends of silver as the crime of seventy three a conspiracy devised by the money power and secretly carried out this contention the debates in congress do not seem to sustain in the course of the argument on the mint law it was distinctly said by one speaker at least this bill provides for the making of changes in the legal tender coin of the country and for substituting as legal tender coin of only one metal instead of two as heretofore the decline in the value of silver absorbed in the greenback controversy the people apparently did not appreciate at the time the significance of the demonetization of silver but within a few years several events united in making it the center of a political storm germany having abandoned silver in eighteen seventy one steadily increased her demand for gold three years later the countries of the latin union followed this example thus helping to enhance the price of the yellow metal all the while new silver loads discovered in the far west were pouring into the market great streams of the white metal bearing down the price then came the resumption of specie payment which in effect placed the paper money on a gold basis within twenty years silver was worth in gold only about half the price of eighteen seventy that there had been a real decline in silver was denied by the friends of that metal they alleged that gold had gone up because it had been given a monopoly in the coinage markets of civilized governments this monopoly they continued was the fruit of a conspiracy against the people conceived by the bankers of the world moreover they went on the placing of the greenbacks on a gold basis had itself worked a contraction of the currency it lowered the prices of labor and produce to the advantage of the holders of long-term investments bearing a fixed rate of interest when wheat sold at sixty-four cents a bushel their search for relief became desperate and they at last concentrated their efforts on opening the mints of the government for the free coinage of silver at the ratio of sixteen to one republicans and democrats divided on this question both republicans and democrats were divided the line being drawn between the east on the one hand and the south and west on the other rather than between the two leading parties so trusted a leader as james g blaine avowed in a speech delivered in the senate in eighteen seventy eight that as the constitution required congress to make both gold and silver the money of the land the only question left was that of fixing the ratio between them he affirmed moreover the main contention of the silver faction that a reopening of the government mint of the world to silver would bring it up to its old relation with gold he admitted also that their most ominous warnings were well founded saying 
i believe the struggle now going on in this country and in other countries for a single gold standard would if successful produce widespread disaster throughout the commercial world the destruction of silver as money and the establishment of gold as the sole unit of value must have a ruinous effect on all forms of property except those investments which yield a fixed return this was exactly the concession that the silver party wanted three-fourths of the business enterprises of this country are conducted on borrowed capital said senator jones of nevada three-fourths of the homes and farms that stand in the names of the actual occupants have been bought on time and a very large proportion of them are mortgaged for the payment of some part of the purchase money under the operation of a shrinkage in the volume of money this enormous mass of borrowers at the maturity of their respective debts though nominally paying no more than the amount borrowed with interest are in reality in the amount of the principal alone returning a percentage of value greater than they received more in equity than they contracted to pay in all discussions of the subject the creditors attempt to brush aside the equities involved by sneering at the debtors the silver purchase act eighteen seventy eight even before the actual resumption of specie payment the advocates of free silver were a power to be reckoned with particularly in the democratic party they had a majority in the house of representatives in eighteen seventy eight and they carried a silver bill through that chamber blocked by the republican senate they accepted a compromise in the bland allison bill which provided for huge monthly purchases of silver by the government for coinage into dollars so strong was the sentiment that a two-thirds majority was mustered after president hayes vetoed the measure the effect of this act as some had anticipated was disappointing it did not stay silver on its downward course thereupon the silver faction pressed through congress in eighteen eighty six a bill providing for the issue of paper certificates based on the silver accumulated in the treasury still silver continued to fall then the advocates of inflation declared that they wouldn't be content with nothing short of free coinage at the ratio of sixteen to one if the issue had been squarely presented in eighteen ninety there is good reason for believing that free silver would have received the majority in both houses of congress but it was not presented the sherman silver purchase act and the bond sales republican leaders particularly from the east stemmed the silver tide by a diversion of forces they passed the sherman act of eighteen ninety providing for large monthly purchases of silver and for the issue of notes redeemable in gold or silver at the discretion of the secretary of the treasury in a clause of superb ambiguity they announced that it was the established policy of the united states to maintain the two metals on a parity with each other upon the present legal ratio or such other ratio as may be provided by law for a while silver was buoyed up then it turned once more on its downward course in the meantime the treasury was in a sad plight to maintain the gold reserve president cleveland felt compelled to sell government bonds and to his dismay he found that as soon as the gold was brought in at the front door of the treasury notes were presented for redemption and the gold was quickly carried out at the back door alarmed at the vicious circle thus created he urged upon congress the repeal of the sherman silver purchase act for this he was roundly condemned by many of his own followers who branded his conduct as treason to the party but the republicans especially from the east came to his rescue and in eighteen ninety three swept the troublesome sections of the law from the statute book the anger of the silver faction knew no bounds and the leaders made ready for the approaching presidential campaign the protective tariff and taxation fluctuation in tariff policy as each of the old parties was divided on the currency question it is not surprising that there was some confusion in their ranks over the tariff like the silver issue the tariff tended to align the manufacturing east against the agricultural west and south rather than to cut directly between the two parties still the republicans on the whole stood firmly by the rates imposed during the civil war 
if we accept the reductions of eighteen seventy two which were soon offset by increases we may say that those rates were substantially unchanged for nearly twenty years when a revision was brought about however it was initiated by republican leaders seeing a huge surplus of revenue in the treasury in eighteen eighty three they anticipated popular clamor by revising the tariff on the theory that it ought to be reformed by its friends rather than by its enemies on the other hand it was the republicans also who enacted the mckinley tariff bill of eighteen ninety which carried protection to its highest point up to that time the democrats on their part were not all confirmed free traders or even advocates of tariff for revenue only in cleveland's first administration they did attack the protective system in the house where they had a majority and in this they were vigorously supported by the president the assault however proved to be a futile gesture for it was blocked by the republicans in the senate when after the sweeping victory of eighteen ninety two the democrats in the house again attempted to bring down the tariff by the wilson bill of eighteen ninety four they were checkmated by their own party colleagues in the upper chamber in the end they were driven into a compromise that looked more like a mckinley than a calhoun tariff the republicans taunted them with being babes in the woods president cleveland was so dissatisfied with the bill that he refused to sign it allowing it to become law on the lapse of ten days without his approval the income tax of eighteen ninety four the advocates of tariff reduction usually associated with their proposal a tax on incomes the argument which they advanced in support of their program was simple most of the industries they said are in the east and the protective tariff which taxes consumers for the benefits of manufacturers is in effect a tribute laid upon the rest of the country as an offset they offered a tax on large incomes this owing to the heavy concentration of rich people in the east would fall mainly upon the beneficiaries of protection we propose said one of them to place a part of the burden upon the accumulated wealth of the country instead of placing it all upon the consumption of the people in this spirit the sponsors of the wilson tariff bill laid a tax upon all incomes of four thousand dollars a year or more in taking this step the democrats encountered opposition in their own party senator hill of new york turned fiercely upon them exclaiming the professors with their books the socialists with their schemes the anarchists with their bombs are all instructing the people in the principles of taxation even the eastern republicans were hardly a savage in their denunciation of the tax but all this labor was wasted the next year the supreme court of the united states declared the income tax to be a direct tax and therefore null and void because it was laid on incomes wherever found and not apportioned among the states according to population the fact that four of the nine judges dissented from this decision was also an index to the diversity of opinion that divided both parties the railways and trusts the grangers and state regulation the same uncertainty about the railways and trusts pervaded the ranks of the republicans and democrats as to the railways the first firm and consistent demand for their regulation came from the west there the farmers in the early seventies having got control in state legislatures particularly in iowa wisconsin and illinois enacted drastic laws prescribing the maximum charges which companies could make for carrying freight and passengers the application of these measures however was limited because the state could not fix the rates for transporting goods and passengers beyond its own borders the power of regulating interstate commerce under the constitution belonged to congress the interstate commerce act of eighteen eighty seven within a few years the movement which had been so effective in western legislatures appeared at washington in the form of demands for the federal regulation of interstate rates in eighteen eighty seven the pressure became so strong that congress created the interstate commerce commission and forbade many abuses on the part of railways such as discriminating in charges between one shipper and another and granting secret rebates to favored persons 
This law was a significant beginning, but it left the main question of rate-fixing untouched, much to the discontent of farmers and shippers. The Sherman Antitrust Law of 1890 As in the case of the railways, attacks upon the trusts were first made in state legislatures, where it became the fashion to provide severe penalties for those who formed the monopolies and conspired to enhance prices. Republicans and Democrats united in the promotion of measures of this kind. As in the case of the railways also, the movement to curb the trusts soon had spokesmen at Washington. Though Blaine had declared that trusts were largely a private affair with which neither the president nor any private citizen had any particular right to interfere, it was a Republican Congress that enacted in 1890 the first measure, the Sherman Antitrust Law, directed against great combinations in the business. This act declared illegal every contract, combination in the form of trust or otherwise, or conspiracy in restraint of trade and commerce among the several states or with foreign nations. The Futility of the Antitrust Law Whether the Sherman Law was directed against all combinations, or merely those which placed an unreasonable restraint on trade and competition was not apparent. Senator Platt of Connecticut, a careful statesman of the old school, averred, the questions of whether the bill would be operative, of how it would operate, or whether it was within the power of Congress to enact it, have been whistled down the wind in the Senate as idle talk, and the whole effort has been to get some bill headed, a bill to punish trusts with which to go to the country. Whatever its purpose, its effect upon existing trusts and upon the formation of new combinations was negligible. It was practically unenforced by President Harrison and President Cleveland, in spite of the constant demand for harsh action against monopolies. It was patent that neither the Republicans nor the Democrats were prepared for a war on the trusts to the bitter end. The Minor Parties and Unrest The Demands of Dissenting Parties from the election of 1872, when Horace Greeley made his ill-fated excursion into politics, onward, there appeared in each presidential campaign one, and sometimes two or more parties, stressing issues that appealed mainly to wage earners and farmers. Whether they chose to call themselves labor reformers, greenbackers, or anti-monopolists, their slogans and their platforms all pointed in one direction. Even the prohibitionists, who in 1872 started on their career with a single issue, the abolition of the liquor traffic, found themselves making declarations of faith on other matters and hopelessly split over the money question in 1896. A composite view of the platforms put forth by the dissenting parties from the administration of Grant to the close of Cleveland's second term reveals certain notions common to them all. These included, among many others, the earliest possible payment of the national debt, regulation of the rates of railways and telegraph companies, repeal of the Specie Resumption Act of 1875, the issue of legal tender notes by the government convertible into interest-bearing obligations on demand, unlimited coinage of silver as well as gold, a graduated inheritance tax, legislation to take from land, railroad, money, and other gigantic corporate monopolies, the powers they have so corruptly and unjustly usurped, popular or direct election of United States senators, woman suffrage, and a graduated income tax placing the burden of government on those who can best afford to pay instead of laying it on the farmers and producers. Criticism of the Old Parties To this long program of measures, the reformers added harsh and acrid criticism of the old parties and sometimes, it must be said, of established institutions of government. We denounce, exclaimed the Labor Party in 1888, the Democratic and Republican parties as hopelessly and shamelessly corrupt, and by reason of their affiliation with monopolies, equally unworthy of the suffrages of those who did not live upon the public plunder. The United States Senate, insisted the Greenbackers, is a body composed largely of aristocratic millionaires who, according to their own party papers, 
generally purchase their elections in order to protect the great monopolies which they represent indeed if their platforms are to be accepted at face value the greenbackers believed that the entire government had passed out of the hands of the people the grangers this unsparing not to say revolutionary criticism of american political life appealed it seems mainly to farmers in the middle west always active in politics they had before the civil war cast their lot as a rule with one or the other of the leading parties in eighteen sixty seven however there grew up among them an association known as the patrons of husbandry which was destined to play a large role in the partisan contests of the succeeding decades this society which organized local lodges or granges on principles of secrecy and fraternity was originally designed to promote in a general way the interests of the farmers its political bearings were apparently not grasped at first by its promoters yet appealing as it did to the most active and independent spirits among the farmers and gathering to itself the strength that always comes from organization it soon found itself in the hands of leaders more or less involved in politics where a few votes are marshaled together in a democracy there is power the greenback party the first extensive activity of the grangers was connected with the attack on the railways in the middle west which forced several state legislatures to reduce freight and passenger rates by law at the same time some leaders in the movement no doubt emboldened by this success launched in eighteen seventy six a new political party popularly known as the greenbackers favoring a continued reissue of the legal tenders the beginnings were disappointing but two years later in the congressional elections the greenbackers swept whole sections of the country their candidates polled more than a million votes and fourteen of them were returned to the house of representatives to all outward signs a new and formidable party had entered the lists the sanguine hopes of the leaders proved to be illusory the quiet operations of the resumption act the following year a revival of industry from a severe panic which had set in during eighteen seventy three the silver purchase act and the reissue of greenbacks cut away some of the grounds of agitation there was also a diversion of forces to the silver faction which had a substantial support in the silver mine owners of the west at all events the greenback vote fell to about three hundred thousand in the election of eighteen eighty a still greater drop came four years later and the party gave up the ghost its sponsors returning to their former allegiance or sulking in their tents the rise of the populist party those leaders of the old parties who now looked for a happy future unvexed by new factions were doomed to disappointment the funeral of the greenback party was hardly over before there arose two other political specters in the agrarian sections the national farmers alliance and industrial union particularly strong in the south and west and the farmers alliance operating in the north by eighteen ninety the two orders claimed over three million members as in the case of the grangers many years before the leaders among them found an easy way into politics in eighteen ninety two they held a convention nominated a candidate for president and adopted the name of people's party from which they were known as populists their platform in every line breathed a spirit of radicalism they declared that the newspapers are largely subsidized or muzzled public opinion silenced business prostrate our homes covered with mortgages and the land concentrating in the hands of capitalists the fruits of the toil of millions are boldly stolen to build up colossal fortunes for a few having delivered this sweeping indictment the populace put forward their remedies the free coinage of silver a graduated income tax postal savings banks and government ownership of railways and telegraphs at the same time they approved the initiative referendum and popular election of senators and condemned the use of federal troops in labor disputes on this platform the populace polled over a million votes captured twenty-two presidential electors and sent a powerful delegation to congress 
Industrial Distress Augments Unrest The four years intervening between the campaign of 1892 and the next presidential election brought forth many events which aggravated the ill feeling expressed in the portentous platform of populism. Cleveland, a consistent enemy of free silver, gave his powerful support to the gold standard and insisted on the repeal of the Silver Purchase Act, thus alienating an increasing number of his own party. In 1893, a grave industrial crisis fell upon the land. Banks and business houses went into bankruptcy with startling rapidity. Factories were closed. Idle men thronged the streets hunting for work. And the prices of wheat and corn dropped to a ruinous level. Labor disputes also filled the crowded record. A strike at the Pullman Car Works in Chicago spread to the railways. Disorders ensued. President Cleveland, against the protests of the governor of Illinois, John P. Altgeld, dispatched troops to the scene of action. The United States District Court at Chicago issued an injunction forbidding the president of the railway union, Eugene V. Debs, or his assistants to interfere with the transmission of the mails or interstate commerce in any form. For refusing to obey the order, Debs was arrested and imprisoned. With federal troops in possession of the field, with their leader in jail, the strikers gave up the battle, defeated but not subdued. To cap the climax, the Supreme Court of the United States, the following year, 1895, declared null and void the income tax law just enacted by Congress, thus fanning the flames of populist discontent all over the West and South. The Sound Money Battle of 1896 Conservative Men Alarmed Men of conservative thought and leaning in both parties were by this time thoroughly disturbed. They looked upon the rise of populism and the growth of labor disputes as the signs of a revolutionary spirit, indeed nothing short of a menace to American institutions and ideals. The income tax of 1894, exclaimed the distinguished New York advocate Joseph H. Choate, in an impassioned speech before the Supreme Court, is communistic in its purposes and tendencies, and is defended here upon principles as communistic, socialistic, what shall I call them, populistic, as ever have been addressed to any political assembly in the world. Mr. Justice Field, in the name of the court, replied, The present assault upon capital is but the beginning. It will be but the stepping stone to others larger and more sweeping till our political conditions will become a war of the poor against the rich. In declaring the income tax unconstitutional, he believed that he was but averting greater evils lurking under its guise. As for free silver, nearly all conservative men were united in calling it a measure of confiscation and repudiation. An effort of the debtors to pay their obligations with money worth fifty cents on the dollar, the climax of villainies openly defended, a challenge to law, order, and honor. The Republicans come out for the gold standard. It was among the Republicans that this opinion was most widely shared and firmly held. It was they who picked up the gauge thrown down by the populists, though a host of Democrats like Cleveland and Hill of New York also battled against the growing populist defection in Democratic ranks. When the Republican National Convention assembled in 1896, the die was soon cast, a declaration of opposition to free silver, save by international agreement, was carried by a vote of eight to one. The Republican Party, to use the vigorous language of Mr. Lodge, arrayed itself against not only that organized failure, the Democratic Party, but all the wandering forces of political chaos and social disorder. In these bitter times, when the forces of disorder are loose and the wreckers, with their false lights, gather at the shore to lure the ship of state upon the rocks, Yet it is due to historic truth to state that McKinley, whom the Republicans nominated, had voted in Congress for the free coinage of silver, was widely known as a bimetallist, and was only, with difficulty, persuaded to accept the unequivocal endorsement of the gold standard which was pressed upon him by his counselors. Having accepted it, however, 
he proved to be a valiant champion though his major interest was undoubtedly in the protective tariff to him nothing was more reprehensible than attempts to array class against class the classes against the masses section against section labor against capital the poor against the rich or interest against interest such was the language of his acceptance speech the whole program of populism he now viewed as a sudden dangerous and revolutionary assault upon law and order the democratic convention at chicago never save at the great disruption on the eve of the civil war did a democratic national convention display more feeling than at chicago in eighteen ninety six from the opening prayer to the last motion before the house every act every speech every scene every resolution evoked passions and sowed dissensions departing from long party custom it voted down in anger a proposal to praise the administration of the democratic president cleveland when the platform with its radical planks including free silver was reported a veritable storm broke senator hill trembling with emotion protested against the departure from old tests of democratic allegiance against principles that must drive out the party men who had gone gray in its service against revolutionary unwise and unprecedented steps in the history of the party senator vilas of wisconsin in great fervor avowed that there was no difference in principle between the free coinage of silver the confiscation of one half of the credits of the nation for the benefit of debtors and communism itself a universal distribution of property in the triumph of that cause he saw the beginning of the overthrow of all law all justice all security and repose in the social order the crown of thorns speech the champions of free silver replied in strident tones they accused the gold advocates of being the aggressors who had assailed the labor and the homes of the people william jennings bryan of nebraska voiced their sentiments in a memorable oration he declared that their cause was as holy as the cause of liberty the cause of humanity he exclaimed that the contest was between the idle holders of idle capital and the toiling millions then he named those for whom he spoke the wage earner the country lawyer the small merchant the farmer and the miner the man who is employed for wages is as much a business man as his employer the attorney in a country town is as much a business man as the corporation council in a great metropolis the merchant at the crossroads store is as much a business man as the merchant of new york the farmer is as much a business man as the man who goes upon the board of trade and bets upon the price of grain the miners who go a thousand feet into the earth or climb two thousand feet upon the cliffs are as much business men as the few financial magnates who in a back room corner the money of the world it is for these that we speak we do not come as aggressors ours is not a war of conquest we are fighting in defense of our homes our families and our posterity we have petitioned and our petitions have been scorned we have entreated and our entreaties have been disregarded we have begged and they have mocked when our calamity came we beg no longer we entreat no more we petition no more we defy them we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them you shall not press upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold bryan nominated in all the history of national conventions never had an orator so completely swayed a multitude not even yancey in his memorable plea in the charleston convention of eighteen sixty when with grave and moving eloquence he espoused the southern cause against the impending fates the delegates after cheering mr bryan until they could cheer no more tore the standards from the floor and gathered around the nebraska delegation to renew the deafening applause the platform as reported was carried by a vote of two to one and the young orator from the west hailed as america's tiberius gracchus was nominated as the democratic candidate for president 
the south and west had triumphed over the east the division was sectional admittedly sectional the old combination of power which calhoun had so anxiously labored to build up a century earlier the gold democrats were repudiated in terms which were clear to all a few unable to endure the thought of voting the republican ticket held a convention at indianapolis where with the sanction of cleveland they nominated candidates of their own and endorsed the gold standard in a forlorn hope the democratic platform it was to the call from chicago that the democrats gave heed and the republicans made answer the platform on which mr bryan stood unlike most party manifestos was explicit in its language and its appeal it denounced the practice of allowing national banks to issue notes intended to circulate as money on the ground that it was in derogation of the constitution recalling jackson's famous attack on the bank in eighteen thirty two it declared that tariff duties should be laid for the purpose of revenue calhoun's doctrine in demanding the free coinage of silver it recurred to the practice abandoned in eighteen seventy three the income tax came next on the program the platform alleged that the law of eighteen ninety four passed by a democratic congress was in strict pursuance of the uniform decisions of the supreme court for nearly a hundred years and then hinted that the decision annulling the law might be reversed by the same body as it may hereafter be constituted the appeal to labor voiced by mr bryan in his crown of thorns speech was reinforced in the platform as labor creates the wealth of the country ran one plank we demand the passage of such laws as may be necessary to protect it in all its rights referring to the recent pullman strike the passions of which had not yet died away the platform denounced arbitrary interference by federal authorities in local affairs as a violation of the constitution of the united states and a crime against free institutions a special objection was lodged against government by injunction as a new and highly dangerous form of oppression by which federal judges in contempt of the laws of states and rights of citizens became at once legislators judges and executioners the remedy advanced was a federal law assuring trial by jury in all cases of contempt in labor disputes having made this declaration of faith the democrats with mr bryan at the head raised their standard of battle the heated campaign the campaign which ensued outrivaled in the range of its educational activities and the bitterness of its tone all other political conflicts in american history not excepting the fateful struggle of eighteen sixty immense sums of money were contributed to the funds of both parties railway banking and other corporations gave generously to the republicans the silver miners less lavishly but with the same anxiety supported the democrats the country was flooded with pamphlets posters and handbills every public forum from the great auditoriums of the cities to the red schoolhouses on the countryside was occupied by the opposing forces mr bryan took the stump himself visiting all parts of the country in special trains and addressing literally millions of people in the open air mr mckinley chose the older and more formal plan he received delegations at his home in canton and discussed the issues of the campaign from his front porch leaving to an army of well-organized orators the task of reaching the people in their home towns parades processions and monster demonstrations filled the land with politics whole states were polled in advance by the republicans and the doubtful voters personally visited by men equipped with arguments and literature manufacturers frightened at the possibility of disordered public credit announced that they would close their doors if the democrats won the election men were dismissed from public and private places on account of their political views one eminent college president being forced out for advocating free silver the language employed by impassioned and embittered speakers on both sides roused the public to a state of frenzy once more showing the lengths to which men could go in personal and political abuse the republican victory the verdict of the nation was decisive 
McKinley received 271 of the 447 electoral votes and 7,111,000 popular votes as against Bryan's 6,509,000. The congressional elections were equally positive, although on account of the composition of the Senate, the holdover Democrats and populists still enjoyed a power out of proportion to their strength as measured at the polls. Even as it was, the Republicans got full control of both houses, a dominion of the entire government which they were to hold for fourteen years, until the second half of Mr. Taft's administration, when they lost possession of the House of Representatives. The yoke of indecision was broken. The party of sound finance and protective tariffs set out upon its lease of power with untroubled assurance. Republican Measures and Results The Gold Standard and the Tariff Yet, strange as it may seem, the Republicans did not at once enact the legislation making the gold dollar the standard for national currency. Not until 1900 did they take that positive step. In his first inaugural, President McKinley, as if still uncertain in his own mind, or fearing a revival of the contest just closed, placed the tariff, not the money question, in the forefront. The people have decided, he said, that such legislation should be had as well give ample protection and encouragement to the industries and development of our country. Protection for American industries, therefore, he urged, is the task before Congress. With adequate revenue secured, but not until then, we can enter upon changes in our fiscal laws. As the Republicans had only 46 of the 90 senators, and at least four of them were known advocates of free silver, the discretion exercised by the President in selecting the tariff for congressional debate was the better part of valor. Congress gave heed to the warning. Under the direction of Nelson P. Dingley, whose name was given to the bill, a tariff measure levying the highest rates yet laid in the history of American imports was prepared and driven through the House of Representatives. The opposition encountered in the Senate, especially from the West, was overcome by concessions in favor of that section, but the duties on sugar, tin, steel, lumber, hemp, and, in fact, all of the essential commodities handled by combinations and trusts were materially raised. Growth of Combinations The years that followed the enactment of the Dingley Law were, whatever the cause, the most prosperous the country had witnessed for many a decade, Industries of every kind were soon running full blast. Labor was employed. Commerce spread more swiftly than ever to the markets of the world. Coincident with this progress was the organization of the greatest combinations and trusts the world had yet seen. In 1899, the smelters formed a trust with a capital of $65 million. In the same year, the Standard Oil Company, with a capital of over 100 millions, took the place of the old trust, and the copper trust was incorporated under the laws of New Jersey, its par value capital being fixed shortly afterward at $175 million. A year later, the National Sugar Refining Company of New Jersey started with a capital of $90 million, adopting the policy of issuing to the stockholders no public statement of its earnings or financial condition. Before another twelve-month had elapsed, all previous corporate financing was reduced to small proportions by the flotation of the United States Steel Corporation, with a capital of more than a billion dollars, an enterprise set in motion by the famous Morgan Banking House of New York. In nearly all these gigantic undertakings, the same great leaders in finance were more or less intimately associated. To use the language of an eminent authority, they are all allied and intertwined by their various mutual interests. For instance, the Pennsylvania Railroad interests are on the one hand allied with the Vanderbilts and on the other with the Rockefellers. The Vanderbilts are closely allied with the Morgan Group. Viewed as a whole, we find the dominating influence in the trusts to be made up of a network of large and small capitalists, many allied to one another by ties of more or less importance but all being appendages to or parts of the greater groups which are themselves dependent on and allied with the two mammoth or rockefeller and morgan groups 
these two mammoth groups jointly constitute the heart of the business and commercial life of the nation such was the picture of triumphant business enterprise drawn by a financier within a few years after the memorable campaign of eighteen ninety six america had become one of the first workshops of the world it was by virtue of the closely knit organization of its business and finance one of the most powerful and energetic leaders in the struggle of the giants for the business of the earth the capital of the steel corporation alone was more than ten times the total national debt which the apostles of calamity in the days of washington and hamilton declared the nation could never pay american industry filling domestic markets to overflowing was ready for new worlds to conquer references f w tossig tariff history of the united states j l Lachlan bimetallism in the united states a b hepburn history of coinage and the currency in the united states e r a seligman the income tax s j buck the granger movement harvard studies f h dixon state railroad control h r meyer government regulation of railway rates w z ripley editor trusts pools and corporations r t eli monopolies and trusts j b clark the control of trusts questions one what proof have we that the political parties were not clearly divided over issues between eighteen sixty five and eighteen ninety six two why is a fall in prices a loss to farmers and a gain to holders of fixed investments? 3. Explain the theory that the quantity of money determines the prices of commodities. 4. Why was it difficult, if not impossible, to keep gold and silver at a parity? 5. What special conditions favored a fall in silver between 1870 and 1896? 6. Describe some of the measures taken to raise the value of silver. 7. Explain the relation between the tariff and the income tax in 1894. 8. How did it happen that the farmers led in regulating railway rates? 9. Give the terms of the Sherman Antitrust Act. What was its immediate effect? 10. Name some of the minor parties enumerate the reforms they advocated eleven briefly describe the experiments of the farmers in politics twelve how did industrial conditions increase unrest thirteen why were conservative men disturbed in the early nineties fourteen explain the republican position in eighteen ninety six fifteen Give Mr. Bryan's doctrines in 1896. Enumerate the chief features of the Democratic platform. 16. What were the leading measures adopted by the Republicans after their victory in 1896? Research Topics Greenbacks and Resumption Dewey, Financial History of the United States, 6th Edition, Sections 122 through 125 154 and 378 mcdonald documentary source book of american history pages 446 566 hart american history told by contemporaries volume 4 pages 531 through 533 rhodes history of the united states volume 8 pages 97 through 101 Demonetization and Coinage of Silver Dewey, Financial History, Sections 170 through 173, 186, 189, 194 MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook, Pages 174, 573, 593, 595 Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 4 pages 529 through 531 Rhodes history 
Volume 8, pages 93 through 97. Free Silver and the Campaign of 1896. Dewey, National Problems, American Nation Series, pages 220 through 237, 314 through 328. Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 4, pages 533 through 538. Tariff Revision. Dewey, Financial History, sections 167, 180, 181, 187, 192, 196. Hart, Contemporaries. Volume 4, pages 518 through 525. Rhodes, History, Volume 8, pages 168 through 179, 346 through 351, 418 through 422. Federal Regulation of Railways. Dewey, National Problems, pages 91 through 111. MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook, pages 581 through 590. Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 4, pages 521 through 523. Rhodes, History, Volume 8, pages 288 through 292. The Rise and Regulation of Trusts. Dewey, National Problems, pages 188 through 202. MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook, pages 591 through 593. The Grangers and Populism. Paxson, The New Nation, Riverside Series, pages 20 through 37, 177 through 191, 208 through 223. General Analysis of Domestic Problems. Syllabus in History, New York State, 1920, pages 137 through 142. End of Chapter 19 Recording by Anthony Wilson Chapter 20 of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard Part 6 National Growth and World Politics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Wilson History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard Part 6 National Growth and World Politics Chapter 20 America, a World Power, 1865 through 1900 it has now become a fashion, sanctioned by wide usage and by eminent historians, to speak of America, triumphant over Spain and possessed of new colonies, as entering the twentieth century in the role of a world power for the first time. Perhaps at this late day it is useless to protest against the currency of the idea. Nevertheless, the truth is that from the fateful moment in March 1775, when Edmund Burke unfolded to his colleagues in the British Parliament the resources of an invincible America, down to the settlement at Versailles in 1919 closing the drama of the World War, this nation has been a world power, influencing by its example, by its institutions, by its wealth, trade, and arms the course of international affairs. And it should be said also that neither in the field of commercial enterprise nor in that of diplomacy has it been wanting in spirit or ingenuity. When John Hay, Secretary of State, heard that an American citizen, Perdic Harris, had been seized by Raisuli, a Moroccan bandit, in 1904, he wired his brusque message, We want Perdic Harris alive or Raisuli dead. This was but an echo of Commodore Decatur's equally characteristic answer, Not a minute, given nearly a hundred years before to the pirates of Algiers, begging for time to consider whether they would cease preying upon American merchantmen. Was it not as early as 1844 that the American commissioner, Caleb Cushing, taking advantage of the British Opium War on China, negotiated with the Celestial Empire a successful commercial treaty? 
did he not then exultantly exclaim the laws of the union follow its citizens and its banner protects them even within the domain of the chinese empire was it not almost half a century before the battle of manila bay in eighteen ninety eight that commodore perry with an adequate naval force gently coerced japan into friendship with us leading all the nations of the earth in the opening of that empire to the trade of the occident nor is it inappropriate in this connection to recall the fact that the monroe doctrine celebrates in nineteen twenty three its hundredth anniversary american foreign relations eighteen sixty five through eighteen ninety eight french intrigues in mexico blocked between the war for the union and the war with spain the department of state had many an occasion to present the rights of america among the powers of the world only a little while after the civil conflict came to a close it was called upon to deal with a dangerous situation created in mexico by the ambitions of napoleon the third during the administration of buchanan mexico had fallen into disorder through the strife of the liberal and the clerical parties the president asked for authority to use american troops to bring to a peaceful haven a wreck upon the ocean drifting about as she is impelled by different factions our own domestic crisis then intervened observing the united states heavily involved in its own problems the great powers england france and spain decided in the autumn of eighteen sixty one to take a hand themselves in restoring order in mexico they entered into an agreement to enforce the claims of their citizens against mexico and to protect their subjects residing in that republic they invited the united states to join them and on meeting a polite refusal they prepared for a combined military and naval demonstration on their own account in the midst of this action england and spain discovering the sinister purposes of napoleon withdrew their troops and left the field to him the french emperor it was well known looked with jealousy upon the growth of the united states and dreamed of establishing in the western hemisphere an imperial power to offset the american republic intervention to collect debts was only a cloak for his deeper designs throwing off that guise in due time he made the archduke maximilian a brother of the ruler of austria emperor in mexico and surrounded his throne by french soldiers in spite of all protests this insolent attack upon the mexican republic deeply resented in the united states was allowed to drift in its course until eighteen sixty five at that juncture general sheridan was dispatched to the mexican border with a large armed force general grant urged the use of the american army to expel the french from this continent the secretary of state seward counseled negotiations first and applying the monroe doctrine was able to prevail upon napoleon the third to withdraw his troops without the support of french arms the sham empire in mexico collapsed like a house of cards and the unhappy maximilian the victim of french ambition and intrigue met his death at the hands of a mexican firing squad alaska purchased the mexican affair had not been brought to a close before the department of state was busy with negotiations which resulted in the purchase of alaska from russia the treaty of cession signed on march thirtieth eighteen sixty seven added to the united states a domain of nearly six hundred thousand square miles a territory larger than texas and nearly three-fourths the size of the louisiana purchase though it was a distant colony separated from our continental domain by a thousand miles of water no question of imperialism or colonization foreign to american doctrines seems to have been raised at the time the treaty was ratified promptly by the senate the purchase price seven million two hundred thousand dollars was voted by the house of representatives after the display of some resentment against the system that compelled it to appropriate money to fulfill an obligation which it had no part in making seward who formulated the treaty rejoiced as he afterwards said that he had kept alaska out of the hands of england american interest in the caribbean having achieved this diplomatic triumph seward turned to the increase of american power in another direction he negotiated with denmark 
a treaty providing for the purchase of the islands of St. John and St. Thomas in the West Indies, strategic points in the Caribbean for sea power. This project, long afterward brought to fruition by other men, was defeated on this occasion by the refusal of the Senate to ratify the treaty. Evidently, it was not yet prepared to exercise colonial dominion over other races. Undaunted by this misadventure in Caribbean policies, President Grant warmly advocated the acquisition of Santo Domingo. This little republic had long been in a state of general disorder. In 1869, a treaty of annexation was concluded with its president. The document Grant transmitted to the Senate with his cordial approval only to have it rejected. Not at all changed in his opinion by the outcome of his effort, he continued to urge the subject of annexation. Even in his last message to Congress, he referred to it, saying that time had only proved the wisdom of his early course. The addition of Santo Domingo to the American sphere of protection was the work of a later generation. The State Department, temporarily checked, had to bide its time. The Alabama Claims Arbitrated Indeed, it had in hand a far more serious matter, a vexing issue that grew out of Civil War diplomacy. The British government, as already pointed out in other connections, had permitted Confederate cruisers, including the famous Alabama, built in British ports, to escape and prey upon the commerce of the northern states. This action, denounced at the time by our government as a grave breach of neutrality, as well as a grievous injury to American citizens, led first to remonstrances and finally to repeated claims for damages done to American ships and goods. For a long time Great Britain was firm. Her foreign secretary denied all obligations in the premises, adding, somewhat curtly, that he wished to say once for all that Her Majesty's government disclaimed any responsibility for the losses, and hoped that they had made their position perfectly clear. Still, President Grant was not persuaded that the door of diplomacy, though closed, was barred. Hamilton Fish, his Secretary of State, renewed the demand. Finally, he secured from the British government in 1871 the Treaty of Washington, providing for the arbitration not merely of the Alabama and other claims, but also all points of serious controversy between the two countries. The Tribunal of Arbitration, thus authorized, sat at Geneva in Switzerland, and after a long and careful review of the arguments on both sides, awarded to the United States the lump sum of $15,500,000, to be distributed among the American claimants. The damages thus allowed were large, unquestionably larger than strict justice required, and it is not surprising that the decision excited much adverse comment in England. Nevertheless, the prompt payment by the British government swept away at once a great cloud of ill-feeling in America. Moreover, the spectacle of two powerful nations choosing the way of peaceful arbitration to settle an angry dispute seemed a happy, if illusory, omen of a modern method for avoiding the arbitrament of war. Samoa if the Senate had its doubts at first about the wisdom of acquiring strategic points for naval power in distant areas, the same could not be said of the State Department or naval officers. In 1872, Commander Meade of the United States Navy, alive to the importance of coaling stations even in mid-ocean, made a commercial agreement with the chief of Tutuila, one of the Samoan Islands, far below the equator in the southern Pacific, nearer to Australia than to California. This agreement, providing among other things for our use of the harbor of the Pago Pago as a naval base, was six years later changed into a formal treaty ratified by the Senate. Such enterprise could not escape the vigilant eyes of England and Germany, both mindful of the course of the sea power in history. The German emperor, seizing as a pretext a quarrel between his consul in the islands and a native king, laid claim to an interest in the Samoan group. England, aware of the dangers arising from German outposts in the southern seas so near to Australia, was not content to stand aside. So it happened that all three countries sent battleships to the Samoan waters, threatening a crisis that was fortunately averted by friendly settlement. 
if as is alleged germany entertained a notion of challenging american sea power then and there the presence of british ships must have dispelled that dream the result of the affair was a tripartite agreement by which the three powers in eighteen eighty nine undertook a protectorate over the islands but joint control proved unsatisfactory there was constant friction between the germans and the english the spheres of authority being vague and open to dispute the plan had to be abandoned at the end of ten years england withdrew altogether leaving to germany all the islands except tutuila which was ceded outright to the united states thus one of the finest harbors in the pacific to the intense delight of the american navy passed permanently under american dominion another triumph in diplomacy was set down to the credit of the state department cleveland and the venezuela affair in the relations with south america as well as those with the distant pacific the diplomacy of the government at washington was put to the test for some time it had been watching a dispute between england and venezuela over the western boundary of british guiana and on an appeal from venezuela it had taken a lively interest in the contest in eighteen ninety five president cleveland saw that great britain would yield none of her claims after hearing the arguments of venezuela his secretary of state richard t olney in a note none too conciliatory asked the british government whether it was willing to arbitrate the points in controversy this inquiry he accompanied by a warning to the effect that the united states could not permit any european power to contest its mastery in this hemisphere the united states said the secretary is practically sovereign on this continent and its fiat is law upon the subjects to which it confines its interposition its infinite resources combined with its isolated position render it master of the situation and practically invulnerable against any or all other powers the reply evoked from the british government by this strong statement was firm and clear the monroe doctrine it said even if not so widely stretched by interpretation was not binding in international law the dispute with venezuela was a matter of interest merely to the parties involved and arbitration of the question was impossible this response called forth president cleveland's startling message of eighteen ninety five he asked congress to create a commission authorized to ascertain by researches the true boundary between venezuela and british guiana he added that it would be the duty of this country to resist by every means in its power as a willful aggression upon its rights and interests the appropriation by great britain of any lands or the exercise of governmental jurisdiction over any territory which after investigation we have determined of right belongs to venezuela the serious character of this statement he thoroughly understood he declared that he was conscious of his responsibilities intimating that war much as it was to be deplored was not comparable to a supine submission to wrong and injustice and the consequent loss of national self-respect and honor the note of defiance which ran through this message greeted by shrill cries of enthusiasm in many circles was viewed in other quarters as a portent of war responsible newspapers in both countries spoke of an armed settlement of the dispute as inevitable congress created the commission and appropriated money for the investigation a body of learned men was appointed to determine the merits of the conflicting boundary claims the british government deaf to the clamor of the bellicose section of the london press deplored the incident courteously replied in the affirmative to a request for assistance in the search for evidence and finally agreed to the proposition that the issue be submitted to arbitration the outcome of this somewhat perilous dispute contributed not a little to cleveland's reputation as a sterling representative of the true american spirit this was not diminished when the tribunal of arbitration found that great britain was on the whole right in her territorial claims against venezuela the annexation of hawaii while engaged in the dangerous venezuela controversy president cleveland was compelled by a strange turn in events to consider the annexation of the hawaiian islands in the mid-pacific for more than half a century american missionaries had been active in converting the natives to the christian faith 
and enterprising American businessmen had been developing the fertile sugar plantations. Both the Department of State and the Navy Department were fully conscious of the strategic relation of the islands to the growth of sea power and watched with anxiety any developments likely to bring them under some other dominion. The country at large was indifferent, however, until 1893 when a revolution headed by Americans broke out, ending in the overthrow of the native government, the abolition of the primitive monarchy, and the retirement of Queen Liliokalani to private life. This crisis, a repetition of the Texas affair in a small theater, was immediately followed by a demand from the new Hawaiian government for annexation to the United States. President Harrison looked with favor on the proposal, negotiated the treaty of annexation, and laid it before the Senate for approval. There it still rested when his term of office was brought to a close. Harrison's successor, Cleveland, it was well known, had doubts about the propriety of American action in Hawaii. For the purpose of making an inquiry into the matter, he sent a special commissioner to the islands. On the basis of the report of his agent, Cleveland came to the conclusion that the revolution in the island kingdom had been accomplished by the improper use of the armed forces of the United States and that the wrong should be righted by a restoration of the Queen to her throne. Such being his matured conviction, though the facts upon which he rested it were warmly controverted, he could do nothing but withdraw the treaty from the Senate and close the incident. To the Republicans, this sharp and cavalier disposal of their plans, carried out in a way that impugned the motives of a Republican president, was nothing less than a betrayal of American interests. In their platform of 1896, they made clear their position, our foreign policy should be at all times firm, vigorous, and dignified, and all our interests in the Western Hemisphere are carefully watched and guarded. The Hawaiian Islands should be controlled by the United States, and no foreign power should be permitted to interfere with them. There was no mistaking this view of the issue. As the vote in the election gave popular sanction to the Republican policies, Congress, by a joint resolution, passed on July 6th, 1898, annexed the islands to the United States, and later conferred upon them the ordinary territorial form of government. Cuba and the Spanish War Early American Relations with Cuba The year that brought Hawaii finally under the American flag likewise drew to a conclusion another long controversy over a similar outpost in the Atlantic, one of the last remnants of the once glorious Spanish Empire, the island of Cuba. For a century the Department of State had kept an anxious eye upon this base of power, knowing full well that both France and England, already well established in the West Indies, had their attention also fixed upon Cuba. In the administration of President Fillmore, they had united in proposing to the United States a tripartite treaty guaranteeing Spain in her none too certain ownership. This proposal, squarely rejected, furnished the occasion for a statement of American policy which stood the test of all the years that followed, namely that the affair was one between Spain and the United States alone. In that long contest in the United States for the balance of power between the North and South, leaders in the latter section often thought of bringing Cuba into the Union to offset the free states. An opportunity to announce their purposes publicly was afforded in 1854 by a controversy over the seizure of an American ship by Cuban authorities. On that occasion, three American ministers abroad, stationed at Madrid, Paris, and London, respectively, held a conference and issued the celebrated Ostend Manifesto. They united in declaring that Cuba, by her geographical position, formed a part of the United States, that possession by a foreign power was inimical to American interests, and that an effort should be made to purchase the island from Spain. In case the owner refused to sell, they concluded, with a menacing flourish, by every law, human and divine, we shall be justified in wrestling it from Spain if we possess the power. This startling proclamation to the world was promptly disowned by the United States government. 
Revolutions in Cuba For nearly twenty years afterwards, the Cuban question rested. Then it was revived in another form during President Grant's administrations, when the natives became engaged in a destructive revolt against Spanish officials. For ten years, 1868 through 1878, a guerrilla warfare raged in the island. American citizens, by virtue of their ancient traditions of democracy, naturally sympathized with a war for independence and self-government. Expeditions to help the insurgents were fitted out secretly in American ports. Arms and supplies were smuggled into Cuba. American soldiers of fortune joined their ranks. The enforcement of neutrality against the friends of Cuban independence, no pleasing task for a sympathetic president, the protection of American lives and property in the revolutionary area, and similar matters kept our government busy with Cuba for a whole decade. A brief lull in Cuban disorders was followed in 1895 by a renewal of the revolutionary movement. The contest between the rebels and the Spanish troops, marked by extreme cruelty and a total disregard for life and property, exceeded all bounds of decency, and once more raised the old questions that had tormented Grant's administration. Gomez, the leader of the revolt, intent upon provoking American interference, laid waste the land with fire and sword. By a proclamation of November 6, 1895, he ordered the destruction of sugar plantations and railway connections and the closure of all sugar factories. The work of ruin was completed by the ruthless Spanish general, Whaler, who concentrated the inhabitants from rural regions into military camps where they died by the hundreds of disease and starvation. Stories of the atrocities, bad enough in simple form, became lurid when transmuted into American news and deeply moved the sympathies of the American people. Sermons were preached about Spanish misdeeds. Orators demanded that the Cubans be sustained in their heroic struggle for independence. Newspapers, scouting the ordinary forms of diplomatic negotiation, spurned mediation and demanded intervention and war if necessary. President Cleveland's Policy Cleveland chose the way of peace. He ordered the observance of the rule of neutrality, he declined to act on a resolution of Congress in favor of giving to the Cubans the rights of belligerence. Anxious to bring order to the distracted island, he tendered to Spain the good offices of the United States as mediator in the contest, a tender rejected by the Spanish government with the broad hint that President Cleveland might be more vigorous in putting a stop to the unlawful aid in money, arms, and supplies afforded to the insurgents by American sympathizers. Thereupon, the president returned to the course he had marked out for himself, leaving the public nuisance to his successor, President McKinley. Republican Policies The Republicans, in 1897, found themselves in a position to employ that firm, vigorous, and dignified foreign policy which they had approved in their platform. They had declared, the government of Spain having lost control of Cuba and being unable to protect the property or lives of resident American citizens, or to comply with its treaty obligations, we believe that the government of the United States should actively use its influence and good offices to restore peace and give independence to the island. The American property in Cuba, to which the Republicans referred in their platform, amounted by this time to more than $50 million the commerce with the island reached more than 100 millions annually, and the claims of American citizens against Spain for property destroyed totaled 16 millions. To the pleas of humanity which made such an effective appeal to the hearts of the American people, there were thus added practical considerations of great weight. President McKinley Negotiates in the face of the swelling tide of popular opinion in favor of quick, drastic, and positive action, McKinley chose first the way of diplomacy. A short time after his inauguration, he lodged with the Spanish government a dignified protest against its policies in Cuba, thus opening a game of thrust and parry with the suave ministers at Madrid. The results of the exchange of notes were the recall of the obnoxious General Whaler, the appointment of a governor-general, less bloodthirsty in his methods, 
a change in the policy of concentrating civilians in military camps, and finally a promise of home rule for Cuba. There is no doubt that the Spanish government was eager to avoid a war that could have but one outcome. The American minister at Madrid, General Woodford, was convinced that firm and patient pressure would have resulted in the final surrender of Cuba by the Spanish government. THE DELOME AND THE MAIN INCIDENTS Such a policy was defeated by events. In February 1898, a private letter written by Signor Delhomme, the Spanish ambassador at Washington, expressing contempt for the President of the United States, was filched from the mails and passed into the hands of a journalist, William R. Hurst, who published it to the world. In the excited state of American opinion, few gave heed to the grave breach of diplomatic courtesy committed by breaking open private correspondence. The Spanish government was compelled to recall de Long, thus officially condemning his conduct. At this point, a far more serious crisis put the Pacific relations of the two negotiating countries in dire peril. On February 15th, the battleship Maine, riding in the harbor of Havana, was blown up and sunk, carrying to death two officers and 258 members of the crew. This tragedy, ascribed by the American public to the malevolence of Spanish officials, profoundly stirred an already furious nation. When, on March 21st, a commission of inquiry reported that the ill-fated ship had been blown up by a submarine mine, which had in turn set off some of the ship's magazines, the worst suspicions seemed confirmed. If anyone was inclined to be indifferent to the Cuban War for Independence, he was now met with a vehement cry, Remember the main. Spanish Concessions Still, the State Department, under McKinley's steady hand, pursued the path of negotiation, Spain proving more pliable and more ready with promises of reform in the island. Early in April, however, there came a decided change in the tenor of American diplomacy. On the 4th, McKinley, evidently convinced that promises did not mean performances, instructed our minister at Madrid to warn the Spanish government that as no effective armistice had been offered to the Cubans, he would lay the whole matter before Congress. This decision, everyone knew, from the temper of Congress, meant war, a prospect which excited all the European powers. The Pope took an active interest in the crisis, France and Germany foreseeing from long experience in world politics an increase of American power and prestige through war, sought to prevent it. Spain, hopeless and conscious of her weakness, at last dispatched to the President a note promising to suspend hostilities, to call a Cuban Parliament, and to grant all the autonomy that could be reasonably asked. President McKinley Calls for War for reasons of his own, reasons which have never yet been fully explained, McKinley ignored the final program of concessions presented by Spain. At the very moment when his patient negotiations seemed to bear full fruit, he veered sharply from his course and launched the country into the war by sending to Congress his militant message of April 11, 1898. Without making public the last note he had received from Spain, he declared that he was brought to the end of his effort and the cause was in the hands of Congress. Humanity, the protection of American citizens and property, the injuries to American commerce and business, the inability of Spain to bring about permanent peace in the island, these were the grounds for action that induced him to ask for authority to employ military and naval forces in establishing a stable government in Cuba. They were sufficient for a public already straining at the leash. THE RESOLUTION OF CONGRESS There was no doubt of the outcome when the issue was withdrawn from diplomacy and placed in charge of Congress. Resolutions were soon introduced into the House of Representatives, authorizing the President to employ armed force in securing peace and order in the island, and establishing, by the free action of the people thereof, a stable and independent government of their own. To the form and spirit of this proposal, the Democrats and Populists took exception. In the Senate, where they were stronger, their position had to be reckoned with by the narrow Republican majority. 
as the resolution finally read the independence of cuba was recognized spain was called upon to relinquish her authority and withdraw from the island and the president was empowered to use force to the extent necessary to carry the resolutions into effect furthermore the united states disclaimed any disposition or intention to exercise sovereignty jurisdiction or control over said island except for the pacification thereof final action was taken by congress on april nineteenth eighteen ninety eight and approved by the president on the following day war and victory startling events then followed in swift succession the navy as a result in no small measure of the alertness of theodore roosevelt assistant secretary of the department was ready for the trial by battle on may first commodore dewey at manila bay shattered the spanish fleet marking the doom of the spanish dominion in the philippines on july third the spanish fleet under admiral cervera in attempting to escape from havana was utterly destroyed by american forces under commodore schley on july seventeenth santiago invested by american troops under general shafter and shelled by the american ships gave up the struggle on july twenty fifth general miles landed in puerto rico on august thirteenth general merritt and admiral dewey carried manila by storm the war was over the peace protocol spain had already taken cognizance of stern facts as early as july twenty sixth eighteen ninety eight acting through the french ambassador m cambon the madrid government approached president mckinley for a statement of the terms on which hostilities could be brought to a close after some skirmishing spain yielded reluctantly to the ultimatum on august twelfth the preliminary peace protocol was signed stipulating that cuba should be free puerto rico ceded to the united states and manila occupied by american troops pending the formal treaty of peace on october first the commissioners of the two countries met at paris to bring about the final settlement peace negotiations when the day for the first session of the conference arrived the government at washington apparently had not made up its mind on the final disposition of the philippines perhaps before the battle of manila bay not ten thousand people in the united states knew or cared where the philippines were certainly there was in the autumn of eighteen ninety eight no decided opinion as to what should be done with the fruits of dewey's victory president mckinley doubtless voiced the sentiment of the people when he stated to the peace commissioners on the eve of their departure that there had originally been no thought of conquest in the pacific the march of events he added had imposed new duties on the country incidental to our tenure in the philippines he said is the commercial opportunity to which american statesmanship cannot be indifferent it is just to use every legitimate means for the enlargement of american trade on this ground he directed the commissioners to accept not less than the cession of the island of luzon the chief of the philippine group with its harbor of manila it was not until the latter part of october that he definitely instructed them to demand the entire archipelago on the theory that the occupation of luzon alone could not be justified on political commercial or humanitarian grounds this departure from the letter of the peace protocol was bitterly resented by the spanish agents it was with heaviness of heart that they surrendered the last sign of spain's ancient dominion in the far pacific the final terms of peace the treaty of peace as finally agreed upon embraced the following terms the independence of cuba the cession of puerto rico guam and the philippines to the united states the settlement of claims filed by the citizens of both countries the payment of twenty million dollars to spain by the united states for the philippines and the determination of the status of the inhabitants of the ceded territories by congress the great decision had been made its issue was in the hands of the senate where the democrats and the populists held the balance of power under the requirement of the two-thirds vote for ratification the contest in america over the treaty of peace 
the publication of the treaty committing the united states to the administration of distant colonies directed the shifting tides of public opinion in two distinct channels support of the policy and opposition to it the trend in republican leadership long in the direction marked out by the treaty now came into the open perhaps a majority of the men highest in the councils of that party had undergone the change of heart reflected in the letters of john hay secretary of state in august of eighteen ninety eight he had hinted in a friendly letter to andrew carnegie that he sympathized with the latter's opposition to imperialism but he added quickly the only question in my mind is how far it is now possible for us to withdraw from the philippines in november of the same year he wrote to whitelaw reed one of the peace commissioners at paris there is a wild and frantic attack now going on in the press against the whole philippine transaction andrew carnegie really seems to be off his head but all this confusion of tongues will go its way the country will applaud the resolution that has been reached and you will return to the role of conquering heroes with your brows bound with oak senator beveridge of indiana and senator platt of connecticut accepting the verdict of history as the proof of manifest destiny called for unquestioning support of the administration in its final step every expansion of our territory said the latter has been in accordance with the irresistible law of growth we could no more resist the successive expansions by which we have grown to be the strongest nation on earth than a tree can resist its growth the history of territorial expansion is the history of our nation's progress and glory it is a matter to be proud of not to lament we should rejoice that providence has given us the opportunity to extend our influence our institutions and our civilization into regions hitherto closed to us rather than contrive how we can thwart its designs this doctrine was savagely attacked by opponents of mckinley's policy many a stanch republican joining with the majority of democrats in denouncing the treaty as a departure from the ideals of the republic senator vest introduced in the senate a resolution that under the constitution of the united states no power is given to the federal government to acquire territory to be held and governed permanently as colonies senator hoar of massachusetts whose long and honorable career gave way to his lightest words inveighed against the whole procedure and to the end of his days believed that the new drift into rivalry with european nations as a colonial power was fraught with genuine danger our imperialistic friends he said seem to have forgotten the use of the vocabulary of liberty they talk about giving good government we shall give them such a government as we think they are fitted for we shall give them a better government than they had before why mr president that one phrase conveys to a free man and a free people the most stinging of insults in that little phrase as in a seed contained the germ of all despotism and of all tyranny government is not a gift free government is not to be given by all the blended powers of earth and heaven it is a birthright it belongs as our fathers said and as their children said as jefferson said and as president mckinley said to human nature itself the senate more conservative on the question of annexation than the house of representatives composed of men freshly elected in the stirring campaign of eighteen ninety six was deliberate about the ratification of the treaty the democrats and populists were especially recalcitrant mr bryan hurried to washington and brought his personal influence to bear in favor of speedy action patriotism required ratification it was said in one quarter the country desires peace and the senate ought not to delay it was urged in another finally on february sixth eighteen ninety nine the requisite majority of two-thirds was mustered many a senator who voted for the treaty however sharing the misgivings of senator hoar as to the dangers of imperialism indeed at the time the senators passed a resolution declaring that the policy to be adopted in the philippines was still an open question leaving to the future in this way the possibility of retracing their steps the attitude of england 
the spanish war while accomplishing the simple objects of those who launched the nation on that course like all other wars produced results wholly unforeseen in the first place it exercised a profound influence on the drift of opinion among european powers in england sympathy with the united states was from the first positive and outspoken the state of feeling here wrote mr hay then ambassador in london is the best i have ever known from every quarter the evidences of it come to me the royal family by habit and tradition are most careful not to break the rules of strict neutrality but even among them i find nothing but hearty kindness and so far as it is consistent with propriety sympathy among the political leaders on both sides i find not only sympathy but a somewhat eager desire that the other fellows shall not seem more friendly joseph chamberlain the distinguished liberal statesman thinking no doubt of the continental situation said in a political address at the very opening of the war that the next duty of englishmen is to establish and maintain bonds of permanent unity with our kinsmen across the atlantic i even go so far as to say that terrible as war may be even war would be cheaply purchased if in a great and noble cause the stars and stripes and the union jack should wave together over an anglo-saxon alliance to the american ambassador he added significantly that he did not care a hang what they say about it on the continent which was another way of expressing the hope that the warning to germany and france was sufficient this friendly english opinion so useful to the united states when a combination of powers to support spain was more than possible removed all fears as to the consequences of the war henry adams recalling days of humiliation in london during the civil war when his father was the american ambassador coolly remarked that it was the sudden appearance of germany as the grisly terror that frightened england into america's arms but the net result in keeping the field free for any easy triumph of american arms was none the less appreciated in washington where despite outward calm fears of european complications were never absent american policies in the philippines and the orient the filipino revolt against american rule in the sphere of domestic policies as well as in the field of foreign relations the outcome of the spanish war exercised a marked influence it introduced at once problems of colonial administration and difficulties in adjusting trade relations with the outlying dominions these were furthermore complicated in the very beginning by the outbreak of an insurrection against american sovereignty in the philippines the leader of the revolt aguinaldo had been invited to join the american forces in overthrowing spanish dominion and he had assumed apparently without warrant that independence would be the result of the joint operations when the news reached him that the american flag had been substituted for the spanish flag his resentment was keen in february eighteen ninety nine there occurred a slight collision between his men and some american soldiers the conflict thus begun was followed by serious fighting which finally dwindled into a vexatious guerrilla warfare lasting three years and costing heavily in men and money atrocities were committed by the native insurrectionists and sad to relate they were repaid in kind it was argued in defense of the army that the ordinary rules of warfare were without terror to men accustomed to fighting like savages in vain did mckinley assure the filipinos that the institutions and laws established in the islands would be designed not for our satisfaction or for the expression of our theoretical views but for the happiness peace and prosperity of the people of the philippine islands nothing short of military pressure could bring the warring revolutionists to terms attacks on republican imperialism the filipino insurrection following so quickly upon the ratification of the treaty with spain moved the american opponents of mckinley's colonial policies to redouble their denunciation of what they were pleased to call imperialism senator hoar was more than usually caustic in his indictment of the new course the revolt against american rule did but convince him of the folly hidden in the first faithful measures everywhere he saw a conspiracy of silence and justice 
I have failed to discover in the speeches, public or private, of the advocates of this war, he contended in the Senate, or in the press which supports it and them, a single expression anywhere of a desire to do justice to the people of the Philippine Islands, or of a desire to make known to the people of the United States the truth of the case. The catchwords, the cries, the pithy and pregnant phrases of which their speech is full, all mean dominion. They mean perpetual dominion. There is not one of these gentlemen who will rise in his place and affirm that if he were a Filipino, he would not do exactly as the Filipinos are doing, that he would not despise them if they were to do otherwise. So much at least they owe of respect to the dead and buried history, the dead and buried history so far as they can slay and bury it, of their country. In the way of practical suggestions, the senator offered as a solution of the problem the recognition of independence, assistance in establishing self-government, and an invitation to all powers to join in a guarantee of freedom to the islands. THE REPUBLICAN ANSWER To McKinley and his supporters, engaged in a sanguinary struggle to maintain American supremacy, such talk was more than quixotic. It was scarcely short of treasonable. They pointed out the practical obstacles in the way of uniform self-government for a collection of seven million people, ranging in civilization from the most ignorant hillmen to the highly cultivated inhabitants of Manila. The incidents of the revolt and its repression, they admitted, were painful enough, but still nothing is compared with the chaos that would follow the attempt of a people who had never had experience in such matters to set up and sustain democratic institutions. They preferred rather the gradual process of fitting the inhabitants of the islands for self-government. This course in their eyes, though less poetic, was more in harmony with the ideals of humanity. Having set out upon it, they pursued it steadfastly to the end. First they applied force without stint to the suppression of the revolt. Then they devoted such genius for colonial administration as they could command to the development of civil government, commerce, and industry. THE BOXER REBELLION IN CHINA For a nation with a worldwide trade, steadily growing as the progress of home industries redoubled the zeal for new markets, isolation was obviously impossible. Never was this clearer than in 1900, when a native revolt against foreigners in China, known as the Boxer Uprising, compelled the United States to join with the powers of Europe in a military expedition and a diplomatic settlement. The Boxers, a Chinese association, had for some time carried on a campaign of hatred against all aliens in the Celestial Empire, calling upon the natives to rise in patriotic wrath and drive out the foreigners who, they said, were lacerating China like tigers. In the summer of 1900, the revolt flamed up in deeds of cruelty. Missionaries and traders were murdered in the provinces. Foreign legations were stoned. The German ambassador, one of the most cordially despised foreigners, was killed in the streets of Peking, and to all appearances a frightful war of extermination had begun. In the month of June, nearly 500 men, women, and children, representing all nations, were besieged in the British quarters in Peking, under constant fire of Chinese guns, and in peril of a terrible death. Intervention in China Nothing but the arrival of armed forces, made up of Japanese, Russian, British, American, French, and German soldiers and marines, prevented the destruction of the beleaguered aliens. When once the foreign troops were in possession of the Chinese capital, diplomatic questions of the most delicate character arose. For more than half a century, the imperial powers of Europe had been carving up the Chinese empire, taking to themselves territory, railway concessions, mining rights, ports, and commercial privileges at the expense of the huge but helpless victim. The United States alone, among the great nations, while as zealous as any in the pursuit of peaceful trade, had refrained from seizing Chinese territory or ports. Moreover, the Department of State had been urging European countries to treat China with fairness, to respect her territorial integrity, and to give her equal trading privileges with all nations. 
the american policy of the open door in the autumn of eighteen ninety nine secretary hay had addressed to london berlin rome paris tokyo and st petersburg his famous note on the open door policy in china in this document he proposed that existing treaty ports and vested interests of the several foreign countries should be respected that the chinese government should be permitted to extend its tariffs to all ports held by alien powers except a few free ports and that there should be no discrimination in railway and port charges among the citizens of foreign countries operating in the empire to these principles the governments addressed by mr hay finally acceded with evident reluctance on this basis he then proposed the settlement that had to follow the boxer uprising the policy of the government of the united states he said to be the great powers in the summer of nineteen hundred is to seek a solution which may bring about permanent safety and peace to china preserve chinese territorial and administrative entity protect all rights guaranteed to friendly powers by treaty and international law and safeguard for the world the principle of equal and impartial trade with all parts of the chinese empire this was a friendly warning to the world that the united states would not join in a scramble to punish the chinese by carving out more territory the moment we acted said mr hay the rest of the world paused and finally came over to our ground and the german government which is generally brutal but seldom silly recovered its senses and climbed down off its perch in taking this position the secretary of state did but reflect the common sense of america we are of course he explained opposed to the dismemberment of that empire and we do not think that the public opinion of the united states would justify this government in taking part in the great game of spoliation now going on heavy damages were collected by the european powers from china for the injuries inflicted upon their citizens by the boxers but the united states finding the sum awarded in excess of the legitimate claims returned the balance in the form of a fund to be applied to the education of chinese students in american universities i would rather be i think said mr hay the dupe of china than the chum of the kaiser by pursuing a liberal policy he strengthened the hold of the united states upon the affections of the chinese people and in the long run as he remarks himself safeguarded our great commercial interests in that empire imperialism in the presidential campaign of nineteen hundred it is not strange that the policy pursued by the republican administration in disposing of the questions raised by the spanish war became one of the first issues in the presidential campaign of nineteen hundred anticipating attacks from every quarter the republicans in renominating mckinley set forth their position in clear and ringing phrases in accepting by the treaty of paris the just responsibility of our victories in the spanish war the president and senate won the undoubted approval of the american people no other course was possible than to destroy spain's sovereignty throughout the west indies and in the philippine islands that course created our responsibility before the world and with the unorganized population whom our intervention had freed from spain to provide for the maintenance of law and order and for the establishment of good government and for the performance of international obligations our authority could not be less than our responsibility and wherever sovereign rights were extended it became the high duty of the government to maintain its authority to put down armed insurrection and to confer the blessings of liberty and civilization upon all the rescued peoples the largest measure of self-government consistent with their welfare and our duties shall be secured to them by law to give more strength to their ticket the republican convention in a whirlwind of enthusiasm nominated for the vice presidency against his protest theodore roosevelt the governor of new york and the hero of the rough riders so popular on account of their cuban campaign the democrats as expected picked up the gauntlet thrown down with such defiance by the republicans mr bryan whom they selected as their candidate still clung to the currency issue but the main emphasis both of the platform and the appeal for votes 
was on the imperialistic program of the Republican administration. The Democrats denounced the treatment of Cuba and Puerto Rico and condemned the Philippine policy in sharp and vigorous terms. As we are not willing, ran the platform, to surrender our civilization or to convert the republic into an empire, we favor an immediate declaration of the nation's purpose to give to the Filipinos, first, a stable form of government, second, independence, third, protection from outside interference. The greedy commercialism, which dictated the Philippine policy of the Republican administration, attempts to justify it with the plea that it will pay, but even this sordid and unworthy plea fails when brought to the test of facts. The war of the criminal aggression against the Filipinos, entailing an annual expense of many millions, has already cost more than any possible profit that could accrue from the entire Philippine trade for years to come. We oppose militarism. It means conquest abroad and intimidation and oppression at home. It means the strong arm which has ever been fatal to free institutions. It is what millions of our citizens have fled from in Europe. It will impose upon our peace-loving people a large standing army, an unnecessary burden of taxation, and would be a constant menace to their liberties. Such was the tenor of the appeal to the voters. With the issues clearly joined, the country rejected the Democratic candidate even more positively than four years before. The popular vote cast for McKinley was larger and that cast for Bryan smaller than in the silver election. Thus vindicated at the polls, McKinley turned with renewed confidence to the development of the policies he had so far advanced. But fate cut short his designs. In the September following his second inauguration, he was shot by an anarchist while attending the Buffalo Exposition. What a strange and tragic fate it has been of mine, wrote the Secretary of State, John Hay, on the day of the President's death, to stand by the bier of three of my dearest friends, Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley, three of the gentlest of men all risen to the head of the state and all done to death by assassins. On September 14, 1901, the Vice President, Theodore Roosevelt, took up the lines of power that had fallen from the hands of his distinguished chief, promising to continue absolutely unbroken the policies he had inherited. Summary of National Growth and World Politics The economic aspects of the period between 1865 and 1900 may be readily summed up. The recovery of the South from the ruin of the Civil War, the extension of the railways, the development of the Great West, and the triumph of industry and business enterprise. In the South, many of the great plantations were broken up and sold in small farms. Crops were diversified, the small farming class was raised in the scale of social importance, the cotton industry was launched, and the coal, iron, timber, and other resources were brought into use. In the West, the free arable land was practically exhausted by 1890, under the terms of the Homestead Act. Gold, silver, copper, coal, and other minerals were discovered in abundance. Numerous rail connections were formed with the Atlantic seaboard. The cowboy and the Indian were swept away before a standardized civilization of electric lights and bathtubs. By the end of the century, the American frontier had disappeared. The wild, primitive life so long associated with America was gone the unity of the nation was established. In the field of business enterprise, progress was most marked. The industrial system, which had risen and flourished before the Civil War, grew into immense proportions, and the industrial area was extended from the northeast into all parts of the country. Small business concerns were transformed into huge corporations. Individual plants were merged under the management of gigantic trusts. Short railway lines were consolidated into national systems. The industrial population of wage earners rose into the tens of millions. The immigration of aliens increased by leaps and bounds. The cities overshadowed the country. The nation that had once depended upon Europe for most of its manufactured goods became a competitor of Europe in the markets of the earth. In the sphere of politics, 
the period witnessed the recovery of white supremacy in the South. The continued discussion of the old questions, such as the currency, the tariff, and national banking, and the injection of new issues like the trusts and labor problems. As of old, foreign affairs were kept well at the front. Alaska was purchased from Russia. Attempts were made to extend American influence in the Caribbean region. A Samoan island was brought under the flag, and Hawaiian islands were annexed. The Monroe Doctrine was applied with vigor in the dispute between Venezuela and Great Britain. Assistance was given to the Cubans in their revolutionary struggle against Spain, and thus there was precipitated a war which ended in the annexation of Puerto Rico and the Philippines. American influence in the Pacific and the Orient was so enlarged as to be a factor of great weight in world affairs. Thus, questions connected with foreign and imperial policies were united with domestic issues to make up the warp and woof of politics. In the direction of affairs, the Republicans took the leadership, for they held the presidency during all the years except eight, between 1865 and 1900. References J. W. Foster, A Century of American Diplomacy, American Diplomacy in the Orient. W. F. Redaway, The Monroe Doctrine. J. H. Latine, The United States and Spanish America. A. C. Coolidge, United States as a World Power. A. T. Mahan, Interest of the United States in the Sea Power. F. E. Chadwick, Spanish-American War D. C. Worcester The Philippine Islands and Their People M. M. Kala Self-Government in the Philippines L. S. Rowe The United States and Puerto Rico F. E. Chadwick The Relations of the United States and Spain W. R. Shepard Latin America, Central and South America Questions 1. Tell the story of the international crisis that developed soon after the Civil War with regard to Mexico. 2. Give the essential facts relating to the purchase of Alaska. 3. Review the early history of our interest in the Caribbean. 4. Amid what circumstances was the Monroe Doctrine applied in Cleveland's administration? 5. Give the causes that led to the war with Spain. 6. Tell the leading events in that war. 7. What was the outcome as far as Cuba was concerned? The outcome for the United States? 8. Discuss the attitude of the Filipinos toward American sovereignty in the islands. 9. Describe McKinley's colonial policy. 10. How is the Spanish War viewed in England, on the continent? 11. Was there a unified American opinion on American expansion? 12. Was this expansion a departure from our traditions? 13. What events led to foreign intervention in China? 14. Explain the policy of the open door. Research Topics Hawaii and Venezuela Dewey, National Problems American Nation Series Pages 279 through 313 MacDonald Documentary Source Book Pages 600 through 602 Hart American History Told by Contemporaries Volume 4 Pages 612 through 616 Intervention in Cuba. Latine, America as a World Power, American Nation Series, pages 3 through 28. MacDonald, Documentary Source Book, pages 597 through 598. Roosevelt, Autobiography, pages 223 through 277. Hayworth, The United States in Our Own Time. Pages 232 through 256. Hart, Contemporaries, 
Volume 4, pages 573 through 578. The War with Spain. Elson, History of the United States, pages 889 through 896. Terms of Peace with Spain. Latine, pages 63 through 81. MacDonald, pages 602 through 608. Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 4, pages 588 through 590. The Philippine Insurrection, Latine, pages 82 through 99. Imperialism as a Campaign Issue, Latine, pages 120 through 132. Hayworth, pages 257 through 277. Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 4, pages 604 through 611. Biographical Studies. William McKinley, M. A. Hanna, John Hay, Admirals, George Dewey, W. T. Sampson, and W. S. Schley, and Generals W. R. Shafter, Joseph Wheeler, and H. W. Lawton. General Analysis of American Expansion. Syllabus in History. New York State, 1920. Pages 142 through 147. End of chapter 20. Recording by Anthony Wilson. End of History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 6. National Growth and World Politics.